or a manager. Okay. Uh, so if I'm if I'm not if I understand correctly, I believe the YouTube stream is running. I believe we have all of our uh, speakers online and so forth ready to go. So uh, I believe we are all set. If you want to start the meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Councillor Jennifer McKelvey. I'm chair of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I'd like to call meeting 27 to order. Welcome, everyone, and Happy New Year. Today's meeting is being held with members of council and staff participating by video conference. The public continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. These measures are necessary to comply with public health guidelines and prevent the spread of COVID-19. The clerk staff have connected all registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Infrastructure and Environment Committee's page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. I ask for everyone's patience if we experience any delays or technical problems during the meeting. Members, the city clerk has provided all agenda material on toronto.ca slash council and on CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. Clerk's IT staff will be available to you remotely if you need help with your devices. As part of each item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speakers list and will call on members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask that members ensure that they keep their video on, raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that you must still submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at IEC at Toronto.ca to help with motions. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you have any, please raise your hand and unmute your mic and indicate the item and the number, the nature of the interest. Um, Councillor Cole. You're muted. He's got to pull out his earbuds, maybe. We can't hear you. Do you want to disconnect your microphone, uh, your earbuds? Well, now his microphone is also turned off. Councillor Cole, are you asking for tech assistance or were you indicating a conflict? If it's a, was it a conflict? Yes, no? He has a conflict. conflict? I okay. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Matthew. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Chair, I've, I'm just uh, trying to jabber uh, clerk's IT, Michael George. I believe uh, Councillor Cole's office may have been in, in contact with uh, clerk's IT there. I'm just asking them to reach out to Councillor Cole um, to see if they can help with the, uh, with the audio issue. Um, did he submit the conflict of interest already? So do we know what item? Uh, yes, um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Cole has submitted uh, a, a written declaration of interest form um, on uh, item uh, IE 27.8, that's the golf course item. If I'm not mistaken, Councillor Cole, could you just, if you, yes, that that's is correct. correct. Thank okay. you very much. Councillor Cole. Uh, uh, yep, is that because he's a golfer? Okay, um, um, so carrying on, uh, okay, that's great, that's helpful. So we can um, go through the consent agenda with um, hands up and down. I don't think there's anything we need uh, unmuted for right away, but we'll keep working on that in the background. Okay. Um, carrying I'm sorry, on. I, I apologize, Madam Speaker. It's at it's item six that is that cancer call has declared on. It's the golf course item, item IE twenty seven point six. I believe I said I eight. Okay. Great. Um, may I have a motion to confirm the minutes of our meeting on December second? Councillor Layton, all those in favor? Opposed. That carries. Um, Sorry, just, we have uh, 12 items on the agenda. I understand Vice Chair Pasternak has a new uh, business item of business to introduce this morning. Um, Councilor Pasternak, would you like to introduce the item? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to introduce um, the uh, Baycrest ride item that uh, has been circulated to all committee members. Uh, it's uh, requesting committee to endorse uh, a fundraising event, which would include the closure of the Gardner Expressway and the Don Valley Parkway closure. 
Um, I believe Councillor Cole and I have some remarks uh, in support of this event, uh, but I'd like to introduce it uh, to the agenda. Okay, all those in favor of introducing the item? All those opposed, that's introduced. Councillor Cole has an item to introduce. I can read that out for you if that's okay. Um, urgent need to support comprehensive transportation study to address the hyper gridlock and related traffic study, sorry, traffic safety issues at Lawrence Avenue West, Marley Avenue and the Allen Road. Um, Councilor Cole um, is moving that to introduction onto the agenda. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, that item has been introduced. They will both uh, now be displayed on CMP and then we'll vote on those. We can come back to the vote on those afterwards when uh, Councilor Cole can speak to it. Any additional new business? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, I believe uh, there was a letter submitted by myself to the clerk. Yep. Uh, Madam Chair, we can uh, display the uh, the letter from Councillor, or sorry, from- I'd like to introduce Mayor that. This has to do with um, excessive speeding by our gar by our uh, city workers and garbage trucks, um, and I would like to add that to the agenda. And once the agenda is, I we could actually deal with it when we deal with. Um, we could the join, ICA, Adam. Uh, we could do uh, update a vision zero speed management strategy because yep. it's part of that. Yeah. Okay. But if I just like to move that we introduce it as a separate item and we could do it at the same time. Okay, great. All those in favor of it adding to the agenda. Um, all those opposed, so that will be displayed on to um, on to CMP now and uh, TMMIS. Okay, that brings us to seeing no other last call. Councillor Cole. Do you have another item? Um, Councillor, or sorry, uh, Matthew, is there another item from Councillor Cole? Uh, Madam Chair, I believe the, the, the item that you had introduced on Councillor's behalf earlier, I believe that was the item. Yeah. Is there two? Uh, Councillor Cole, do you have two or just one? I have one. There's a second one. Okay. Um, Councillor Cole, I hope you're good at uh, charades. I, I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chair and Councillor Cole. I, I, I'm only aware of the one uh, letter that we've received from, from Councillor Cole's office, uh, Paul from Councillor Cole's office. Um, perhaps if Councillor Cole's office wants to reach out to us, we can we can try to clarify which uh, if there is if there is a second letter. But I believe that you, that you've introduced the the letter that we had from Councillor Cole anyway. Okay, so why don't we do the agenda run through and then uh, that'll give them time to send that on to you if, if there is something we can come back to that. Okay, great. Okay, so um, that brings us to our first item, i.e., twenty seven point one amendment to purchase order number six zero five one seven eight two with Trimble Europe BV for mobile solutions for Toronto water. Um, would anybody like to hold this item? Anybody speak to it? Okay, um, Councillor Pasternak, are you moving it? I'll move it. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. IE 27.2 amendment to purchase order 6044699 and contract with Air Products Canada Limited for supply of liquid oxygen, the lease of liquid oxygen equipment, and specialized maintenance services FJ Horgan water treatment plant. Anybody like to hold this item? Seeing none, would somebody like to move the item? I'll move it. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor put his hand up too. We'll move that one. Uh, all those in favor? All opposed, that item carries. IE 27.3 request for approval procurement approach and amendment to purchase order number 6045739 for owner controlled external legal services associated with the West Gardner Expressway rehabilitation contracts worth 3410. Would somebody like to hold this item? Somebody like to move it? Um, Deputy Mayor's moving it. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. Non competitive contract with Zimmer Air Service Incorporated for Lamantria Dispar Dis. Disbar moth break out control, sorry, outbreak control 2022. Um, various wards. Would somebody like to hold this item? Okay, does somebody like to move the item? Councillor Layton, all those in favor? 
All those opposed, that item carries. IE 27.5, Ontario Ministry of Transportation, Boundary Facility Agreement, Cinemark Drive. Um, I'm happy to move that, it's in Ward 25. All those in favor? All those opposed, that item carries. IE 27.6, um, I will hold, there are 41 deputations on this item um, and Council Cole has declared a con conflict as well. IE 27.7, on-street electric vehicle charging stations pilot update, I will hold as there is a deputation on this one. IE 27.8, update on Vision Zero management strategy and related initiatives, I'll hold, there's a deputation and we'll also consider this um, uh, along with uh, the Deputy Mayor's new motion. Uh, IE 27.9, revisiting strategy to maintain public walkways in a state of good repair, I will hold as there is one deputation. IE 27.10, review of city's shoot closure program, um, I will hold as there is a deputation. IE 27.11, data comparison of in-house and contracted waste. Um, hold on. Okay. IE 27.12, official recognition of friends of Cornell Park in the community of Scarborough Guildwood. Would anybody like to hold this item? Uh, anybody like to speak to it or would somebody like to move it? Okay, I'll move it for Councillor Ainsley. All those in favor? Thank you, Madam all, Chair. All those opposed, that item carries. That brings us back to the walk-ons. Um, so, Councillor Pasternak's Baycrift ride, does anybody want to hold that item? Okay, um, Councillor Pasternak, you'd like to move it? I'd like to, uh, just no questions for staff, but just to share a few words. And I think Councillor Cole, as Baycrest is in his ward, also wanted to speak very briefly. So, we can hold that one. Um, yeah. Uh, IE 27.14, urgent need to support comprehensive transportation study. Um, that's Councillor Coles. We'll hold that until we can get him back on. IE 27.15, we'll hold that. That's going to be considered with the other item. Um, I have a motion to uh, move to limit uh, deputants to three minutes before we start with that part of the program. Is that for everything or just the golf course item? I think we have to do it for everything, don't we? No. That is correct, Madam Manager. Oh, what do you do? Yes. I'll, I'll second it. I'll, I support that. Okay. Do you need to display it, Matthew? Yeah. Just give us one sec, Madam Speaker, and we'll we'll display the motion, sir. Um, point point of order. We can we can wrap up the Baycrest thing very quickly, um, if if you want to, Madam Speaker, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just speak for a couple of minutes and then move it. Uh, Councillor Cole, I believe, wants to speak for a couple of minutes and that's it. Rather than have, have staff We related... don't have him online though. We're still trying to connect him to speak to it. So that's the problem. Um, okay, sorry, we need to finish the, the three minutes motion. We got distracted there. That the infrastructure committee set the following rule, the length of public presentations be limited to three minutes. All those in favor? All those opposed? That carries. Okay, um, and now I believe there was discussion um, about moving the, the golf courses to be the last item on the agenda. So is yeah, that- I'll, I'll move those? that item and just this way, we just got so very few deputants. Yes. Um, on those items, Madam Chair, it seems to me, and as uh, uh, we were discussing previously offline, there are a lot of staff here that it would be more efficient to clear the agenda and have as the last item um, the golf item. So I'll move that the the uh, golf course item be the last item on the agenda. Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay, that carries. Is there anything else procedural before we start the IE twenty seven point seven? Uh, no, we, like I said, we we're just trying to, we're still reaching out to uh, Councillor Cole's office to get him back uh, online. I believe okay. the first one that you have is item seven with speakers. That is okay. not item six. 
great. And none of those are his words. So I think that's safe to start that one. Okay. Um, so item 27.7 .7 on street electric vehicle charging stations, pilot update. We have one deputy, David Lang Langle with the Pocket Community Association. David, are you on the line? This is for them from the city clerk's office. I don't believe that speaker is online. Okay. Um, are there questions of staff on this item? Uh, yes. Mr. Layton. Uh, sorry, Councillor Fletcher, outside speak outside. First. No, I just think that Mr. Langio uh, believes that the golf is going to go ahead of him. So he's got a while to get online. It's not. And I think any deputants might think that that we're after that golf item. So what? Up to you if you want to wait. Uh, Madam Chair, how about this? Why don't we just hold that item down? And if we get down to the end and we're finished, we'll just have to deal with it at that time. That, that's just my idea for moving this forward. Um, you can do as you will. No, I think that's fair. Okay, so we'll do I think that's I fair too. Thank you, Daniel. IE, thank you, Denzel. Uh, IE 27.8 update on Vision Zero speed management strategy. Uh, this one is Albert Cool. Do we have Albert online? I'm sure it is for the city clerk's office again. I don't believe Albert is on the line. Okay, let's try the next one then. Um, the next one is IE 27.9 re re revisiting strategy to maintain public walk walkways in the state of good repair. Our deputy is Emily Daigle. Hi, everybody. Hi, Emily. Thanks for joining us. You have three minutes. Um, I'm going to be as fast as I can. Um, please don't mind if I cough. I have, I am just getting over COVID. I am a wheelchair user, and as many of you know, I'm also a very active user of our city's sidewalks. In fact, in good weather, I'm rarely ever home, <laughs> whether it be trails, sidewalks, or having to ride on the road because the sidewalks are so bad, including absolutely horrendous curb cuts, uneven sidewalks, broken sidewalks, sidewalks with trees growing so far down from people's backyards over their fences that it gets smacked in the face. This happens in the East End. It happens on Victoria Park Avenue. It happens in every ward. I've read all the reports I can get my hands on. I'm very frustrated. But first of all, let me take a nice cold sip of cold Toronto water. Thanks, Lou. Emily? I love trees, but I'm very frustrated when I get smacked in the face while riding my wheelchair and using my wheelchair to get around our city. Many of us with wheelchairs get very fed up with the broken sidewalks and we ride on the road. Or, thank you to everyone who's pushed for bike lanes and especially protected bike lanes, we use the bike lanes. In my hometown of Hamilton, hi Paul, there are many areas of my hometown that have broken nasty sidewalks, but also have urban braille. Toronto does not have urban braille for those who are low vision and or totally blind with our using white canes. Our sidewalks in Toronto are not accessible. I'll leave that with you for a minute. To imagine being in a power wheelchair going at up to 12 kilometers an hour, usually around five kilometers an hour is my walking speed, and being bump, 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 and it goes right through you, right through your spine into your neck all through your body, and it's extremely painful and debilitating, especially with those of us with chronic pain issues. Although these reports are well written, well thought out, and well designed, there is absolutely no acknowledgement of people with disabilities, no acknowledgement of people who use wheelchairs, who people who are forced to use these absolutely, in some places, garbage sidewalks. I lived in Scarborough for a long time. I've lived in Etobicoke. I'm currently at Weston and Eglinton. And I can say all over this city and vast parts of this city, our sidewalks are absolutely disgusting. We're supposed to, we want to be a world-class city. One of the first things we, we need to do is make this city walkable, make the city accessible to all, and make sure that people in wheelchairs don't get hit in the face by shrubbery or branches 
or garbage cans left in the, the middle of the sidewalk, especially with how narrow some sidewalks are in the old city of Toronto. I just want to thank everyone here who's fought for bike lanes and fought for protected bike lanes especially. And a shalom to those of my friends in the community along Bathurst who have fought very hard to have good sidewalks. I wish the Director of Transportation, I love her to bits, she's an amazing human, but please bring this to the accessibility community. Bring this to your own accessibility committee and make sure that you stop forgetting about us. We are major users of your sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, um, thank you. We'll move to questions of staff. Questions of staff, Council, uh, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, is there any, let me just make sure there's no outside councillors with questions. Sorry, I just toggled my screen. I think we're good. Okay, um, uh, sorry, Councillor Pasternak. Unless Councillor Carroll is trying to talk to us, I don't know. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, so I threw you to staff. Um, there seems to be um, a little bit of confusion here. Uh, public walkways, uh, based on your report, are not are not sidewalks. Uh, they seem to be sort of informal uh, corridors where where people can get from A to B. Um, would you would you describe that as such? I mean, I I, I see you're handling sidewalks uh, differently than public walkways. It's, but there's confusion over over what this is. Through the chair, uh, you're correct, Councillor Pasternak. This is um, this is not specifically about sidewalks. It's about a, a network of public walkways. And Councillor Peruzza requested that we put this report forward um, when we took a deeper look into it. There is not a, a maintenance program for these uh, more informal public walkways that still provide um, critical connection for, for residents. And so we went through and uh, did this report and what it calls for is a, a more specific look and a more detailed look at uh, adding a maintenance program for these public walkways. So it is not specifically related to sidewalks, um, although it is, uh, you know, Emily's um, very, uh, important uh, deputation is not lost on us, certainly, uh, about the sidewalks and the need to continue to be vigilant about accessibility there. So these these public walkways need not be paved. Some of them uh, could be a dirt a dirt path. Um, we have a, a, a cul-de-sac uh, in in uh, Ward 6 uh, that then has a dirt path to a, to a public school. Uh, and then, of course, the arguments ensue over who's who's responsible for their, that pathway. Is is that co the kind of issue that we're trying to um, get a handle on in, in this conversation? Uh, correct, uh, Councilor Pasternak. That is one of the one of the examples. Part of it is who is responsible for that maintenance. Part of it is what is the level of maintenance that could be uh, anticipated. Um, and, and what the related addition that would be to the transportation services uh, scope or uh, how we work in partnership with other entities similar to you just described the school districts to um, to make sure that those uh, those locations are taken care of. So, um, uh, my last question, when there's an informal pathway, um, I, we have a situation up at Banton Park where there's an informal pathway, so people have walked over uh, the parkland so many times it's it's kind of carved a, a pathway to the Shepherd West uh, subway station. Uh, is that the kind of thing that that we want to um, then service in the future? We would we would potentially pave it. We would clear it. Uh, we would we would take it over. I think those are some of the questions right now. Our inventory really only deals with uh, with the sort of the dedicated public walkways, but there's a whole range of them, as you just described, that that are not specifically dedicated uh, walkways that that many people use and they have used for a long, long time and would probably benefit from a from a higher level of maintenance. But but again, it's not currently one of our programs, which is why we've approached this in this way to write this report to identify some of the components and uh, and flag that we uh, actually require additional work to be able to come back to council with um, with the service uh, proposal. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Are there any additional questions, of staff, uh, Deputy Mayor? I, do we have a proper inventory of all the walkways in the city? Not the undedicated through the speaker, not the undedicated ones, Deputy Mayor. 
the yeah, last one. the last comprehensive survey we've done was in 2010. Undedicated ones. So the undead, but the undedicated ones aren't ours. Or are you saying some undedicated ones are ones we should be assuming? I think there. The, the, I think we have to take a look at it and see which ones, with current conditions changing, with additional transit locations, all all sorts of modifications that have happened since then. We think we need to take a look at it. Um, and so, uh, and we don't currently have an inventory on the undedicated ones. But but the dedicated ones, we know where all the dedicated paths are, correct? Yes, okay. although we we believe we do need. I'm sorry to interrupt. We do need to update that inventory. It's it's been a while since we've done it. All right, and and. Um... So you're going to create an inventory. You're also going to come up with a maintenance plan. Is that correct? That's correct. You're, and you're going to be you're going to come up with a service standard. Is that correct? That that is that would be the plan. Yes, and also to identify uh, the criteria by which other partnered um, entities like the school board would uh, would be more appropriate to to do that maintenance. I wouldn't necessarily rely on them for that. Um, what about a capital plan? Well, I think that would have to follow. I think that would all be that would all, all have to follow. Terms come at the same time or come afterwards. Uh, I think we could um, we could look to bring it all together. It seems like it would be better information for council if we brought that all together. So we'll we'll go back and take a look at that. Have we done an assessment of our of our our walkways? Do we know the current state of their their current state now in terms of capital? Repair? So side so sidewalks are part of our asset inventory, and and we've done that not too long ago. We have a much more uh, better technology to be able to assess our sidewalks um, uh, through our asset management program. Have we assess these walkways. The, these walkways are are not part of that. So we don't. So it's safe to assume we don't know what the state is. But I would think by talking to our residents, if I were to say how much do we spend on fixing and paving walkways, could you tell me? Wow. Um, are you talking about walkways or are you talking about sidewalks? Because, yeah, so walkways, pass, pass no, we don't. Between two streets, for example. Yeah, we don't have a current program to maintain paths between two streets. That's why Councillor Prutza has asked us to take a no, look. No, no, I think this, I can't see, I can't imagine how we've missed this so up until we, this time. Yeah, so I think we've been quite we've been reactive on trying to do some um, interim repairs where people have flagged them for our attention. Um, we haven't done anything comprehensively, and so this has become a, more of a significant situation. And I think, especially uh, given the fact that there's um, more areas in the city that previously weren't as as much of a pedestrian. Uh, I, connections like new transit centers and, and things of that nature that we really do need to take a look at this and see where we need to make some and modifications. The report says you're going to come forward with a report when? I believe in uh, early 2023, but Vince can correct me if I have got that date wrong. Okay. All right. I, I'm uh, finished. This is a uh, long overdue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Are there any additional questions? Um, Councillor Carroll? Uh, yeah, I thank you for the indulgence. I've been having CMP issues, so I missed the non-member uh, uh, call out for questions. Um, I, I'm a little frustrated with this one. Uh, uh, I actually, uh, you know, moved the, a similar motion to Councillor uh, Perutz's years ago, um, and uh, uh, I produced a video showing the lack of maintenance in in the ones in my area that. Uh, one of my staff members made so slick that somebody came and asked me if I was running for mayor, but I, I was that incensed about this. I was just trying to get it across. One thing that is not captured in here that is a problem every summer um, is the issue of just trimming the vegetation to make them safe and not dark for women at night. And um, when my staff um, go to address this, the issue of ownership always comes up. It is my understanding that back when I moved the first motion, they were at least inventoried as to who owns them and who should be trimming them. So is is that resolved or are we waiting till 2024 for that to be clear and easy to respond to? Uh, through the speaker to Councillor Carroll, uh, I think there, especially on these pathways, there is still issues that need to be resolved in terms of maintenance responsibilities, um, in particular between transportation services and parks, forestry and recreation, which um, we are continuing to work out uh, and continuing to work through. And, and one of the reasons why I think this report is, is important and um, we're going to give it, uh, as we always do, full efforts is because just some of the issues that you raised about 
uh, blocking of lights and vegetation that makes things difficult for people to walk on in these locations where we actually don't have a formal program do need to be worked out so that they're addressed consistently. And I think right now what we're doing, and I'm sure uh, I don't want to speak for parks, but I'm sure them as well, we work together, is we're just very reactive on these programs. When we get lots of complaints, we try to deal with them as best we can. And there's enough people walking in these locations that um, we feel we need to take a more comprehensive look at it. So we will we will include the vegetation as part of that as well. So the concern I have is we were reactive when I moved that motion in 2015. And what staff undertook to do was to regularize this organize the ownership. Is it parks doing this one? Is it schools doing this one? Is it transportation doing this one? And turn it into a program. And here we are, another counselor had to move a motion. And there is a long timeline here before we expect this result. How do we know this is actually gonna happen this time? Or is another counselor gonna have to move, move another motion in another term of office? Well, through the speaker, I, I'm sorry that I can't speak to the previous effort, Councillor Carroll, but um, but we are uh, dedicated to getting this done in the time frame we've identified. And I understand there's frustration, uh, not only with councillors, but also with the community about uh, the yeah. state of maintenance. Um, and I think uh, the best effort that we can make to have a comprehensive strategy will mean that these things get taken care of routinely as opposed to on a complaint basis, which I think is um, is frustrating for everybody. Okay, and last question, Madam Speaker. In the meantime, while there isn't a program, it does state in the report, there is a capital budget for this. It's just sitting there for the reactive uh, moments. So in the interim, if, it, if it's gonna take till 2024 for there to be a long-term capital plan where you would routinely figure out what needs to be repaired. In the interim, a counselor still can say this one urgently needs to be repaved, et cetera, et cetera. That's correct, Councillor Carroll. Okay, okay, thank you. I'll request to speak, Madam Speaker. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, I have one quick question. Um, will you be involved involving um, Toronto District School Board and the Toronto Catholic School Board in this discussion? Because as Councillor Carroll pointed out, that's kind of been a limiting factor in us getting some of the repairs done. So how how will they be involved in this process? Uh, we absolutely will involve them in this process because a number of the um, connections, as many people have pointed out, uh, actually go uh, through school uh, campuses, you know, whether they go directly in front or they go sort of connecting on the sides of sports fields or what have you, they still uh, tend to be corridors that, that people use um, quite frequently. So yes, we do uh, need to involve both the school boards and the Catholic school board and um, and we'll we'll do that as part of this effort for sure. And likewise, because you know the city can get siloed, will you be working closely with parks? Because that's the other one. So a lot of time we'll run around trying to find out if it's you know the school board, if it's parks, if it's transpo. Um, and you know the residents don't care. They just want the right. the hole in the in the walkway to be fixed. So um, you also be working across departmentally. Absolutely, okay. uh, with parks, um, with solid waste uh, to, to a certain degree and whoever else is, is necessary to be involved. But we have a lot of things to sort out that we're working through with uh, with our partners at Parks, Forestry and Recreation related to maintenance issues, grass cutting, snow removal. So we've been working through those issues pretty systematically over the past few years. And this will be uh, another one that we will do together. Okay, great, thank you. Any additional questions of staff? I don't see any, so speakers on this item. I know outside councillors, Councillor Carroll. Well, Madam Speaker, I, I, I only speak to underscore that this has to happen this time. Um, often when I'm chatting with, with a councillor who maybe only has one or two of these, not dozens and dozens, but one or two of these in their, their, uh, their ward, particularly if you, you live in the downtown and the streets are on a grid, um, you, you, you probably have very few of these but they are embedded in our culture when you, when you get north of Eglinton. Once you get to the area where you have planned neighborhoods throughout our inner suburbs, what children call these and have called these for the last 70 years are cut throughs. Every, every street's got a cut through. And without them, you can't through vision zero say to people, you know, it would be easier to manage traffic and safer if, if you walk your kids to school or if they're older, make them walk to school. You can't without cut throughs in the suburbs. It just doesn't work. And they are everywhere. But here's the problem. 
developers were allowed to build subdivisions and they were allowed to put them in and they put them in with developer chain link and a quick pave. And, and there's been no plan for 70 years on some of these. And some of them, you know, if the pavement is 60, 70 years old, it needs to be redone now. Um, I have one that I, I recently had to ask for urgent attention because it includes stairs, as some of them do, uh, to go down through, through, it's the windy streets and some of them are built on elevations and so some of them have, have, have stairs. And so they're not even, they don't really meet the AOA, AODOA. Um, they, uh, uh, they do, however, allow us to say to people, walk in your neighborhood, you don't always have to drive a car. So it's really part of the city's goals, the city's policies. This should be contained in it. If you're trying to achieve um, less car reliance in what were built as car reliant neighborhoods, the cut throughs were seen as things for children, but nowadays we see them, see them as things for children and seniors, and yet there's no plan. Um, it's truly reactive in that every spring, my staff team and I drive around the ward, look at all the ones that tend to be overgrown and deliver once again the request and, the, and start the hunt, who is going to trim the bushes in this thing so that women are safe and children are safe walking through the thing as, uh, as uh, we get to dusk. Um, so the, the program has to be there and I would submit well, the focus in the report is we, we have to, by 2024, have a capital plan. Maintenance and ops needs a plan as well, because some of them get done regularly because they seem to be logically contained in a boulevard program, and others need to be wind about through 311, et cetera, every summer or nothing happens. And so there's a maintenance and ops step that needs to be gone through and a capital plan that it has to materialize by 2024 or we're just going to start seeing more and more claims because people are just going to hurt themselves on buckled seven-year-old pavement. Um, I'm sorry to be so negative, but I, I, I'm, I'm coming up on, on eight years of frustration over this item. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for your indulgence. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Additional speakers on this item? Okay, uh, Councillor Pashnak and then Deputy Mayor. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Emily, for, for sharing your views, because certainly uh, sidewalk uh, safety and maintenance is, is clearly a, a, a major point of discussion and urgency uh, in, in the city. Um, I'm, I'm glad that this item is, is before us, because informal public walkways are a major issue, certainly in the inner suburbs and in other areas of the city. We are in endless disputes over jurisdictional issues, maintenance issues, and who was responsible to ensure safe passage from, from point A uh, to point B. Uh, we have pathways uh, that were built uh, decades ago uh, that, are, that are paved, uh, that run from the end of the street uh, into another street. Uh, the foliage uh, has, has created almost like a green canopy over the walkway, cutting off any sources uh, of light. Uh, and then when it comes to, um, to its maintenance, uh, it's radio radio silence, and 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 maybe there's no uh, budget envelope, maybe there's no clear policy. Is it the private homeowner that must be uh, trimming those those branches? Uh, does the city have the jurisdiction uh, to to go through and and trim those branches and build a homeowner? These are all important uh, issues. In an era of solar lighting, where we don't need to hardwire and and spend extra monies to to dig and 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 build um, uh, wiring for uh, for lighting. Uh, maybe it's time that we look at uh, options to light some of these um, walkways because they're certainly being used uh, after uh, after dark. Uh, so, but they do provide they do provide a crucial crucial service. They these these uh, pathways often are off road alternatives to getting from from A to B, and they can keep. Uh, you know, kids and, and adults and seniors and everyone else are safe as they move around the neighborhood. Uh, so I, I think it's also important to, um, as mentioned a few times in this discussion, uh, the school boards must play a, an active role because many of these, uh, these public walkways lead 
uh, from from a, from a residential road uh, to uh, or an informal um, public realm uh, into the schoolyard, um, and then we get the calls and why aren't you why aren't you clearing uh, this this pathway? The kids are the kids are slipping, the kids are falling, and then uh, once again, there's no reporting system, uh, no budget, no one's to blame. It just hasn't been put uh, put in place. So. Um, <laughs> Surprised we have to wait till 2023. It seems like so far uh, off, um, and and certainly um, uh, we'd like everything yesterday. Uh, but that's what it says in the report. Maybe a council, um, uh, maybe a council, we can do something a little different and, and accelerate it. Uh, but thank you very much for the report and the discussion, and uh, I look forward to uh, to uh, a firm policy going forward. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I just, I'm surprised we've missed this one up until now. Um, only to the extent that uh, our pathways are habitually a problem in our neighborhoods and trying to get them fixed is next to impossible. You basically come up with the hand when you ask staff if they can fix um, fix a walkway that's falling apart or you're asking them to do maintenance, you know, they're always dragging their feet because they don't have time or they're, you know, they come up with some excuse. Um, uh, it, it, it's frustrating. They say they say they can't do it and they're overworked and there's no money involved in it. And um, uh, it's, you know, these, these walkways are, are, are important to people in, in local neighborhoods. And so I think it's, um, you know, and the other thing as I reflect on it is we spend a lot of time, probably too much time, time some, uh, you know, looking at building new stuff instead of fixing what we got. Um, and, you know, we far sooner put in a new cycle path than actually fix our, exist, our existing infrastructure in our neighborhoods. Sorry, Shelley, I might sound like a broken record, but there you are. Um, but I, I think it's important. Uh, I don't think this report can come soon enough and we've got to fix our existing infrastructure and these, you know, these, pa these pathways, the things that, these are the things that people see and touch. They don't come down to city hall. This is what they see. And this is, you know, how we fix up these pathways, a reflection of, you know, how we invest in our city and where their tax money goes. So, um, you know, this is something that needs to be done. Um, I hope it doesn't, I, I don't remember Councillor Carroll's motion. Um, but I hope it doesn't end up in the same place that this report that Councillor Carroll's motion did. So uh, um, we can't get this report soon enough and then we've got to properly fund it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Additional speakers on this item? Councillor Prutza. If you can hear me, I've, I've been having issues connecting this morning. Am I on now? Hello? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just very quickly, like uh, you know, you read this report and you sort of look at it and you say, "Yeah, geez, what are we doing here?" But um, uh, and I understand all our frustrations. But in speaking to staff, uh, you, you understand you have to create a plan, and this is about sort of creating a plan. And we have a complex infrastructure of walkways, uh, as people have spoken to. There's jurisdictional issues, there's interdepartmental issues, and we've never created a walkway office or a walkway department that says oh you know what that's whose responsibility this is right uh so so it's um you know transportation it's parks uh it's schools uh and to some extent it's churches um so so we need a plan and in the interim i i, I think that uh you know we continue to do as we have done as councillor carol has suggested at the beginning of the season or uh, at some point during the season, they say, look, this walkway is 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 overrun with shrubs or, or potholes and it needs to be dealt with. And we figure out um, uh, we figure out uh, how to do that and and, uh, and how to fix that. And, and what's more important now with uh, with COVID, especially and what we've been finding is uh, that for, uh, you know, for a period, um, you know, kids, you know, started to get driven to school, you know, so this so this. You know, there's just all these cars in front of the schools creating this traffic chaos and kids being picked up and, and dropped off. But now with COVID, uh, the walkways are being used uh, uh, much more by, by 
uh, by neighborhood folks, as as as, uh, as was correctly pointed out, uh, as shortcuts to places, as shortcuts to schools, as shortcuts to churches, as shortcuts to retail, uh, and as shortcuts to get to uh, to uh, you know other folks' uh, homes or, or visit other uh, folks in the neighborhood. So, uh, so uh, there's no question we need to do something about it, but we also need. Uh, uh, you know, to have a, a thoughtful approach, and I think that the staff have have outlined here a, a thoughtful approach in terms of uh, how we're going to get there. So I, I I think that this is a good way to go. Thank you. I thank you. Additional speakers on this item. Okay. Uh, seeing no additional speakers, um, Councilor Layton, I just wanted to confirm you didn't want to speak on this item. No, I don't need to move it to council. That's fine. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll vote on the item. All those in favor of the item. All those opposed. That item carries. Um, I've been notified that some of the earlier speakers we tried to call were there. So I'm going to suggest we go back up um, through the agenda. So um, sorry, was somebody. Why don't we um, Councillor, oh, he's he's muted now. Um, IE twenty seven point seven on street electric uh, vehicle charging. Um, do we now have David Langill online? Not sure if we have IT. David Langwell's line has been unmuted. Hi, David. Thanks for there. joining us. You have uh, three minutes. Okay. Uh, start now. Yes, please. Three minutes. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Pocket Change Project of the Pocket Community Association. And thank you for your prior support of Pocket Change Plus, as reaffirmed at the last council meeting in December. Having the city institutions working on their own transformations in alignment with the community will create new opportunities and increase the impact a great deal. As you may recall, we're offering a neighborhood scale implementation of Transform TO. And I'm going to speak today about how as part of that, EV charging can be stepped up a little and move a little faster. As you may recall, the pockets located in Ward 14 from the Danforth South to the railway tracks and between Jones and Greenwood Avenues. We're a well organized community of 3500 people and roughly 1400 homes. We appreciate your efforts to increase the use of electric vehicles and the pilot project being conducted by transportation services in Toronto hydro and look forward to a rollout of a more comprehensive citywide program. We already have a sizable fleet of electric vehicles. It was wonderful to see so many EVs on display at our last eco fun fair before the pandemic when we covered the basketball court in Finn Park with a display of locally owned electric vehicles. Tesla, Chevy Volt, Volkswagen Golf, Hyundai, Kia, etc. Park <coughs> residents have already considered where electric vehicles could be charged within our community and were interested in looking at pedestrianizing some parts of the road network, which could increase the flexibility to provide parking and access to the hydro network for EV charging. As a transition measure, it would be great boost. It would be a great boost for easy EV users if the public institutions located in the pocket were able to provide EV charging facilities for their staff during the daytime and allow pocket residents to charge their vehicles in the otherwise empty parking lots during the evening and nighttime hours and on weekends. Here's an opportunity to, quote, leverage institutional assets and expertise to green the neighborhood and maximize opportunities for environmental transformation. The TTC's subway yards include two parking lots in Chatham and Oak Vale avenues, which sit empty or nearly empty on weekday nights and weekends. Toronto Community Housing has extra parking space on Finn Avenue and in front of their homes on Chatham. TDSB has a large parking lot on Chatham Avenue to serve the Wandering Spirit School and the Indigenous Education Center. And the French Catholic School Bar has a sizable parking lot in Boltby as part of their school. There also appears to be extra or unused parking beside Toronto Fire Station 323. I've made my points and I thank you for your time. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, are there questions of staff? Okay, uh, seeing none, does anybody want to speak to the item? Okay, um, would somebody like to move the item? Councillor Pasternak, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. Okay, that brings us to our next item, which is update on IE 27.8, update on Vision Zero speed management strategy and related initiatives, along with the new item from uh, the Deputy Mayor, IE 2715, excessive speed by city workers. We have one deputant, um, Albert Cole. Yes, sir. good morning. Thank uh, you, Albert. You have three minutes. Thank you, and thank you for waiting. Um, my name is Albert Cole. I'm a coordinator of the uh, Avenue Road Safety Coalition. Our coalition dates from uh, 2017. Uh, we are a coalition of neighborhood, school, parent, active transport, and other community groups. And um, Avenue Road, as you may know, is a six-lane highway that dates from a 1950s vision of our city, uh, certainly not a uh, vision zero a vision of the city. Uh, briefly, we support speed cameras. We support the increase in speed cameras, including this uh, small increase proposed uh, by 2023. Since our inception, we asked for speed cameras. We're happy to see um, them finally in place, including one on Avenue Road. We know that speed cameras worked work based on research. Uh, the problem, of course, is we can't ask people only to walk and cycle in the 50, soon to be 75, hopefully, areas of the city with uh, speed uh, cameras. Uh, speed cameras are a useful part of our Vision Zero plan. They're among the easy steps that we asked for from our inception, including lower speed limits, signage, digital speed uh, displays. But we also know that in the five years, the city has taken these easy steps for which is to be commended, but we need to move to more fundamental step, which will require more investment, more commitment, more passion, especially from this committee, which is charged with the oversight of uh, Vision Zero. Uh, our city has changed. More people are walking, cycling, and taking transit, a trend that has to uh, continue post-pandemic to deal with related issues of climate change, fitness, equity, and so on. Uh, I probably don't need to remind the committee that our Vision Zero plan is failing where it matters most, and that's in lives lost and lives destroyed uh, in uh, road tragedies. So I, in conclusion, I want to urge the committee to please uh, pass this uh, motion to increase the number of speed cameras, but to please uh, redouble your efforts in terms of the next and more important step, which is to invest and to invest heavily and to invest heavily in money and energy in redesigning our roads, including roads such as Avenue Road, where as recently as uh, this past summer, we had a young man uh, died there. We're seeing these deaths continue across our uh, city. Of course, uh, families don't have the luxury of turning the clock back each January to zero in terms of road deaths. A uh, road death is something that will stay with the family uh, for many, many years uh, throughout their uh, lives. So thank you for your attention to this deputation. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, we have an additional deputant, uh, Kevin Rupasing. Kevin, are you online? Good morning, are you able to hear me? Thanks for joining us, Kevin. You have three minutes. Wonderful. Um, uh, good, good morning, everyone. Um, so, of course, Cycle Toronto is supportive of City Council's commitment to Vision Zero um, to eliminate deaths on Toronto's roads. Um, and while the recommendations in this report might incrementally advance some roads, uh, road safety in Toronto, um, we think there are some more ambitious steps that City Council could take towards eliminating um, those deaths and achieving Vision Zero in Toronto streets. I'll start with the automated speed enforcement um, piece. Uh, you know, we've the evidence so far is showing that the speed cameras we have in the city are effective. Where we put the cameras, the number of drivers speeding is reduced. Um, the drivers that continue to speed, well, they don't speed by as much as they used to. Um, and most vehicles that get a ticket, they don't get a repeat. Right? These cameras are effective and they are working. In just the one year period, these 50 cameras were able to issue more than 220,000 tickets 
that's nearly 10 times what the Toronto Police uh, Vision Zero Enforcement team was able to do. And if we follow best practices on where to place cameras and how to set fines, um, automated speed enforcement can be fairer to drivers um, than uh, there might be if there's individuals ticketing uh, and, and they have their own biases. What we would love to see in order to really effectively use this program is a, a few things to actually expand these cameras use. Um, one is we need to expand the city's ticketing capacity. Um, city staff have asked for an administrative penalty system that's more like a streamlined ticketing process, kind of like how you pay your parking tickets. Um, they just don't have the capacity to, to process as many tickets as we actually could get on our streets. Speeding is so prevalent. We have to eliminate this bottleneck to fully realize um, the speed reduction and life-saving benefits of the speed camera program. We also need to ensure that speed cameras are eligible along Toronto's most dangerous roads by adding community safety zones along arterial roads. These are the streets where 20 percent, um, these are only about 20 percent of the Toronto roadway network, but it's where more than 80 percent of collisions that kill or seriously injure vulnerable road users happen. It's, it's the same for school aged children as well, which is part of what the speed camera program is trying to address. That's where children are also being injured and killed. These arterial streets are where we have community centers and shopping malls and libraries. These are the uh, and, and bus routes. These are the places we need to have a plan developed to roll out community safety zones um, so we can have cameras going forward. We also need to continue lowering speed limits on arterial roadways. Um, 50 kilometers an hour corresponds to an 85 percent fatality risk for vulnerable road users. We simply will not eliminate road deaths if we're trying to manage speeds at 50 kilometers an hour. And uh, lastly, we need to have an, a plan to ambitiously scale up the, the speed camera program. New York was able to go from less than 200 to over 2000. We need to be thinking in a similar scale if we're going to actually have cameras in our existing community safety zones and potential future community safety zones um, to eliminate road deaths. Cycle Toronto is also very supportive of the construction zone management uh, proposal in the report. We'd love to see some public and stakeholder engagement as those up the documents are updated. And we would like to see City Council um, request the provincial and federal governments to act within their jurisdictions to incentivize or mandate similar uh, truck safety measures for non-city trucks. Uh, Thanks, Kevin. Final thought? No, that's great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, that completes the deputants. We'll move to questions of staff. Questions of staff. And again, we're we're considering this item as well as uh, the deputy mayor's add-on item. Are there questions of staff? Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. I, I understand that the that there's a motion in the works, perhaps coming from the mayor, uh, related to how we could advance quicker our the rollout of uh, ASE. I'm just wondering, in in your opinion. Um, uh, Ms. Gray, what is the most appropriate approach to advance, to get more cameras in the ground faster? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Councillor Layton, for that question. Um, I, I think we are trying to balance um, uh, a fairly aggressive rollout of automated speed enforcement, try to get as much coverage as we can with the knowledge that this is still a pilot program. And, um, and we are proposing in this report today some steps that we think can uh, continue to expand the, um, the number of cameras with the knowledge that, uh, and I think uh, the last deputant noted that um, some changes that could happen provincially with regard to allowing the tickets to be processed through administrative penalty systems will give us a much broader reach to be able to process many more tickets. And as the last deputant mentioned uh, quite accurately, our arterial roadways are places where uh, we have a collection of um, walking destinations. We've got community centers and schools and parks, etc. And so uh, having a focus on community safety zone expansion, I think would be extremely helpful uh, in making more places eligible that are the locations based on the data where we're seeing more speeding, where we're seeing more conflicts with uh, with pedestrians and cyclists. So I think a combination of changing kind of the back end of that administrative penalty system piece and making that available um, and also starting to expand cameras uh, in a way that I think makes some sense. We know right now that the cameras that we have are quite large. They require a fair amount of space to deploy. And so I think in the future, we would also want to look at what technology improvements can uh, maybe have come into play that would give us the ability to, to get cameras in tighter spaces as well. I mean, like they can stick a little camera here that's like goofy high resolution that can take like incredibly realistic video, but we got to put like a, like a two barrels 
on top of one another to to make an automated speed enforcement camera work. It's like it, it just it surprises me, right? So just let me let, let me track some of these challenges. So we have the issue of ticketing. That's a provincial concern. We need the province to allow us to use our administrative system in order for us to process the number of tickets that we anticipate we'd get if we rolled out more cameras, correct? Uh, through the chair, that is correct. And Susan Garcino from Courts is here if you have specific questions about that. So I, I, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try to just be really quick about this. Um, the, the other issue is if we don't have the automated speed enforcement, or the, um, the automated um, processing, it's likely the tickets will get thrown out. It's not that they'll just get on an endless waiting list. They'll just get tossed, correct? The the the, the processing of those tickets will, uh, yeah, well, they will, they, they, we won't be able to handle the volume. Okay. So the other constraint is where we can put them is dictated by the province, correct? Uh, the province has set out some guidelines for where um, automated speed enforcement can be can be impacted uh, can be added and and certainly this is in a pilot phase where they've uh, they've set those guidelines forward yes and they have to be in community safety zones right that is correct and school zones community safety zones and, and school zones and school zones thank you um, okay if we get started on an RFP now and the province make the change we'll be ready to start rolling these additional cameras out, not the 25, but perhaps another tranche next year, later this year, sort of I time frame? We, I think we would do it as soon as possible. I mean, I think we would do it as soon as we can. Uh, we can certainly start working on uh, on the effort to look at the future this year. Um, certainly, I, we, I, I think that with all best efforts, uh, we will, um, we will not be able to expand beyond the 25 cameras certainly before next year so we, okay. we have to just keep going down the path here but i do think there's value in looking at what new technology can can support this uh this very important program how the cameras work right that's what the report says slower correct. slower and uh and less people speeding correct and we've seen uh i think the report also identifies some of the high level details from the the report that was done by sick kids uh hospital as a as a um independent summary of the efficacy of the camera so yes we've seen a reduction in speed um, and occurrences quick final question we're on we're not able to determine how many city contracted vehicles not city staff city contracted vehicles are getting caught by the ASC correct no we are not thank you yes okay additional questions of staff uh, Councilor Pashmak. So what we can conclude from this report is there's two barriers to putting out uh, more locations for automatic speed enforcement. One is you have to set up more community safety zones. And the other is the provincial regulatory uh, environment. What are the barriers to us setting up more community safety zones? Uh, through the chair to Councilor Pasternak. Um, the we can establish community safety zones uh part of the challenge is that we have a number of community safety zones with more locations in the city to to uh rotate through our existing automated speed enforcement cameras uh, that you know that that there there are so many of them that we have a number of years before we're going to get to all of them, and we've already gotten requests um, certainly to go back to some of the of the most significant ones. So um, establishing additional community safety zones in other locations in the city around places where where people walk and cycle uh, routinely, uh, community centers, senior safety areas, um, parks, etc. Um, a number of those places uh, would be um, I think important for us to consider. If we were to establish a new set of community safety zones, so I think it's we already have a lot of locations that are within the existing community safety zones because when we identified them, we tried to go as expansive as we could while still being true to the provincial legislation. Um, and so I think the next step would be to to look at uh, new criteria for where we establish new community safety zones as well. I feel like there was a second part to your question that I might yeah. have missed. Yeah. So I mean, so if we if we set up now. It, there seems to be a shortage of cameras. In other words, we could roll out dozens or hundreds of community safety zones, but we will not have the technology uh, to place there. Is that is that a fair uh, assumption? That's why you rotate these cameras. 
Correct. We are, we have 50 cameras. We have started along with Brampton as the largest installation in Ontario, um, but it's a relatively new program. And as you know, it's still in a pilot phase. And so uh, we continue to work through that. But um, but we are somewhat limited by the numbers of cameras that we have. And also, as um, we just discussed with Councillor Layton, by the uh, the process by which we process the um, the tickets. Most of the jurisdictions in Ontario have less than five cameras. Okay. So, so one of the solutions, if we have the money, is to buy buy more cameras. Another solution is to identify, and maybe we need new definitions of, of community safety zones, uh, and then we can we can cover it, cover more more territory of dangerous roads if if those two things are done. So you need you need a funding source for more cameras, and you need some kind of a bylaw uh, approval by council to set up more. Community safety zones are those are those uh, correct assumptions? Uh, I think those are correct assumptions, but I would I would also suggest that and the port report suggests this as well that automated speed enforcement, while very important tool, is only one tool in a comprehensive speed management program, which we are uh, implementing through Vision Zero. And so um, there are specific locations where automated enforcement works quite well to manage speed, and there are other locations where speed uh, is better managed by other tools. And so we tried to be quite expansive in the report in, in addressing that. So it's a citywide speed management strategy uh, and not just not just about automated speed enforcement. Although I will say automated speed enforcement is a very critical tool in the toolkit. Right. Okay, fair enough. Uh, collection rates. Um, how are we doing when it comes to uh, issuing a fine and then and then collecting at the end of the day? Um, 50%, 30%, 80%? I see Susan uh, Garasino from Quartz has, has hopped on, so I'll, I'll let her take that one. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor, through the, through the chair. 70% um, uh, of automatic speed enforcement tickets are paid voluntarily. That is, you know, just goes with most people pay their fines. They're not, uh, and, and about 15% of them are disputed and 15% they, they don't respond and therefore they, they, they're they entered into a default conviction and then the city collects from them. All right, thank you very much. Okay, additional questions of staff. Um, can I do a sound check now that we have Councillor Cole on? Madam Speaker, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. It's Councillor Cole. Can you hear me, Councillor McKelvey? We can hear you. The game of charades is over. Oh, okay. what a morning. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, Matthew, you have a question or something? I was just hoping to do a sound check as well, just to make sure that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear okay. you too. I don't think okay. I Anybody think else need a sound earlier. check? And Councillor McKelvey, with my other item, I was trying to say I was taking carriage of Councillor Fillion's uh, letter. Uh, he had uh, uh, a, a letter uh, that he uh, sent to the committee. That's what I was trying to get on about also. So the clerk has found it. I believe it's a motion that he wants to pass on this item as opposed to a new item. Have we confirmed that? Matthew? Uh, I've not asked that question. However, it is. it does seem to be related to this item. Okay, um, so Councillor Cole, I think you can move it on this item as opposed to having to introduce an entirely new item. That was my understanding. Oh, okay, thank you. I just that's why I just trying to clear that okay. up. So they have it received. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Now that we've done a sound check, are there any additional questions of staff? Okay, I have a few questions. Um, so the first is just to be crystal clear. Um, what do you think the soonest is you might be able to acquire some new cameras? And if we don't have the changes in the community zone guidance or et cetera, could we roll more out in school zones, for example? We have the capacity uh, to you, uh, Chair. We have the capacity through our existing uh, uh, contract to add 25 additional cameras, which is why we proposed that in this report. Uh, and we will make best efforts uh, should this report pass through council to get that started as soon as possible. Um, we assume that we would get them um, installed in 2023. So for the installation, if we don't have the expansion to more community zones, we could just do more school zones. So right now we're doing two school zones per ward. We could do four at a time, for example. Probably three. Add one additional camera to right. each of the 25 wards. Sorry, yes. Okay, great. Yes. Um, 
And then just to be clear on the community zones, so the school zones are all permitted and then there's some community zones, but not others. And could you maybe just kind of clarify that? Sure, there are, uh, are um, I believe 1100 community safety zones uh, citywide. Um, that's all the community safety zones. So those include those in school zones. And then um, you, you might remember from the discussion about the tragedy uh, on Parkside Drive, we also took a, a look at those locations where we had identified community safety zones previously, uh, many, many years ago. And um, and I believe O'Connor uh, and I believe Park Parkside were, were two of those locations where they're not necessarily related to schools. Five of them were not um, that we added into the rotation to see how those ranked. So that that's pretty significant coverage across the city, which is not to say that all locations are addressed. And so we would want to start to develop the criteria um, about additional locations where we know that speed is an issue and we know that there's a high volume of uh, pedestrians and cyclists in the vicinity. So all 1100 that you spoke of are currently eligible. Correct. Okay. Um, in November, Councilor Crawford and I asked for options to accelerate Vision Zero through the 2022 process. Um, I don't see that in this report here. Will we be seeing that through budget or when we, we see um, opportunities to, for example, advance uh, mid-block crossings, which I know is, is an important one for, for many people, especially um, in the suburbs? Yeah, so um, we uh, the acceleration of ASE is part of the overall acceleration of, of, of the Vision Zero program. So we will be discussing that through the budget process. Um, and we are also uh, going to be rolling out in 2022 uh, some additional work on using uh, red light cameras and other tools at the mid-block locations because we know that's um, still a significant issue uh, in the suburban communities of trying to control speed. So we have some other uh, and, and eliminate crashes. So we have some other tools that we'll be rolling out in 2022 that are already within the Vision Zero um, plan. Uh, and we've already added some um, red light cameras at mid-block locations that we're be, we'll be testing the efficacy of as well. So there are pieces in there uh, in the 2022 budget that address uh, the issues that you're talking about. And we assume we'll have more debate about it during that okay. process. Um, what is the policy for city operated heavy duty vehicles that receive a ticket through ASE or red light cameras? Um, what is the policy surrounding that? Do we have data around, um, you know, by department, um, which, which departments are getting them? How do we determine if it was a vehicle that was, you know, for example, on an emergency call um, versus not? So maybe could you just kind of speak to how we, we work through that? Yeah, David Jalamore is here from Fleet, so he's going to address that question. Uh, Madam Chair, to you, so we do have a breakdown of all the violations, whether they're through automated speed enforcement devices or red light cameras broken down by city division and by vehicle type. Um, the emergency services are handled separately um, by the emergency services divisions. Okay. Um, okay, great. I think that's it for my questions. Um, any additional questions? Uh, speakers on this item, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, Madam Chair, I, I just want to speak to the added the additional item that we're dealing with this at the same time. The added item that I moved, which with regard to the um, speeding that's being done by some of our city workers in our in our garbage trucks and other vehicles in solid waste. So this came to my attention. I was. Uh, I was quite surprised. Um, one of the pictures that I saw was in front of a local school in my ward. Um, and uh, I was troubled by, you know, that we need to get our arms around this. It seems, it appears to me that um, uh, some of our operators have a, have a bit of a lead foot. Um, I, I do believe that we need to take action on this. Um, we have, you know, we're in a leadership position with Vision Zero. Uh, we're asking people to reduce their speeds. We have to lead by example. There's a higher, I think, a higher duty on us generally to, uh, as a city, for our employees to follow the speed limits. Um, I would. That's why I've asked for a report to understand what the nature of this problem is, um, and the speed limits that they're traveling at. How many tickets are being issued? Whether they're paying their tickets or not. Um, I, uh, my understanding is, for example, 
um, I call the TTC, and then when one of their operators gets a tick, gets a ticket, they have to pay for it themselves. I think that should be, you know, those principles should apply as a deterrent. Um, I think we also need to know whether we have um, habitual offenders who have, who have, you know, that lead foot they use uh, more often than they should, and what type of corrective uh, action are, is being taken in that regard. So it's it's for a report. I am also troubled by the fact that um, my understanding is a lot of other organizations, um, even our agencies, um, disclose the speed limit that they're traveling at. Um, even the provincial government does, but for some reason, um, when a FOI request was done, that information was redacted. And I think uh, the public needs to know if they're speeding, what's that rate of speed? So that's what I'm asking for in my additional item. And uh, I hope that, uh, uh, committee will accept uh, getting that report as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Additional speakers to this item. Councillor Leighton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have um, several motions. Just find them here on my computer. My apologies. The first that city council requests the general manager of transportation services to as part of the updating guiding principles for cycling safety and work zones to work in consultation with stakeholders to communicate and hear feedback on the proposed changes Two, that city council direct the general manager of transportation services to review the existing criteria for establishing community safety zones and consider including other sensitive community areas such as senior safety zones and locations near parks and community centers and report to the infrastructure Environment Committee once the provincial review of the automated speed enforcement program is completed. And finally, the City Council designate all roads in Wards 4, Ward 11, and Ward 13 as community safety zones as and request the General Manager of Transportation Services report back on the implementation, including the possibility of a phased approach as part of the 22 operating and capital budget. Uh, you know, it didn't take long for us, and it was reported on widely, uh, to in 2022. Uh, to have our first fatality on our streets. And it seems like the drop that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic has largely returned to the number of uh, killed and seriously injured individuals on our roadways. And while uh, the, the, the last couple of years we have seen promising steps forward by the city to lower speed limits, to uh, implement automated speed enforcement, to invest in uh, in stronger protections for vulnerable road users, um, it's clear that we haven't gone far enough on on I think the three main principles of of road safety. One being enforcement. Um, the fact that now we pay for the police budget out of the transportation budget uh, seems to me uh, to 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 not get to the fundamental question of are we and how do we enforce our road rules fairly, um, but also um, vigorously, because clearly there's a sense out there that people don't have to speed to slow down, right? We, we all get complaints about road racing. We all get complaints about speeds doing feed back, uh, speeds being too fast. Um, clearly road users aren't getting the message that they need to follow the rules. We need to figure out ways to do that. One is through enforcement. The second, uh, is through education and ensuring that people understand that they play a role in, uh, in in helping us reach Vision Zero. And third, which isn't mentioned too in this report, but I think it's an important one to always remind ourselves is infrastructure. Like we build infrastructure so that people can go the, these speeds. That needs to change. Um, our approach needs to be much, much different. It needs to not be first and foremost, how quickly can we move, move people through the city? It needs to be how safely can we move people through the city? That should be our number one objective. Within the community safety zone and the, and the constraints that the provincial government has put on us, uh, we are not able to roll out faster the ASE that we have. I know there's a motion coming and I do appreciate the direction that, um, that Chair McKelvey and the mayor are taking on it. I think it's the right one and I will be supportive of it. However, I think we're, we're, we are also constrained by where they can go. And I'm, I'm frankly tired. And I've heard this from my, some of my colleagues, including the counselors for Ward 4 and Ward 13, that we're tired of telling um, our communities that you just don't qualify. 
Like I'm fine with using metrics about where within the ward do we prioritize the ASC, but I am dead tired of telling people they don't, they didn't get a box checked because they're a community safety zone. So we can't even consider their street or, or a problem intersection for automated speed enforcement. But that's not the only thing that a community safety zone brings. And I, I want to draw this to your attention because this report has focused on one aspect. And I know that there are concerns. We already have a lot of locations for ASC, but it also doubles the speeding fine. That sends a clear message to those speeding that it's unacceptable to put other road users at risk on our streets. And that's why I'm moving this for across Ward 11. And I've been um, get, been asked by councillors for Ward 4 and Ward 13 to do the same. Um, I, I liken this to the time when uh, Toronto and East York Community Council went ahead and said, we need to reduce our, um, our residential road speed limits across the area to 30 kilometers an hour. We looked to the other community councils to do the same slowly over time. A lot of that has happened. Uh, but we hope it can happen quicker, and I think this is one way to do it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Layden. Additional speakers to this item? I Madam have... Chair, I yes. just have a point of order. Yes. On Councillor Layton's um, motion, I, I would like the section separated out where he wants entire wards declared community safety zones. I think that's inappropriate, and I need to vote separately against it. Yeah, we'll ask for that separately. I agree with you. Um, Councillor Cole. Yeah, I just, uh, the question I have for Councillor Layton, uh, is it for Councillor Layton I can ask him a question? You can ask questions, yes. Uh, three minutes for questions of uh, the mover. Yeah, sure. I just wonder, Councillor, so you're going to do that for what wards? Uh, you're saying that the whole ward uh, be considered a safety zone, Ward 13 and Ward 12, is it? Ward 11, which is the ward I represent, Ward 13, uh, which is Councillor Wong Tam, and Ward 4, which is Councillor Perks. So therefore, what would stop uh, the rest of us on council saying the same thing for our wards? Nothing. I'd encourage you to. And then what would happen to the, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of uh, creating a, a new dimension here. And that's what I'm worried about. Then the, the, the whole city becomes a community safety zone. Do we have the resources to do that or, you know, we can uh, make all kinds of proclamations, but how about the enforcement on all the added uh, uh, instruments of the community safety zone? Would we have the resources to do that? Well, I think there are two core things that declaring community safety zone does, that, or three, let's say. One is the educational element on having the signs up and telling people you're, you're in a community safety zone. Two is, as you said, the automated speed enforcement, and there are an endless number of locations that we currently have. But I think this would open up others that currently aren't covered that are, but that 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 may be worthwhile. But but thirdly, it also doubles the speeding fines. And I don't know about you, but I don't think the message is getting across to to people that are speeding and putting others' lives at risk. And I'm not prepared to allow it to continue. There's. Um, uh, this is something that we can do. We can do it right away. There is a phased in, like I've, I've asked uh, staff to, to look at how could we phase it in because there's going to be a signage issue as there was when we lowered speed limits. Um, I think it's something we can do and I think we should we, we should do it. And if others want to join in this effort and add their awards, then I would encourage them to. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, additional um, speakers on this item? Councillor Cole to speak on this item? Uh, yes, uh, I'm going to move that uh, my ward also be uh, declared a, a community safety zone. I don't have anything in writing, but uh, the ward eight, Eglin Lawrence, be also uh, uh, considered a uh, a speed safety zone ward, uh, following on Councillor Layton's uh, uh, move. Because I'm sure if um, it's done in those two wards uh, in the motion here, then people in uh, Eglinton Lawrence are going to say the same thing. Why didn't you declare our whole ward uh, a uh, community safety zone? Uh, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, I have the good fortune uh, of having uh, an unfinished expressway right uh, through the middle of my ward, uh, and uh, not to mention the traffic speeding issues I have related to 
the spinoff of uh, Avenue Road. Uh, traffic. Sorry, Councillor, are you moving the motion by uh, sent by Councillor Fillion also? Uh, yes. And, we uh, just Councilor... need to introduce that first. Yeah, okay. So I'm uh, moving Councillor uh, Fillion's uh, motion also. And uh, an additional motion on my behalf. Uh, Madam Chair, we will uh, we will present the motion that we have, and we're just working on uh, creating a motion uh, that uh, Councillor uh, Cole just uh, just spoke about. Yes, and we can give you time to do that. And uh, but anyways, I'm putting the, forth that motion, and uh, and I'm certainly supporting Councillor Fillion's uh, motion. Uh, okay, Madam Chair, we have uh, we have Councillor Cole's uh, motions displayed here. Uh, Madam Chair, the uh, the motion that we had displayed for Councillor Cole has um, has both of his parts, and it has the part for Councillor Fillion and the, the part that he had mentioned in his speaking time. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we saw the motion, so can we continue with Councillor Cole's speaking? Yeah, okay. I'll yeah. just uh, conclude then my remarks. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, something that obviously is going to uh, be discussed at Council too, but I, I think Councillor Layton is uh, pointing to uh, uh, this uh, harsh reality we face of uh, no matter all the incredible uh, work that is done by transportation staff, uh, uh, no matter uh, what penalties are put in place in the speed cameras and um, uh, the uh, red light cameras, uh, and you know my history with red light cameras going goes back uh, 20 years when uh, uh, I wouldn't say I had uh, incredible opposition to any kind of technology used to enhance speed, and uh, it was as if I was. Uh, introducing uh, nuclear weapons into uh, the city of Toronto when I asked for uh, speed cameras uh, uh, and uh, and uh, for uh, also red light cameras. But uh, the technology helps. Uh, the designated uh, safety zones help, but uh, we still, as Councillor Layton said, we're still not getting the message across the people that uh, they are their own speed cameras. You know, they have to, we all have to slow down uh, we have to be uh, much more conscious of uh, our pedestrians, our cyclists, our elderly, our children. Uh, you know, we had the speed camera at, at Avenue Road and uh, uh, Castlefield at Allenby School. We, in a, a three month period, I think we had uh, 5,000 uh, people speeding in front of a school. 5,000 people speeding up Avenue Road past Allenby School. So, anyways, uh, those were my remarks. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers on this item? Okay, I'd like to, uh, Councillor Pasternak, go ahead. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to speak on this, on this issue, but this, the, this momentum towards 
entire wards of community safety zones uh, are, it, it is a very problematic from so many perspectives. Uh, the, the ability to enforce it, the ability to find the capital to implement it, uh, the confusion on when you go from one ward uh, to another, uh, the fact that it will sap uh, vital traffic safety and road safety resources from, from other wards, uh, and it'll make the whole concept of the community safety zone meaningless because what you've done is you've spread it all over, uh, you know, so thin uh, that it won't have any meaning at all. Um, you know, we, we have wards the size of small cities and um, what you're doing, you're taking a small city and making the whole thing a community safety zone. I mean, if you want to go do some, uh, you know, strategic identification of, of areas of concern uh, in your various wards, that's the, that's the policy and that's the strategy uh, we have now. But we are going down a road where this is going to end up in court. We're going to have the province all over our, our back. You're going to be draining resources from other parts of the, of the city and from other safety programs. I'm not going to be supporting any of this wardwide community safety zones. It waters down the whole meaning of it. And it's going to get us into a whole legal mess. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I will indulge the committee with letting Councillor Carroll speak, although we did go outside inside, but um, go ahead, Councillor Carroll. Sorry, uh, I'll just speak briefly. Um, uh, similar to Councillor Pasternak, I, I was planning on not speaking, waiting and seeing what if this report uh, does when it gets to, to council. I'm just concerned, and, and this report is going to council. I'm just concerned about one thing. Um, I, I would have loved to have heard a little more from staff about if we were to do this, if we were to move this motion now, which is different from what was envisioned, pardon the pun, in vision zero for, for rollout. Uh, for instance, in, in my ward, I, I'm, I'm fairly far east in North York, so I'm still waiting for the, the blanket speed limit changes to make their way across the city to me. Um, I'm not so concerned about um, changing things across a whole ward because once the rollout is done, that's what we'll have. Um, uh, when uh, when my colleague is concerned because uh, his ward is the size of uh, uh, of, a, of a city and and how can you do something across the whole ward? Well, that's what Vision Zero is going to do. You know, changing every local road to thirty kilometers and 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 the others on down uh, is a massive change in behavior. And once it's done, it makes it much easier to contemplate things like traffic calming measures where it needs to be 30K ever. There is an overall uh, pervasive wardwide uh, uh, implementation coming. That's the rollout of Vision Zero. My only concern, and I would love to hear between now and council, uh, is what would be the impact of moving this motion now for the downtown core? Does it change the rollout of the Vision Zero measures in my ward and, and others in the inner suburbs? Uh, but uh, uh, I don't have a vote today, so I have to wait till council to say that. Okay, thank you. Um, additional speakers to this item? Councillor Perusa? We can't hear you, Councillor Perutza. We can't hear you. Can we have um, tech support um, talk to Councillor Perutza? While tech support's um, working with uh, Councillor Perutza, I'm, I'm happy to speak. Um, I have a motion. Uh, this is the motion you've probably seen a letter submitted by the mayor um, that uh, I'm moving on his behalf to accelerate the acquisition and implementation of 25 additional speed um, automated speed enforcement cameras. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of uh, the additional item by uh, the deputy mayor to start to look at the heavy duty vehicles on our streets. Um, it is appalling to, to find out that, you know, he went through all of them and found that there was garbage trucks that were speeding in 
uh, school safety zones. Um, that's not acceptable. So I think it'll be good for us to see this additional information in March and um, have a good conversation about how we can do better ar around that. Um, I, I'm also looking forward to um, through the budget process uh, to finding the information that Council Crawford and I asked for in November about how we can accelerate uh, the rollout of Vision Zero across the city. In particular, one of the ones that I'm most interested in is the mid-block crossing, and uh, we just had another fatality in Scarborough at a mid-block crossing. We have areas where we have um, more than two kilometers between between crossings, and um, we need to look at that seriously, look at the warrant system and start to use a common sense approach um, to that in addition uh, to an antiquated um, um, warrant system. Um, I am supportive of Councillor Layton's, um, uh, and sorry, this is the second motion that was linked, linked with the first uh, to expand the program for, further at the earliest date. Um, I am supportive of Councillor Layton's first two motions um, as well as uh, Councillor Cole's first motion about the senior zones. I don't support making whole wards community safety zones because it really undermines the idea of finding um, problematic areas to protect children, to protect seniors, to protect vulnerable road users, which was the whole intent by community safety zones. Also, based on the Highway Traffic Act, I don't think it's legal to make an entire area a community safety zone. Um, we do need to have some prioritization. I do understand that um, councillors want to be able to put ASC on other roads that on other areas that aren't uh, community safety zones that aren't uh, automated speed enforcement zones. We all have problematic areas, especially on arterials where we'd like to see that, but we have advocated to the provincial government for that in uh, previous motions in the last quarter. I think we do need to continue to advocate to the province so that we can have more flexibility around where we can put ASCs. Um, but I don't think that making everywhere a community safety zone will achieve that in, 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 in a good way. And, and we do need to have prioritization. Otherwise, what was the whole point of bringing in the community safety zones in the first place? So um, so on that basis, I am, uh, um, I will uh, pass it over. Hopefully we can get Councilor Peruta online so that he can speak now. Pardon uh, me, Chair. Yes. It's uh, Stephen Holliday. I, uh, I joined the meeting rather hastily because I was watching this on YouTube and, I wondered if you would allow me to speak on this issue as well, and I'll take your your guidance either way. Well, let's see if we have Councillor Prudza, because you could help us stall if we need more time to get Councillor Prudza online. Do we have Councillor Prudza? I don't know. Can you we hear can me? We can hear you. Yes, we oh, can hear thank you. Oh, God. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, um, we will so, so, hear from so, Councillor Prudza. Yeah, so, so Madam Chair, if we can just sort of back up a sec, because we, we've We've sort of been um, we're, we're confronted now with kind of like a philosophical statement uh, in, in a sense, uh, and it's a philosophical statement that that you kind of sort of have to say, oh, geez, you know, I who doesn't agree with that? Who doesn't who 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 in it wouldn't uh, agree with saying um, make the whole world a safety zone? Like seriously, right? But I, I, I just, I'm just, I guess my, 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 my trepidation in this is, is what does that mean, right? So maybe if we can have, just open it up to questions again, because I would like to hear from our staff on what the implications of uh, sort of this, this, this declaration and what does it mean for all of it? Oh, yeah, what does it mean for the, for the city, right? uh so could we do that please uh because because it's hard not to you know i i, I would like to support my, my good friend councillor cole here and councillor layton i get that uh and and you know you ask the question uh you know uh, if you don't support those motions and uh you know you're gonna have i'm gonna have people from councillor holiday's neighborhood calling me and saying why didn't you do my my ward a safety zone? Why didn't you declare mine? Because we want to be safe here too, right? But I just need to know what it means, right? Please. So maybe I I, I have a question of staff. Maybe a second yeah. round of questions. I don't know if Councillor Holiday would like to ask a question of staff or Councillor Wong about what what declaring the entire city a safety zone means. You need a motion. Uh, so I'd like to move a second round, please. For questions to staff. Madam Chair, your mic appears to be muted. 
Well, that's interesting. My mic has been muted. Um, so I was, uh, I was saying, you know, we have had, um, you have the ability to ask these questions at council, um, at, and uh, I think you can. But deal but, with but, that. but 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 I need. But I'm, you're asking me to vote on this now, and I would like to have some clarity on it now. Okay, uh, not Councillor Prita is moving to yeah. reopen questions. All those in favor? All those opposed? You can answer. Okay. Okay, um, back to, do you have any additional comments on this, Councillor Pruta? Well, barring not understanding what I'm, what I'm actually voting for, um, um, you know, given the fact that, um, uh, that the entire city is going to be declared a safety zone, and I don't know what that means uh, in terms of marking, signage, lighting, um, uh, uh, and all of those other things that uh, that come with it. Uh, uh, certainly, Councillor Cole mentioned enforcement uh, and so on, and and what it means for the city, what it means for people's, uh, you know, sort of ability to get around the city. I don't know. Uh, so um, uh, th those would be uh, the the comments uh, 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 that I would make on this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we did um, go back to speakers and I did allow Councillor Carroll to speak after we had called for outside councillors. So in fairness, um, I think we can allow uh, Councillor Holliday to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. As I said, I've been monitoring this through YouTube and uh, was sort of aghast at the, uh, at the motion that went out. So I scrambled to connect myself. Um, Wow, uh, I, it reminds me of a conversation I had yesterday with a constituent who was just begging, saying, "Look, can you can you get the ASC camera to the school uh, nearby because of what I see?" And I said, "You know, there's a thousand schools in the city, and they're working their way around, but they'll get there eventually. So just please be patient with us." And so, you know, I appreciate we might get a little bit more to 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 get out and change behaviors in those, but perhaps it was predictable that this motion would come. But I, I would like to say there should be extreme caution in playing the game of creating a safety zone all over the city Hello. in order to move automated IT speed enforcement. Sir Prusa, you're not muted. To allow automated speed enforcement all over the city. Uh, but the po the caution I would have in that is, let's remember the, the drivers only get uh, a financial ticket. They don't get a ding on their insurance. They actually don't get the finger pointed at them directly for their behavior. And I wonder if, you know, the the opportunity that we have with the existing ASC points, you just have to get a ticket somewhere to remind you to change your behavior. It doesn't have to be everywhere. The drivers that speed on a local street, I always tell people, they speed on your street, but you know what? They're speeding in other places and they're gonna get burnt. They're gonna get nailed by somebody. But the, the closing argument I would make, instead of all of this focus on the ASE system, I'd love to have the counselors that are proposing to, to do this, to show up at budget committee and depute and ask for more police officers. Let's hire some more police officers to get out there and write tickets the old fashioned way. Is if you, if you start to think about uh, all of this, when you have a police officer, a human eyes on the street, they can get people for the behavior that includes speeding. It includes illegal lane changes, running red lights, doing other dangerous things, stunt driving. And eventually somebody gets caught with those tickets. Their insurance finds out they have serious financial penalties. And that's when you see the behavior start to change. So, you know, the ASC is a wonderful tool in school zones. They get people to slow down. And then those people know once they exit those areas that you see them revert back to their own behavior. I've watched them do it. But if you have more police officers out on the street writing the tickets and getting people in all sorts of places for all sorts of things, I think that's where you see the behavior change. So I would just urge members to use extreme caution in considering this type of emotion because I'm not sure it's going to get us to the place that we want to be, which is that nirvana. I think the, the answer might be is back to the old fashioned principles of, uh, of writing a ticket and reminding people that, you know, you have to co conduct yourself accordingly and conduct yourself safely on the road. And that there might just be a police officer around the corner that is going to, that is going to give you that ticket and your insurance is going to find out. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. 
Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no additional speakers, um, we can move to the votes on these items. I'll let the Matthew walk us through that. We'll have to uh, vote on them at Siri Adam. Um, yes. Here and um, Council uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong has already asked for a separate vote on um, on Councillor Layton's motions, and likewise, we'll need that on Councillor Cole's motions. I think the others are all fine, though. Yep. Uh, so, Madam Chair, I believe we'll, motive, we'll we will need to vote on motion three A first. That's on amend item. So that's the uh, the delete and replace. We'll vote on uh, item uh, motion three A first. It's the item to amend, and then we'll follow. Uh, I believe in in motion order. So we'll follow with Councillor Layton's motion one, Councillor Cole's motion two, and then your motion three B. Great, and we can we can show them on the screen for each one. So three A. Right. Go yep. ahead. So we'll display uh, motion three A now to vote. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can take that down. All those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. Okay, we'll display motion one by Councillor Layton. Uh, if I recall correctly, I believe we are voting on part three separately. Is that correct? Yes. And then the balance following that, is that correct? Yeah. Well, I guess you're highlighting one and two. We can do one and two first. Certainly. So we'll we'll vote on uh, parts one and two only. Um, so, Madam Chair, is this a recorded vote? Uh, I Unless somebody uh, wants no. it, I don't think anybody's no. asked for it. Okay, okay, great. So we just need to change the screen back. Mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. Okay, and this is uh, part three of motion one. If I could get a recorded vote on this, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so a recorded vote on part three of motion one by Councillor Layton. All in favor? Uh, Chair McKelvey? No, Councilor no, Ford. No. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm not in favor. Not in favor. All in, sorry. All in favor of uh, part three, motion one. Uh, Councillor Peruta. Councillor Cole. Councillor Layton. All in favor of part three, motion one. Oh, sorry. All all opposed. Pardon me. That is count. So count, uh, Deputy Mayor Men Wong. Uh, Chair McKelvey, and Councillor Pasternak. Madam Chair, part three of motion one by Councillor Layton uh, fails on a tie vote. That is three to three. We have Councillor Cole's part one and part two, and those need to be separated. Okay, so this is motion two by Councillor Cole, part one only. Could you, can you put up that again? Could you put, could you put that back for yep. more than three seconds? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Just let us know and we'll take that down. All right. Okay. Um, all in favor? All opposed? That item carries. Councillor okay. Cole's part two. A recorded vote. Okay. I'm going to predict it's going to lose on a tie, but <laughs> a wild guess. <laughs> Councillor Cole's motion to part two. All in favor, please. Councillor Layton, Councillor Cole, Councillor Peruta, and all opposed. Councillor Manette, oh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Long, uh, Chair McKelvey, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, Madam Chair, that uh, part two of motion two by Councillor Cole uh, fails on a tie vote, and that is three to three. Okay, I think that's it for motions on this item. So we just need to vote on 27.8 uh, uh, item as amended. Part B, I believe we need, still need your potion or part B. Oh, okay. Yep. So this is 3B by Councillor McKelvey, or uh, Chair McKelvey, pardon me. Okay. And we can take that down. All in favor? All opposed? That item carries. I think that's it for motions. So we can vote on the item as amended. That's correct. 
Item as amended, all those in favor? All those opposed, that item carries. We need to vote on the additional item, uh, IE 27.15, um, all those in favor? All those opposed, that item carries. Okay, that uh, completes this item. It brings us to our next item, which is IE 27.10, review of the city's shoot closure program. Uh, we have one deputant on this, uh, Daryl Chong with the Greater Toronto Apartment Association. May I start? You may start, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair McKelvey and good morning committee members. Uh, as you know, the Greater Toronto Apartment Association's members own and manage more than 150,000 units of multifamily purpose-built rental housing. Uh, the, the first paragraph of the background section of the report provides an excellent summary of the program. Um, basically says it was introduced in 2010 as a tool to support improved waste diversion. It creates less convenience of access and the elimination of this convenience of garbage on every floor has the potential to increase diversion rates. So pretty clear and concise. Um, it then goes through the process it's a formal application. It meets this, the building has to meet city's uh, eligibility criteria. Each step is reviewed and approved by city staff. And, you know, it takes considerable time and effort, but pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, but as a final step, and there's not a lot of airtime in the report about this final step, uh, the building owner must then conduct a poll or a vote demonstrating that at least 51% of the rental units support the application to close the chute. So, this is nearly impossible to attain. You're not gonna find anywhere near 51% of residents, in most cases, voluntarily uh, agreeing to end some convenience. So the next step we feel is to increase diversion in many buildings is via shoot closures. We've been working with city staff uh, or waste management staff for years, displayed new signs, redesigned posters, purchased the bins, built enclosures, uh, trained waste ambassadors in some of the buildings, done all the sort of education and training that you would expect um, for years and years. And, and still we're not seeing that huge uptick that we need to see in diversion rates. So, so we request that the committee, that you um, investigate option three as, as posed in the staff report uh, to further investigate um, the removal of the need for shoot closure permits for any building and maintain safety and accessibility requirements. We're not asking you to vote today to make a change. Uh, what we're asking is perhaps to send staff back to do a more exhaustive study of option three or any of the other options, instead of just letting this one sort of die on the vine. The, the recommendation of staff report is just status quo. So we suggest that status quo is probably not good enough um, and we shouldn't let this just end today perhaps uh, a little bit of a deeper dive by staff to figure out what's not working. Um, they were a little bit surprised to hear that the 51% was a hurdle, but it clearly is. And that ends my, my uh, remarks. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, speakers on this item. Okay, I do have a motion. I'll speak to the item. Uh, so this is just asking that city staff uh, continue to look into this further, in particular option one, um, so that we can allow uh, build more buildings, including those that don't have city pickup, to join the shoot closure program. And this has been uh, uh, this motion is from working with Councilor Nunziata, who is quite committed to seeing that this program is expanded. Uh, the current report focuses mainly on the rationale of doing shoot closures as um, as a diversion uh, opportunity, which it is, but I think there's also a quality of life aspect that is missed in the report and does need um, a deeper dive and, and a conversation. And, and there are oftentimes garbage being left in the shoot rooms because it's too big, it doesn't fit down, or the shoot is blocked. Uh, this creates pest issues, and so I think we do need to have a look at not just the ability of this program to to divert waste, but also to improve quality of life in buildings. So uh, this report is just asking that um, staff continue to do some work in this area and report back at a future day on um, on on this possibility. Uh, any additional speakers to this item? 
Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Um, we'll vote, uh, sorry, all those opposed? Uh, the amendment carries. All those on the motion as amended, or the item was amended. All those opposed, that item carries. Um, thank you. That brings us to our next uh, item, which is IE 27.11, data comparison of in-house and contracted waste uh, collection. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you held the item. So, uh, oh, we have outside councils, uh, councillor staff. Uh, councillor Carroll has questions, so I'll let councillor Carroll um, go first. I'm going to step out for about two minutes. So, um, maybe, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, if you could chair and, oh, Councillor Pasternak's here. Councillor Pasternak, can you, uh, chair for a minute, a couple of minutes? Thank you. Can I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thanks. So, Sorry. um, yes. I just had a question in the comparison. We also got in this, uh, this report, uh, an update on the capital program and the vehicles that we hold ourselves. Um, and out of, uh, 187 vehicles, some of those are vehicles supervising all the districts, including the contracted out ones, but there, I see 89 collection vehicles and, uh, I'm wondering how the extended producer responsibility program as it rolls out affects how many vehicles we need, or is it a case that those 89 collect waste, then they collect recycling, they're, they're, they're dual and triple purpose such that uh, the extended producer responsibility won't change our, uh, uh, our vehicle program that much? Thank you for the uh, the question, Councillor. So, um, when we're looking at the, the number of vehicles that we have as it relates to extended producer responsibility, we um, are at a point now where we're discussing uh, possible options with the producer responsibility organizations um, to, to, of oh. course, come back to council to seek direction on if the city will continue to provide a recycling collection or if that will transition at a, at a cost recovery, of course, or if it would transition to the producers. So we looked at the number of fleet that uh, will be needed to maintain our program. And instead of purchasing a number of, of new vehicles, as we would normally purchase uh, in the regular uh, workings of the operation, um, we've tapered the, the purchasing of new vehicles down just slightly so that we're not purchasing vehicles to then not need them. So we have uh, additional uh, a, a budget to to fund the the uh, maintenance and operation of a little slightly older vehicles, but that's the balance that we're working uh, at on right now within the division of making sure that we don't buy vehicles that we end up not needing. Okay. Or alternatively, is it it is it possible if they contract us extended producer uh, uh, producer responsibility means we continue with our program. But they pay us to do it as with their 100% responsibility. If if they end up using that model, they we could end up requiring them to contribute to that capital program. Yeah, absolutely, councillor. So that will be um, some a, a recommendation that's brought forward to council to direct staff uh, to either continue collecting the materials and being provided full cost recovery by the producers or to not move forward uh, with collecting that material anymore and have the producers go do that themselves. So we, we are currently having those discussions with the producer groups and we will be reporting back to council seeking direction on that, which will then impact our capital program uh, for sure. Right, and, and one last question, just to refresh my memory, when will we get the, the next uh, update report back? Um, when will you be reporting back on, on the extended producer negotiations next. So our plan is to report back uh, before the the August break. Um, oh, and, oh and so okay, great. Yeah, and and yes. if there's any change to that, we will definitely communicate with councillors uh, on on potential timelines. But Fantastic. this is uh, the the transition is is happening uh, mid next year, so J uh, July 2023. So seeking direction uh, sooner rather than later is is absolutely critical to the operation. Yeah, you can't build a budget for the following year without that. Yeah. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that info. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carroll. Any other questions for staff? Uh, Councillor nope. Layton and then Deputy Mayor Minawong. Thank you very much. I just, just some very quick questions. The Is there any tracking of the number of stops 
in each of the uh, in each of the districts? So, oh, um, uh, Councilor, the number of stops would be directly correlated to the number of of um, single family homes, multi residential buildings that we collect from. So there's approximately 460,000 residences that the vehicles would stop at um, due to collecting materials from those residents. Okay, I know, and I'm I'm sorry I didn't ask this earlier, or just because it would be int an interesting breakdown to determine, like a, another metric at which to judge the 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 effectiveness of collection at at those four points or in, the, in those four districts. Um, how frequently is it possible to do the reporting? about the performance in each district? Like what's realistic with it without making any additional work? What could be a, a, a frequency that we get some of this data? Uh, so counselor, we could report on on this information, I think reasonably every every six months to, to every year um, as an information report to, to council or as a, as a, as a memo to, to counselors just on the progress and, and our key performance indicators uh, of in-house versus uh, contracted out. And how are the how are the problems with contractors reported out? Like within, if if we do have um, liquidated damages, or if we're like when you're when our compliance staff deal with the uh, the the contractors, is there a tracking system for that? The nature of the concern, the resolution. Yeah, absolutely, Councilor. There's there's a tracking uh, protocol with our contract management uh, supervisors who uh, routinely, um, you know, not just follow up with the contractors, but also are, are on the streets watching uh, what they do. Uh, so we we do track that. Also, we have the the data from three one one on on missed collections and and looking at the the time to resolution for those. Uh, so we do have uh, quite a, a robust follow up uh, process through our contract okay. management team. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Deputy Mayor Minowong. Uh Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to confirm a couple of points. 2019, the all-in cost, the difference between uh, east of Young Street and west of Young Street was approximately $16 million. Is that correct? Um, that's correct, Councillor. So it was, it was $16 million more on the public to deliver public garbage total cost than it was for the private sector. That's correct, Councillor. And that will that that reduced to 13 million uh in the next in the 2020. Is that fair? That, that's correct, right? That's a correct statement, Councillor. Yeah. So um what's the term of the contract? Is it seven years, five for seven, or is seven for nine uh on the a private on the private side what's generally the term of the contract so generally the terms are uh between five and, and seven years um the the contract that was just uh, approved by council for district one uh, was five years plus the option of two additional years five plus and you usually have to do that to amortize the cost of the vehicle right that's correct so if if our so then if you were to take the cost of the contract, you know, all things being equal, you can't know what collective bargaining would yield in terms of costs or inflation or whether there's going to be more recycling or less recycling. If you just kind of average get those two years and take, you know, on average 15 million a year over the term of the contract, the city is ahead on the private side, a hundred million dollars than what it would be uh, on the on the private side than what it would be on the public side. Um, if you extrapolated those figures that you clearly just said, um, yes, that would be correct. Wow. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, deputy mayor. Any other questions for staff? Don't see any, any speakers. I'll speak. Deputy mayor, Minna Wong, then councilor Carroll. Yeah. I, and then, I, sorry, I did request earlier. Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Carroll's first as guest of the committee. All right. Well, I, I don't differentiate, but Councillor Carroll, as a courtesy, you can go first. I, yeah, I just, I, I've been chronically coming in when I shouldn't after you've gone into committee. So I wanted to just this once be conventional about it. Um, yeah, I, I asked my questions about 
about how all of this may change as a result of extended producer responsibility. Uh, this report comes as a as part of the uh, the the work that was done to renew the contract in in District One and Two. And uh, uh, well, well, Deputy Mayor just uh, asked about the the, the cost differentials. Um, in simple, plain dollars, we could say yes, that that is the case. Except that that we don't know what the ins and outs are. We don't know what the the business load is on one side and the other. We we need we need more information than this. Um, what we do know is, is that generally speaking, staff do still recommend the dynamic tension between the, the, the two halves of the city is what keeps both affordable. I asked my questions because I think we as councillors really have to uh, carefully watch those extended producer, um, sorry, um, uh, those extended producer uh, uh, responsibility negotiations, because I think that's where the real ability to uh, to to manage our costs comes in, and and because this is a real consumer based utility program where we manage our costs, we manage the cost of the bin directly and immediately to our our residents, and extended produ producer responsibility um, affects the cost for both the contractor and our employees, uh, uh, but it also affects all of the capital costs, and as the vehicle explanation points out, we have capital costs. Um, that we absorb even where we contract out because we've got to go out and, and manage that contract. We've got to supervise those districts. We have to, to uh, be able to react to the complaints and we have to be able to get out there, um, whether it's city workers or, or uh, um, our, our contract workers. If you have a massive flood in an area and suddenly everyone is disposing of the entire contents of their basement, those are extraordinary circumstances that are becoming less and less extraordinary and it's solid waste that has to suddenly step up and deal with them. So it's hard to really look at this, but when we, when we look at extended producer responsibility, one of the biggest things we, we, we have on our plate is uh, the recycling program and that helps us reduce in, in both. And so I think we have to start to focus more on our negotiations with the province than with this endless debate of, of to contract or not to contract. We've, 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 we've gone ahead with the renewal process. Now we need to zero one on making sure that what the province promised, they actually mean. And that extended producer responsibility takes as much of the load off us for, for the, the cost of the recycling program as humanly possible in every district. Those are my comments, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, Deputy Mayor Min Wong. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think this is a, an important report that uh, deserves some reflection and consideration. Um, it says a number of things. For, uh, firstly, it says on the service delivery, there, there's really not a lot of difference, like, you know, a couple of points here, a couple of points there within the margin of error. The service deli delivery is essentially the same. Um, uh, so let, the only sort of material difference is in is in price and in cost. So uh, you know, service is the same, etc. But it's the cost that, and you know, there's it's no surprise that um, I'm a fan of, of contracting out garbage. In fact, I was the I was uh, chair of the committee when we first uh, move when we moved forward with contracting out garbage uh, for the entire area west of of Young Street. And over that period of time. Um, we saved, uh, I believe, eighty-eight million dollars over the life of the contract. It was eleven million. Was it? Yeah, it was over. Uh, now, now, what we're learning is, is, is it's even more. And so, if there's any dispute, you know, and and, and I see another councillor shaking his head. Well, the numbers don't lie, and this report says was it says what it says, and the and the savings is there, um, and and so the report is what the report is. And the savings is there to the taxpayers to the tune uh, over the life of the contract of a hundred million dollars. So that's one great benefit we're getting to contract and contracting out. In addition to the fact that uh, you know it gives us greatest flex greater flexibility, um, and it gives us actually uh, more. Uh, you know, we, one of the big things that it gives us is 
an opportunity when we're in our, when, when, when we're discussing our, our collective agreements that we're not going to be held ransom by having a stinky garbage strike across the entire city they, that we can actually have more, more power and authority and flexibility to negotiate. So there's all sorts of benefits here. So this, I think the, this data actually shows and this report reflects and demonstrates that contracting out is in fact good for the city of Toronto uh and it does and it saves the taxpayers a great deal of money while providing the same level of service that the public sector provides thank you mr chairman thank you uh deputy mayor uh, anyone left to speak i guess uh, councillor layton yes thank you very much so the deputy mayor says the data doesn't lie the problem here is he's not actually exploring the data he ignored a whole set of data points so it's not that the data might not lie here, sir, but you're, you're lacking one important piece of data. And I asked about it, how many customers? You know, east of Young, there's 210,000 customers. That's good, that's fine. West of Young, or sorry, east of Young, there's, west of Young, there's 210,000 customers. East of Young, there's 236,000 customers, plus 31,000 night collections. There are 25%, almost 25% less customers west of Young. You starting to get my, my point here? Why the numbers may be different in the cost? <clears throat> Don't just make assumptions, Deputy Mayor, that, that you're all of a sudden the private sector and, and, and you are somehow pulling the, 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 the curtain back when in fact you have done zero analysis about the cost per customer here. There's a difference in cost, yes. There's 25% more customers in the, pro in the public option. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton, for that map lesson. Um, are there any other speakers on, on the item? Okay. Um, Mr. Clerk, I, I don't see any motions moved uh, during this discussion. And, um, I think we can just uh, move receipt. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, you can uh, you can take the take the call for the vote on the on the item. Here. Okay, uh, I will I will move receipt. Uh, all those in favor? I'm sorry. What's wrong? I just want to be clear. Uh, sorry, you're adopting the recommendations in the item, yes, to receive the report for information? He's adopting the recommendation, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if it's the will of committee, I can quickly release uh, the, the Baycrest, um, the new item to allow for the Baycrest run. Uh, Councillor Cole is the local councillor, uh, had a couple of remarks and, and I would add to it uh, as well. Um, can we quickly dispose of this item uh, and, and we can go golfing? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, councillor Cole. Thank you, Councillor Pasternak. Yeah, essentially, uh, most of you know, uh, Baycrest is a, an iconic uh, uh, medical facility uh, that uh, is a world leader in uh, brain health and uh, all the research in uh, elder aging and uh, uh, they have a hospital and they have the huge uh, residential component and um, a lot of their funds come from uh, charitable activities and charitable donations and uh, this is an attempt by them to continue to find ways of funding their uh, incredible array of programs uh, through this uh, ride uh, that uh, they're asking uh, council to support. Uh, and so I just want to uh, just remind people of it that I think if, uh, as you know, you can never get enough money from uh, government. So this is a way of whereby the volunteers at Baycrest, which are in the thousands, uh, can actually uh, help fund these uh, essential life-saving programs. Uh, so I totally support uh, uh, this initiative going forward uh, with my partner to the north, Councillor Pasternak. Great, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cole. Um, 
Yeah, I would wow. I would simply uh, echo some of the remarks. Uh, when when you hear of Baycrest, uh, you hear of a remarkable institution, excellence in health sciences, in seniors living, in research, and and in healthcare. And whether it's independent living, assisted living, long term care, or pro post acute hospital, they are so um, resident focused and patient focused. Um, you know, when one makes a list of places where they'd like uh, their their mother or father uh, to, to be in, in their elder years, Baycrest is almost on everyone's wait list uh, to to put their, uh, their their mother or father into care. Um, you know, I've attended many events at Baycrest um, um, as, a, as a guest uh, to, to bring greetings from the city. Uh, and, you know, when you when you see the programming there to keep to keep seniors active, um, to keep them, um, you know, participating uh, in a wide range of activities, it is total respect for our aging population. And it's a room full of, of warmth, of, of friendship, of caring, uh, a remarkable staff, um, and it is, it is community. So in, in the fields of science these days, the popular media is now folks focused on kind of commercial space travel. Uh, but Bay, Baycrest down here on Earth is a leader in the new medical frontier, uh, doing work uh, in the brain, uh, doing innovation work in the fields of Alzheimer's, movement disorders, MS and Parkinson's, memory loss and mental wellness. They are a leader uh, across the city. So Baycrest stands as one of those non-governmental partners uh, that keeps Toronto strong and healthy and livable. A government alone cannot do the great work that they're doing, uh, but our institutions of higher learning, training and medical advancement, and seniors, uh, seniors care that will lead us out of the pandemic, they're the ones who will make the big difference. Uh, in conclusion, I would just simply say uh, that uh, there is a perception that our roads are are dominated by cars, and that is true. But it's also important to remember 500 times a year, we close roads for various causes, whether it's whether it's uh, cultural festivals, uh, whether it's celebrations, uh, whether it's fundraisers. And this event uh, here will allow Baycrest to recover from the pandemic, to keep on doing the great work it's doing, and to help thousands who rely on their services and help Toronto remain as a livable city that it is. So um, I therefore uh, present to you uh, the motion for the um, planned uh, Baycrest ride, uh, which will allow them to raise, raise the funds they need to continue the great work uh, they're doing and contribute to our livable city. Thank you. Any other speakers on the item? We could put the motion on the screen. I think we can uh, we can certainly uh, put the uh, the letter up, uh, Councillor Pasternak. Everyone have a look at it. It's great. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed. Uh, that is carried. I see Chair McKelvey has returned, uh, so I will hand the gavel back to her. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, the next item is IE 2714. This was the new business added by Councillor Cole, urgent need to support comprehensive transportation study to address hypergrid lock and related traffic safety at Lawrence Avenue West, Marley Avenue, and the Allen Road. Um, Councillor Cole, would you like to speak to your item and move it? Uh, yes, uh, I'll just, uh, if you could put it up on the screen. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, most of you have had the, uh, the excruciating experience of trying to uh, access uh, the Allen Road uh, off of Lawrence uh, Avenue at Marley and uh, Allen, or try to get into the new Lawrence Allen Center. It has been a... Uh, a hyper uh, gridlock uh, intersection for uh, generations. Uh, and uh, because of the uh, 
Spadina Expressway and Allen Road, uh, etc. But uh, right now, uh, the situation is being exasperated uh, because of the uh, the new provincial policy about uh, intensification near um, transit station, and uh, so uh, in an area where there are generally fairly uh, low-rise buildings and uh, townhouses, uh, we're seeing applications coming in at 45 stories uh, in that. Uh, general area around uh, Lawrence and uh, the Allen Road. Uh, I've got uh, another six uh, significant development applications occurring on Marley to the south. Um, uh, so I want to uh, uh, get some attention and focus on uh, creating a uh, a manageable uh, traffic uh, plan, uh, transportation plan for this uh, intersection. Uh, and I want them to look at uh, 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 things beyond just uh, traffic counts and that. I want to look at some uh, possible configurations uh, and changes of traffic uh, routing in the area. Uh, in light of the fact uh, uh, is that we have uh, Two uh, uh, ramps from the Allen that at, one uh, is a northbound exit, one is a southbound uh, uh, ramp that uh, proceed off of Lawrence that are rarely used. Uh, we did a count at one of the southbound exits uh, ramps, uh, whereby uh, there are about uh, 25 a day that use this ramp, and those are people that get lost. Uh, because why would you go south on uh, Lawrence to Eglinton and get stuck in another uh, lineup of uh, 100 cars at Eglinton and uh, the Allen? So, anyways, I wanted to look at uh, this, and there's uh, uh, possible ways of uh, having uh, a better access for the TTC buses uh, that uh, try to uh, pick up passengers and uh, drop off passengers at the Lawrence West subway station. It's a very narrow uh, space there. There are on uh, many occasions, six, seven buses all backed up on Lawrence. So you can imagine the uh, chaos that exists. You've got six or seven buses. You've got people lined up uh, through the intersection trying to access the Allen, especially going north. So I just want to try and get this uh, study expedited. Uh, and I know uh, I'm on staff to look at the business case for uh, paying for such a study uh, so we can maybe make some adjustments uh, that will help alleviate uh, the present uh, uh, hyper gridlock that exists at this intersection, plus the anticipated uh, uh, gridlock that will be caused by the uh, unprecedented number of uh, new development applications in this uh, immediate area and uh, to the south. So I'm just asking for staff to uh, find a way of uh, perhaps uh, dealing with uh, some uh, remedial uh, reconfigurations of traffic in and around the Lawrence West Station that, uh, and access to the Allen Road, uh, and that'll make it easier for uh, traffic to flow safely, pedestrians. And, you know, we also had uh, two years ago, we had an unfortunate death of a resident. Uh, run over by a dump truck trying to cross uh, Lawrence Avenue at Marley there. Uh, so we need uh, this uh, in light of the fact we've got these uh, pressures from uh, development uh, that are unprecedented. And we've also got uh, uh, the potential uh, to uh, uh, use these uh, um, city properties maybe to help uh, reconfigure the access to the uh, bus station and uh, to the uh, Allen Road. So that's the motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Councillor Carrero, do you have questions of the mover? I just wanted to ask a quick question of the mover. I, I don't know if the councillor would have looked into this. When we were dealing in section 37 legislation, and it, this, this is similar to what happened when the Shepherd subway went in and it was decreed that a that a set amount to address traffic so that for the major moves like a major study like this money was being collected 
uniformly from every development application. Have you checked with staff? Are we still able to do that now that we have switched under Bill 108 to this new general CBC? Yeah, that's an excellent question uh, because as you well know, according to uh, Bill 108, uh, the Planning Act, uh, uh, the, the Section 37 is going to end. And so the uh, community uh, benefits uh, that's replacing it, uh, again, it is still quite, uh, uh, it is uh, still quite uh, difficult to get a clear answer on this. Of whether or be able to use that, but certainly that's my intention as, as these developments come on board. The problem I have is these developments are happening so quickly uh, that they're going to be approved uh, uh, before we have the section 37 available. So that's why uh, rather than having individual planning studies or transportation studies or traffic studies for each development, I want to have more of a comprehensive look at the cumulative effect of all these uh, developments occurring all in this uh, immediate area. Right. I'm just I'm just hoping that we're doing everything we can to make sure that they pay for that comprehensive look. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. Uh Councillor Cole's motion carries. Um sorry, I just said I was unmuted. Did you hear all of that? No, Madam no, Chair. No, no, we heard none of it. You heard none yeah. of it. Okay. Please retake um, it. Um I just confirmed there were no additional speakers on this item. Confirming that, uh, Councillor Cole is moving this motion. All those in favor, all those opposed, uh, that item carries. Uh, that brings us to our last item. Councillor Cole, we weren't able to hear you earlier when you declared a conflict on this. So um, we'll let you do that now um, so that you can formally do that and then excuse yourself from the meeting. Uh, yes, uh, just this is on the... <laughs> On the uh, golf motion, yes, uh, I'm just uh, declaring conflict uh, uh, because of uh, uh, my my son is employed by uh, Ernst and Young uh, that uh, is uh, undertaking this uh, study for the city. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, it was great playing charades with you. We will see you at the next meeting. Um, the uh, first deputant is Jeff McKeegan. Hello. Hi, thanks for joining us, Jeff. You have three minutes. All right, cool. So uh, my name is Jeff McKeegan. I'm going to share with you guys a little bit about disc golf. Um, I've been playing disc golf in the city of Toronto since uh, 2014, uh, which is when I found my first disc golf course, which is uh, located uh, behind the Science Centre in Toronto. You might be wondering, you know, what is disc golf? Well, disc golf is very similar to traditional golf. The difference being, instead of a stick and a ball, uh, and, uh, you know, you're hitting a ball into a hole, you're throwing a, a, a frisbee into a suspended catching device. Um, the benefits of disc golf are, 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 are pretty widespread. Um, anyone can play disc golf. You can play disc golf uh, in the winter, in the summer, during uh, the day. You can play even with glow-in-the-dark discs in the evening. Um, it really uh, attracts a wide variety of people that are that that want to play the game, uh, from adults to kids, um, people with disabilities to people who uh, uh, you know just want to try something different. Um, in 2020, uh, we were a part of supporting a, a, a welcome TO Winter initiative to add disc golf to Scarlet Woods Golf Course. So one of the city's golf courses, and uh, it was a big success, uh, so much so that we did the same thing this year uh, in 2021 at Dentonia. Now, one of the benefits of disc golf is that there's an app that you can get, uh, and uh, when you go to play, you log in your rounds. So you get a free scorecard. It gives you a navigation to be able to play, uh, to see where the next holes are. Uh, one of the benefits is that we can pull data uh, to see how many rounds have been played. Um, so, to put it into perspective, the growth of disc golf uh, across the city of Toronto with the courses that are, that are already in the city have really been uh, explosive during COVID. Uh, so, every year, disc golf has kind of doubled uh, in Toronto. Um, so, just to give you an idea, in, in the year uh, 2017, there was 1,000 rounds played. 2018, there was 2,000 rounds played. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm rounding out some of these numbers so they're easier to explain. Uh, 2019, there was 4,000 rounds played. 
And then with the, the, um, uh, the addition of the Scarlet Woods and Antonia in 2020, and then obviously with, uh, the, uh, with, with COVID, uh, we had 20,000 rounds played. And at the end of 2021, we had 45,000 rounds played. Um, and I wanted to share this with you because uh, this ties into uh, the great work that the City of Toronto is doing to bring uh, the golf courses forward where people can use them from all walks of life. Um, we've received lots of really positive letters from people encouraging uh, more use of uh, uh, the city golf courses to include more disc golf and to expand uh, the offering. And I wanted to speak to you because of the, the discussion around uh, thoughts about uh, uh, closing down the golf courses, which kind of goes against this uh, really positive uh, experience uh, that so many people have had. Um, I'm at three minutes and 10 seconds. I had a letter that I was going to read, but based on timing and out of respect to uh, everyone else that wants to speak, I'm going to kind of uh, end it right there and thank everyone for, for your time. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Sorry, I'm just toggling my screen. Okay, seeing none, I just have one quick question. Um, is disc golf the same as frisbee golf? I haven't played either, but i just <laughs> not totally sure what the difference is. No, you're exactly right. It's the same thing. Okay, it's just changed name. Okay, uh, yeah, it was a deep burning question I just had to ask. Uh, any additional <laughs> questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you, Jeff, for uh, your deputation, and I will have to try disc golf one day. Uh, our next speaker is Lucy Falco uh, with Save Toronto Golf Courses. Hello, my name is Lucy Falco, and I am the Chief Golf Advocate, speaking on behalf of a group I helped organize and represent called Save Toronto Golf Courses. We're a group of Torontonians that are passionate about Toronto's municipal courses. We are not funded by industry or any group. We are completely grass or turf roots led. Our group followed the operational review closely and submitted suggestions to the review team. We saw the review as an opportunity to improve public golf by undertaking a long-term plan for golf, environmental sustainability, and community inclusion into these green spaces. We believe the review instead is basically a procurement strategy. It falls short of developing a long-term future plan for these courses. We need a master plan for a world-class model of public golf. It can include improved and expanded golf amenities, youth programming, and inclusion of new Canadians and the diverse populations living in the priority neighborhoods close to all five courses. The courses require strong environmental practices that will bring them into the net zero plan. The courses should develop access to trails and complementary uses in the non-golf season. Our group supports all these strategies, but not a reduction in golf. Golf has never been more popular, and the game is growing quickly among all sectors of the population. These courses offer equitable, affordable access to the game, particularly for seniors and youth who cannot easily travel outside of Toronto or join private courses to play. This has also been the position taken by Councillor Brad Bradford, Councillor Gary Crawford, and Councillor Paula Fletcher. Toronto's municipal courses break down barriers to entry to this increasingly popular game. We recognize that there were interest groups welcomed into the review with a goal of repurposing these courses for uses such as community gardens. We all understand the importance of food security. However, there's no need to undertake a multi-million dollar conversion of a recreational amenity that is no less important than soccer fields, swimming pools, or baseball diamonds. A motion should be put forth to identify available spaces for community gardens among the ample public lands available throughout the city. A master plan should include a citizen steering committee to involve those of us who are deeply committed to the courses and rely on them as the only way to play the game we love. Our group recommends that the committee reject the recommendation for reducing Dentonia and put forth a motion for a long-term plan with Citizens Committee for these valued community assets. We will be presenting a petition with several thousand signatures to council in support of our position. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, question to the deputant. I see Councillor Carroll, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your deputation, Lucy. I wonder, 
you 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 said your your take on the uh, the report was that it really just sort of was moving in the direction of a procurement strategy. I I wonder if you have any comment on there there didn't seem to be a lot of look at uh, the world of gar golf um, universally. Um, that the the growth in the development of twelve hole courses that increases the number of golfers you can put through, et cetera. Uh, learn to play golf parks where where you make them more child friendly. There doesn't seem to be any of that look. Does your organization support having a look at those things before looking at a reduction of a course? Absolutely. We've had a lot of discussion about what the future of municipal golf should look like, particularly in Toronto. We certainly welcome a more inclusive approach, whether whether that includes programming for beginner golf, whether it includes more family activities. Like we think there's endless possibilities on really using these spaces more effectively, more inclusively, more progressively. Um, I see them almost as a community hub, but golf needs to remain the priority. And I think there's a lot of different options that could be included and maybe they'll come forward if there is a steering committee. Yes, yes, thank you. Thanks for your deputation. Thank you. Additional questions, Councillor Fletcher? It's on. Okay, thank you. I, Lucy, thank you for being here. I just wanted to, uh, I'm, I'm reading a number of things and getting some emails from people that saying, why are you supporting this elite sport? And uh, basically saying, we can't hear you, Councillor Fletcher. I'm not sure why. Can anybody else hear her? Your sound just cut out. Is, on. Speak. is it on now? Now we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Just uh, said thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for coming today. And I'm getting letters and emails talking about it's only for rich people. These are country club settings. And uh, could you just comment on that? Is that your experience that these are country club settings? Uh, and uh, kind of high-end golfing experiences. Thank you, Paula. Um, no, I think that nothing could be further from the truth. It's unfortunate that public golf has this uh, this stigma or this reputation. I've been playing the city golf courses now for about 15 years. Uh, I learned how to play at Dentonia as a woman living downtown, taking the subway after work. And certainly I'm in ladies leagues. I'm, I'm now in a league at uh, Scarlet Woods when they're operating. Um, I see women from all walks of life, uh, women taking the TTC. Literally, there's a woman in our league who puts her golf, golf clubs in a shopping bag and brings them to the golf course. I see women coming by bicycle with carriers on the back. And I also hear a lot of women saying to me that this is their only social outing. A lot of them are seniors and they rely on these leagues. They live close by, some of them carpool, they rely on these courses to play this game. This is their social outing and it gets them outside. These are not high-end people that have opportunities to play anywhere else. They just happen to love this game. And that's why our group has, has introduced even more affordability measures to make this game even more accessible, whether it be a donation and recycled club program. There's all kinds of things that can be done, more youth, uh, more visible minorities, groups that are in the area. I've had conversations with people from TCH that are interested in the surrounding areas. So contrary to what that image might be, that golf is an exclusive game, I think it's quite the opposite when it comes to public golf. And that's the role that these courses should play. And you know, you have no issue with the disc golf on the shoulder seasons or trails, something that many of us have advocated for many years to be using all these spaces in the off season? No, we absolutely support complementary use and, and we put that in our suggestions to the mm -hmm. review team. Complementary uses I think are critical in us for everybody to enjoy these spaces even more thoroughly, but we do not support a reduction of golf or impeding golf with other, with repurposing. And unfortunately yeah. there, there are groups that want that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Council Bradford. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for the deputation, Lucy. I'll just pick up on some of Councilor uh, Fletcher's questions there. Um, it sounds like these courses, city courses, provide a level of affordability and accessibility proximity to a lot of different communities. In the case of D'Antonio, of course, located on a subway line. Um, I think it'd be hard pressed to find another course in Canada that's located on a subway line. But if we do start to uh, reduce the capacity of our golf courses, if we do start to close golf courses, would that not make it more difficult for people to access this level of affordability and proximity to golf? Would that not further push people outside of the city? Would that not reinforce this sort of stereotype that is very popular on Twitter and, and places like that, that this is a elite game? Would that not be the outcome of those types of decisions? Thank you, uh, Councillor Bradford. I think that is exactly what the outcome would be. I have talked to many, many, many golfers throughout the summer in all the parking lots, and they all said the exact same thing. They said, the more we reduce public golf offering, the more we push this game into being elitist. And there's absolutely no reason for it to be elitist. This should be a game that in include all sectors of the population. There's a lot of us that love this game for many reasons. A lot of people, so in order to keep it accessible, we need Dentonia, especially to stay at 18, 18 holes. It's not viable at nine. And we're just gonna push people to get into cars and go to other regions outside of Toronto that do support municipal golf. So or we that's, like, that's or not we the just answer. Take it off the take it off the table for folks who don't have access to a car or they're not able to put their clubs on the back of their bike and ride to a golf course uh, and, and then they're just not doing it at all. 100%. I've had so many people tell me they will never play this game again if these courses are reduced or, or repurposed. So it sounds like the, the constituency and the stakeholders and the user groups at a place like D'Antonia is a lot different than sort of you know, perhaps the public narrative uh, for some folks on, on who golfers are, particularly at city courses. But I want to pick up on some of the other uh, things that we're hearing uh, that the report identifies. Access to green space, uh, opportunities for more park space. You're very familiar with D'Antonia. Um, our letter calls for recommendations to actually enhance and improve those connections. Would there be opportunities to enhance and improve those connections with the ravine, with the green space, with the parks, while maintaining the, the golf facility on the course there? I'm not an expert on, not a geographer or a planner, but my understanding is that yes, there is an opportunity to expand towards say Taylor Creek or on the other side towards Pharmacy Avenue. And we welcome these opportunities. Uh, I don't, I've never seen public golf courses as being this little enclave, sort of like excluded from communities. I, I strongly am opposed to that. I see them as mm -hmm. a community space. And if we need to connect to trails and, and welcome people in, I think that's great. In fact, it might actually spur more curiosity about golf too. Let's find a way to do both. Those are all my questions. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions for the deputy attend? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you, Lucy. Um, and, and I will say thank you for letting me know about the club donation program. Um, maybe you can send me your contact info. I can share that with people that sometimes ask um, what they can do with them. Um, Elizabeth Smitko is the next, yes, the clerk is flagging me, yes? Uh, Madam Chair, I've just been advised that uh, Elizabeth Smitko is not, not currently on the line. Uh, you okay. can move on to uh, Mr. Richard Fink. Okay, uh, Richard Fink. Hi, can can I be heard? I can hear you. You have three minutes. Good. Thank you. Thanks. So I've been uh, golfing at municipal golf courses for about 20 years. In terms of the uh, people who uh, use the course, the uh, council's invited to go to a parking lot at Humber or Tam O'Shanner and take a look at the cars uh, and compare those cars uh, to what looks like at Oakdale at a private course. Uh, the people I play with at those courses are working people, retired working people. They are a long way uh, from the elite. The problem for me is that I'm 71 years old. And occasionally we will go out to a course near Newmarket or Barrie to play golf. 
And the problem is travel time. It takes 40, 50 minutes to get there. And when you're coming back during rush hour, it can take well over an hour. At 71 years old, I have two problems. One is it's hard to play golf for four hours, four and a half hours, and then travel for an additional two hours. I just don't have the energy for it. The second problem is that I don't have the money to pay to play at Oakdale or Weston, which are two courses near municipal courses where the cost of joining the course is $60,000 a person. I play with my spouse, it would be 120,000 to join, it would be 15,000 a year membership. I only play twice a week, I'm still practicing law. It would come out to costing me about three or $400 for each round. I just don't have the money for that. I think the best thing to do is where, such as at Don Valley, some pedestrians want to walk through the course to access further parkland, put up a net to stop the balls from hitting them. At other parts of the course, have it open during the off season to allow people to use it as they used it during COVID and before the golfing season occurs. But I can say, at 71 years old, I can't play tennis anymore. I can't play baseball. I wish I could play both those games, which I played before golf. I need recreational physical activity other than just walking in the Nordheimer Ravine, which is close to where I live. I'm hoping that city council will preserve Toronto's municipal golf courses. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you again, Richard. That brings us to our next speaker, Craig Lowry with uh, Golf Ontario. Yes. And thank you, and sorry, hopefully I pronounced your name properly. You have three That's minutes. Okay. That's okay, Jennifer, thank you. Yeah, I'm the Director of Golf Services for Golf Ontario. And just so everyone on this call knows, Golf Ontario is responsible for growing participation in the game in this province. I learned the game on the City of Toronto golf courses as a youngster. And my experiences from these courses transformed and shaped me as a person, and I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to just say thank you for that. I'd like to talk about what these courses mean to the public and golf in general. They are affordable and accessible for everyone. They are welcoming, they're diverse and inclusive and serve the communities they're in very well, of which most are in high priority neighborhoods. These aren't country clubs, as has been said. These are courses for anyone and everyone. Golf provides mental, social, and physical benefits that can't be rivaled by any other sport. Golf is the largest participation sport in the country, and for the last two years, if it taught us anything, golf was providing the largest outlet for Torontonians and Canadians alike. Just look at the participation numbers in your report with a 92% plus utilization and nearly 200,000 rounds of golf. That's incredible. These courses are a critical entry point, <clears throat> excuse me, to the game of golf for so many, which provides such a great opportunity. I'd like to say that we're in agreement with the suggestion in the report in Appendix 1 that the city should explore more properties and opportunities to provide more golf opportunities, um, whether they be practice facilities, putting greens, driving ranges. We agree that the recommendation in the report to focus on programming with Golf Ontario and Golf Canada, but we are not in agreement with the reduction of holes there's a shortage of accessible public golf within the city of Toronto already. We respectfully request that a long term strategy, uh, a long term strategic plan be created for golf by the city of Toronto. The vision, even in this report, isn't quite clear. Other world class cities do have strategic plans around their municipal golf offering. We also request that you establish a golf steering committee. For example, you have the Exhibition Place Ontario Place Steering Committee and golf should have the same. In closing, Golf Ontario and Golf Canada cannot grow the game if these facilities contract. Golf needs to be more diverse and these facilities are located and provide the perfect opportunity for that. Please don't take the opportunity away from your constituents. The people you close the door to on just might be the next city leader or golf leader, like a Golf Canada CEO, the PGA of Canada CEO, or maybe even turn out to be a world famous golf writer or broadcaster. By the way, all of those just mentioned by title all grew up playing these five courses, clearly shaping and impacting their lives.
that's what these facilities do. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Councillor Fletcher. Yes, um, I may have this wrong. I may not be able to be heard. I may have this wrong, but uh, I understood that your organization is in favor of uh, cutting Dentonia to nine holes. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Oh, that's not correct. That, yeah. Are you Golf Ontario? Yes, we are. And this would be Golf Canada that was in favor of that, or am I wrong? I can't speak for Golf Canada, but I think there is someone on the deputation that might. Oh, I see. You have you read the report? I have read the report and all appendices. Yes. Uh, so I do believe there is an association that was in in, in favor of that. Um, your support is very much appreciated. You are aware that the city actually owns seven golf courses in the city, correct? I am aware of that. Yes, the additional two facilities, Royal Woodbine and Centennial, are both fully leased out. And would those be along the same model as a community based affordable model, or they're more like a, what we'll call a traditional country club golf course? Well, I think because they're privately leased out, they control the green fees. So they're not quite as affordable as the city five that you have under your operation. So they're not an affordable option. Uh, and are you surprised that that's not in this report plans for those two courses? A little bit. Yes. Paula, and the reason for that is because you do own those properties. Um, and if you're looking at an overall long uh, range uh, plan, I would think that you would start to consider that, you know, for, for me, me and, you know, Golf Ontario, you know, what, what does golf look like 5, 10, 20 years from now in the city of Toronto? And, you know, that's what I think is lacking from this report. So this report, or you're clearly establishing in everybody's mind, and I appreciate that, that the current five courses that we own and uh, have operators for and do the, the the golf operations, but the city does the other landscape, et cetera, operations, maintenance and operations, that that model is an affordable model. There's no barriers of any kind to participating. And you did hear the deputant before you, who just said, it's the only thing I can do. Don't take it away. I can't afford to travel and I can't afford to play in these other uh, high tone courses. Yes, so, I would agree with that counselor Fletcher. Yes, thank you. And um, thank you. Appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, any additional questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, so I don't think we have time for an additional deputant, okay. so we'll um, uh, reconvene at 1.30. Okay, see you then. Madam Chair, you, uh, we are ready to stream live. In fact, we're live now. You can uh, begin the meeting anytime you'd like. Okay, thank you. Uh, the clerk has confirmed we have quorum, so we'll go back to deputations on item 
IE 27.6 Review of City of Toronto Golf Courses. Our next speaker is Scott Mayo. Scott, do we have you online? Maybe IT can confirm firm if we have Scott. I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time for me today and everybody else. Uh, I just like to say I got back into the game, rediscovered the game during when the pandemic hit. And thankfully I did because it's really helped out my mental health, my sobriety. Uh, I live in affordable housing and I take TTC. All I can afford is city golf courses, and I try to use all of them as much as I can. Uh, Detonia Park is a great place to go uh, for people who are just getting into the game or rediscovering it like myself. The 18 holes, I would not cut it back at all whatsoever. We have over 1,500 parks in the city that are underutilized, and we need to start looking at them and what we could do there to get more people involved. I live near Humber Valley Golf Course, Okay, so it is a bit of a trek for me to get out to the East End for those, uh, say, Tamil Shatner or Detonia Park, but I'll do it because this game has done so much for me. It wasn't there. City golf courses was not there. I don't know where I am today. The pandemic raised more people back into the game, and you're going to start seeing more people even after this pandemic get back in the game because we got 13 Canadians collectively on the PGA Tour and the LPGA Tour. And also back in about 95, 96, a gentleman by the name of Tiger Woods hit the scene and golf exploded. Well, now he has a son, Charlie Woods. It's going to explode again when he comes onto the scene. We need to invest more into the golf. Um, I would also like to see the city maybe look into the food and beverage part of it and maybe take it over and give jobs to the youth out there. that are trying to get themselves ready for uh, college or university and they're going to have a summer job. Uh, type of thing instead of contracting it out. Maybe something could be done there. Um, that's about it. What I have just this report I'm not in favor of. We need to relook at everything. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for your deputation. Um, questions of the deputant? So just I have a brief question. I just you said you're not in favor of the report. So I just could you maybe specifically say what it is? Like, so you're in favor of keeping golf, right? Yes, I'm in favor of keeping golf. It's um, let's not slash to Tonya Park. And um, I know the city contracts out the food and beverage at the city courses. I think the city should be looking at that. I think there's a lot of money to be made for the city and we can give jobs to the youth out there in the summer. Keep okay. our youth active and, and they'll discover the game as well. Okay, great. I just wanted to clarify your supportive of golf and in, in yes. the the public spaces. Okay, thank you. Any questions of the deputant? Okay, thank you for coming forward and uh, your heartfelt deputation. That brings us to our next deputant, uh, Beverly McCarthy. Me? Hi, Beverly, thank you Hi. for joining us. You have three minutes. Thank you. I'm very concerned about the upcoming vote to change the city owned golf courses in Toronto to mixed uses. I understand the support. I understand and support the need for public spaces for all, and I also strongly support food growing opportunities within the city. If the only green spaces available in Toronto were the golf courses, then I would be the first to want to see them all closed and repurposed. One of the groups leading the change to repurpose the city owned golf courses is Progress Toronto, a group that I've actually volunteered for. I do support a more democratic and just city for all. Having said that, and with respect to the motion to repurpose the course courses. I want to point out that there is already available green spaces near many of these golf courses. Perhaps council should be considered should consider converting some of these other green spaces for growing food, as has already been done successfully in many parts of the city. The one course in particular I wish to highlight is Dentonia, because that is where I play and that is where my league is. It's important to note that the areas around Dentonia Golf is actually blessed with an abundance of green space that is the envy of many other parts of the city. Taylor Creek, for example, has 182 acres of green space. And just to the east, you have Warden Woods and Prairie Drive, which is 36, 36 hectares. Again, there's a lot of green space available to be repurposed. 
One important point to consider when making your decision is that not all golf courses are created equal. Some are ideal for experienced golfers, while others are more suited for weekend golfers, new golfers, and female golfers. D'Antonio Park, for example, is unique by being a course that is welcoming and accessible to women. It's a smaller course, and since many women do not feel comfortable playing on the larger courses, we choose to play D'Antonio because of its size and its accessibility. Did you know that D'Antonio Park Golf Course organizes the city's largest women's league? By removing 18 holes of golf at D'Antonio, you are dissolving this popular and unique league which is especially important community activity for so many women, especially during COVID. Even keeping nine holes at D'Antonia would effectively destroy the course as few people would travel by transit to play golf for one hour. Nine holes is not an option and is de facto closing the course, let's be honest. Another point to consider is cost. Playing at D'Antonia is on average $20 less per round when compared to other city owned courses. As I'm sure you're aware, women have historically faced wage discrepancies. Glo closing D'Antoni in reality means limiting or preventing women from actively participating in golf, a sport many love. We need sports facilities for all, ones that are open and accessible to everyone across all ages and genders. This course is also the only one located right beside the TTC stop. Not everyone in the city has access to a car, and this course is used um, by many players arriving by transit. Hardly the elitist sport is portrayed by many. In closing, what bothers me is how women have faced so many advantages, but our, our participation in sports is seen as disposable. And now it looks as if D'Antonia Golf and my women's league is in danger of dissolving. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputy? Um, I just have one quick question. So I don't golf and part of it is I'm scared to, I would be scared to start because I don't want to be holding up the people behind me and being that exactly. slow, pers per, slow person on the course. So um, are courses like D'Antonia maybe a little more friendly to that to beginners than, than say, you know, some of the, the, the more, uh, you know, the country clubs, for example, that people might use? That's exactly what D'Antonia is positioned for. I, I, I play every Monday with two women. One's retired and the other one's close to retirement. They're slower golfers. and. It's, it's just a, it's slower there and it's expected slower. There's a lot of young kids that play too. There's like junior leagues there. New golfers start out there. If somebody is going to golf and I have friends that have taken up golf because of COVID, I always say, go to D'Antonia. That's where you start off. I'm actually an experienced golfer and I can play in bigger courses. I love D'Antonia. It's probably one of my favorite courses, even though it's, it's so, it's very small it's still a, a great course to play. So yes, if you're a new golfer, that's the course you go to in the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, any additional questions of deputant? Okay, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, our, our next speaker is Ryan Logan with Golf Canada. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Ryan uh, had contacted the clerk's office just after lunch and said that he had uh, a medical appointment and planned to return. If it's possible to uh, skip him and return to him later in the list, that would, uh, okay. that's what Ryan had asked for. Great. I'll, I'll call people we missed uh, later as well. Okay. Uh, Diana Yoon with the Toronto Environmental Alliance is next. Diana? Environment Committee. So my name is Diana Yoon and I'm a climate specialist with Toronto Environmental Alliance. As the pandemic continues to impact our communities, it's critical to rethink how city owned and public spaces can best benefit people and the environment. When the operating leases for city golf courses came up for renewal, we advocated for a public consultation process with meaningful community engagement to determine how these 150 hectares of parkland could best serve the public good. So moving forward, we feel the renewed Detonia Park has great potential to further meaningfully involve neighborhood members in shaping the park to better serve local priorities. And we support the recommendation to initiate this master planning process as soon as possible and would like to request a timeline from staff for this process. We do have some concerns. The direction proposed in the report to action, an improved status quo model, does not sufficiently respond to what communities ask for in terms of complementary and alternative uses. 
So first, we strongly support recommendations to pursue Indigenous placekeeping from the operational review and alternative complementary use reports, and those don't uh, predominantly appear in the staff recommendations at IEC today. Um, these is feedback that came from cities, Indigenous leaders and communities, focus groups, consultations at the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee meeting. So that needs to be addressed. Secondly, stronger measures are needed to ensure equitable access and fairness. Uh, the pandemic's highlighted realities of social inequities regarding access to green space, and that access to green space is critical, especially for low-income racialized communities, such as those who live in the surrounding neighborhoods of some of the parklands. You know, we want the city to listen to local community members, especially those from equity-deserving groups, to understand what their priorities are in developing these proposals. Um, you know, the request for golf programming focused on equity deserving groups? Is that coming from communities or just justification for the status quo? So we want stronger data and there's some of this data in the report. The majority of course users reported middle to high incomes and over half the users reported traveling to these courses from over three kilometers away. Um, and then, you know, the local priorities need to, from the consultations need to be better integrated, such as a need for food security and urban agriculture. Um, finally, we request that the city outline how a climate lens will be applied at these parklands. This is an immense opportunity to use the parkland to advance and accelerate net zero strategy goals and actions and to build resilience to extreme weather. Um, and the climate lens could be part of the procurement process as well. You know, there needs to be better accountability for the environmental impact of these golf courses. You know, 80% of the survey respondents indicated that golf courses should provide uh, prioritize environmental stewardship in advancing the city's climate goals. But unfortunately, we're not seeing any details or directions on how the city plans to do so on these lands. Um, but that's an opportunity to address this moving forward. And we look forward to working with you to um, move that forward. So thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you. Questions of the Deputy and Councillor Carroll? Yes, uh, hi, and thank you uh, for your deputation. Um, I'm looking now at the the, uh, the 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 report that was commissioned. The the Ernst and Young report um, analyzes some of the alternate use, both potential and what's going on there now. Were you surprised that there there are already some minor alternate uses going on? No, I, I've used some of the alternate uses. I've been part oh. of the winter loops um, at Don Valley. So, I, you know, I've done that. I, I think it's, you know, we're supportive of more alternate uses. We're supportive of, but mostly, you know, we're really looking to listen to the local and surrounding neighborhood communities on what they'd like to see prioritized in these spaces. And we also do recognize that um, in the reports, it does say these alternate uses are not well known. So, you know, we support recommendations yeah. to uh, further awareness of those um, offerings. Oh, okay. So, so it's really, just to clarify, there, there's a mixture of, of support and asking us to go further in terms of, of how your organization feels about the report, because the report does recommend working with the community to maximize alternative uses to enhance them and and to look at there's a, a great analysis of, of of the trail connectivity. If we can, we can improve some of those things and we can we can enhance some of those alternate uses, but maintain the golf facilities. Um, is is that to, is that uh, the best of both worlds in your view? It's um, not our position to comment on necessarily the the golf offering on these sites. We're really looking to um, you know emphasize that people need better equitable fair access to green space, especially from the neighboring communities, and that you know we feel like some of the staff recommendations and some of the recommendations in the EY report um, are you know, encouraging that uh, having more of this park space, the city owned land would uh, benefit local communities. And lastly, uh, just one last question, because you didn't mention, does your, your organization get involved when there are applications for urban ag agriculture and, and environmental initiatives on, um, on, on other parklands? We uh, we support kind of the allies we work with, with uh, food share and other kind of urban agriculture uh, organizations in the city. And we are not directly necessarily involved in those uh, applications on different uh, sites. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for your deputation. No problem.
Okay. Uh, any que additional questions, Ms. Jebijan? Okay. Seeing none, that brings us to our next uh, ML Boychuk. So, Emil, there's a problem with your sound. Maybe we can get IT to help you. We still can't hear and we'll maybe we'll move to the next debut and let IT get contact them. Okay, so while we're trying to connect Emil, the next speaker is uh, Sheila Barr. Do we have Sheila on the line? Madam Chair, I don't see that Sheila is not is connected. Uh, Sheila is not okay. connected at this time. Our next speaker is John Campbell with Save Toronto Golf Courses. Hi, friends. Um, nice to see you. Thank you all for um, for attending and listening to all of the golf advocates, of which I am one. Uh, I first played Humber Valley probably um, back in 1970 when I took the TTC up to uh, Humber Valley and did a transfer and played for about $2.50. And I remain a, a big fan of the city courses. Um, these courses, I, I, I don't need to tell you what you're going to hear from the other deputants, that they're played by people of all walks of life, modest incomes, and that they promote friendship, fun, and exercise. Um, what, what struck me in the report was the lack, of, I, although there are many great things in the report, what struck me was the lack of numbers in the report. So they talk about a potential master planning exercise for Dentonia, and there's no estimates. And for a city with uh, a sizable backlog uh, in state of good repair of over 750 million, I found that uh, somewhat striking. Um, they also, it's been pointed out in the Ernst & Young report how the usage at Dentonia was up to over 90%. And so it baffles me that um, consideration would be given to reducing a course that's widely used and widely popular. Uh, all of these courses are tremendously difficult to get on. Um, they're, they're booked almost as soon as the booking window opens up. And they're just wonderful opportunities for people of all ages. And as a, as a proud member of the Board of Toronto Community Housing, if there is some outreach that I would um, you know, be very happy to see, it would be the city engage, making more engagement with youth in those communities and all high, um, high priority neighborhoods to get more kids playing the game. Um, that's about it. You're going to hear from many more uh, deputants. Um, I would uh, encourage you to ask some questions of staff just about how much this master plan is going to cost and where the money's going to come from with such a sizable backlog. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Are there questions of deputant? Um, Councilor Rank. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks very much, and and thanks, Mr. Campbell, for joining us today. Um, great to hear from you. Your point, I just wanted to pick up on being a board member of Toronto Community Housing. There, has there been a historic effort to reach out and engage engage with TCH community on recreation activities, specifically uh, golf activities in proximity to some of the buildings, or is that work that, uh, that we could do in the future? I, 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 not to my knowledge, some of the councillors that have been around longer, I've only been on TCHC for, for just over, for about three years now, but I think it would be a very worthwhile venture and I'd be happy to, you know, to work, to make that happen. I just think, you know, golf does not have to be an expensive game. I, now that I'm over uh, a, a particular age can play at Scarlet Woods for $28. Um, if we have, with the welcome policy, um, we could get all kinds of kids playing. Golf clubs do not need to be expensive. Uh, secondhand golf clubs can be could be donated at these golf courses and could be made readily available to a whole range of kids. 
Would it be possible to, uh, you know, do, do we have rental programs at some of these courses where there's rental clubs that are available? There are rental clubs available, but there aren't free clubs available. And there's no reason why free golf clubs couldn't be made available for youth um, who, you know, don't have the means to pay for them. So just as a, a hypothetical, if there was a scenario or something like Tuesday nights from like 5 to 8 p.m. or something, local folks from the community can come try golf. There's golfs there. Uh, there. There's clubs there that are available for people to pick up and swing. Maybe there's a city instructor or something like that. Is that a type of scenario that we could build out uh, to improve some of the engagement with local community and introduce folks to the sport? I think that's a, an awesome idea and all it takes is the wherewithal to make something like that happen and, and, and a concerted effort. And, you know, I, I'm sure there are lots of golfers in Toronto that have extra sets of clubs sitting around their garages that they don't have the heart to throw out, but they love to see put to good use. Oh, good point. Well, thanks for the deputation. Thanks for being here. Sorry, uh, Councillor Pasternak, go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. And, John, it's I can't see you, but it's great to hear from you. Uh, well, you all look great, well. there, James. Well, <laughs> I know I'm in trouble when people say you look good. Uh, so I, I'm just comparing um, some other forms of recreational and entertainment um, options: live theater, uh, professional sporting events, skiing, hockey, uh, to golf. And and it, no matter how I kind of move the figures around, golf seems to be. Uh, the least expensive recreational or entertainment sport uh, available to the residents of Toronto. I mean, live theater, um, Raptors, Leaf games, uh, even if you're participating in hockey to get a kid on the ice as a father of four, believe me, I know it. Uh, what are your thoughts about the value proposition and the accessibility of golf? Well, I think, listen, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't want to compare it to going to a Leaf game or a Raptors game because I don't even buy those tickets, right? And I, you know, I live in a nice neighborhood, but I'm not going to spend that money. Most of those are corporate tickets. But, it, you know, if you spend 60 or $70 to get out on a golf course, um, you know, you're getting great value for four and a half hours. And you're enjoying, you know, you're enjoying some of the most beautiful parts of Toronto. I mean, Don Valley is a gorgeous course and a gorgeous in a gorgeous part of the city. As, as is uh, Humber Valley and, and all of these other courses, Scarlet Woods and so on. I mean, this is, these are beautiful places to be. Um, the courses are generally well-maintained and they represent exceptional value. And that's why I think you see so many seniors going out during the day. All of those, um, all of those users during uh, midday, those aren't generally people that are working nine to five. Those are a lot of seniors out that have the time to get out and, and uh, enjoy that kind of recreation. Thank you for that. Uh, the other thing I realized when I when I started out uh, playing golf and I <laughs> I get dragged out to a course once every couple of years. I'm really not uh, uh, an, uh, a regular golfer. I remember I didn't have I didn't have golf clubs, so we all played out of the same bag. And and then I'm, I'm th sitting here thinking it's one of the only sports you can participate in where you can't share a tennis racket, you can't share a hockey stick. Um, you know, you you can't share a lacrosse racket, but you know you can play out of the same golf bag. You can have two or three people sharing the clubs as you play. Um, and once again, this strikes me as as a, a source of accessibility. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't I disagree with that. And and there's times when I certainly wish I had somebody else's driver other than my own. Um, but uh, I think I think the main point that I want to make is that there's a real opportunity to expand usage to uh, kids in high priority neighborhoods and, and to continue to make it available to, you know, a whole raft of seniors who really rely on this for friendship and recreation. And I think, I mean, really now is not the time to look at reducing the number of holes. It's a time to look at just making golf better in Toronto. And, you know, uh, listen, there, there's a lot more deputants. I don't want to, uh, you know, take any more time. I think you you understand my point, and that is that um, uh, it, it's just not the right time. It's a great sport. Um, I, I think the cost of of changing Dentonia certainly um, would would you would not see the benefit out of out of making those changes. And and there's a huge backlog of state of good repair that Parks Forestry and Recreation already has to deal with. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions for the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you for joining us today.
That brings us to our next uh, speaker, Brenda French. Do we have Brenda on the line? Uh, Madam Chair, we believe that Brenda French has, uh, has left the call. Okay, um, Michael Kulchi, Kulchik. Do we have Michael on the line? Informal prepared. Uh, I would rather much directly speak from the heart on how close municipal golf and what it means to me. Um, I'm, I am a first generation immigrant golfer. I am a very junior member of Lucy's group by one by one cold call during the summer to Scarlet Woods. Uh, I I took the 24 bus TTC 24 bus down many times Victoria Park from Finch as a youth and I participated in the uh, youth membership program. My grandfather taught me how to golf at D'Antonia, my dad, my five uncles, and now I'm teaching my two nephews uh, and future and hopefully a future generation of my own family to golf there. I am a Muni Tour player. What that means is I actually play on all five of your courses on an annual basis, plus the two in Mississauga, which are advertised through golf now that increases revenue. I am like you are going to realize a two million dollar profit from the from those five courses in 2021 and, and in 2020 alone. If anything, I think this, the city should really be looking at increasing their municipal golf offerings instead of limiting them. The golf offerings have not kept pace in other world, like other world class cities uh, with the rise in the demographic population. I've recently played at Centennial. I really never knew that Royal Woodbine was actually leased out by the city of Toronto. So I did have the opportunity to golf there multiple times this past summer. I am a provincial bureaucrat. This is what I can afford on my current salary and my future pension. When we turn on the, you know, the 2022 uh, Canadian Open being held in Etobicoke this summer, we don't t tune in to 12, 12 holes of golf. We don't tune in to nine holes of golf. We tune into the dogfight of 18 holes, the, the, the way that golf is meant to be strategic, strategically played. Now, one of the things I want to raise is that this re review process contains one major and significant fundamental flaw. The Ernest and Young report, as indicated first by C CTV News on January 9th, 2018, that the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Department was not, was not part of the public consultation review at all five city courses. It was never offered for further dissem dissemination and subsequent FOI requests that have been since rejected. So my first FOI request was 2021-01514, and that was held by Zoe DeSantis. I then had to escalate that to the Information Privacy Commissioner under appeal number MA-21-00565, and the person that was handling that was Alicia Turney Foss. So I really never got to see what was actually in the Ernest and Young report. Therefore, I think in good conscience, you can't allow this report to reach the council floor in February, because without a further public consultation on the Ernest and Young findings, I think that a public review of the two public uh, leased courses should also be included as part of this report in order to gain a more fulsome picture of the golf that's being offered and to the public within the Toronto boundary lines. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you for joining uh, us. Yes, Madam Chair, I wonder if I could ask the, the deputant a question? Yes, for sure. Sorry, you popped off the boxes on my screen. I see you now, though. Go oh, ahead. Sorry, yes. Um, uh, thank you for your deputation. Um, uh, I was concerned about that as well. What, what we have before us in some of the analysis, what we just have is the executive summary. Um, and we see industry and market analysis but but when it when it goes into detail in that section of the summary, it, most of the conversation with other industry providers is about um, a possible bid, uh, how they might uh, how they might proceed to to bid on on Dantonia and and what process we should follow there. There isn't a lot of look at the future of golf, and I I'm asking you this question because if you've been to all of our the golf courses, but it sounds like you 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 do uh, you're you're sort of a, a traveling golfer uh, trying out a number of facilities. There's no mention in here of the trends in golf. If we were going to do a learn to play at Dentonia, for instance, there's a real trend in the industry 
towards 12 hole learn to play golf parks where kids are allowed. And in fact, even, you know, a dog walking trail is, is surrounding and the dogs are allowed uh, on the paths during uh, uh, golf play. Uh, the owners are uh, um, amenable to keeping them on leash. There's uh, all those sorts of things are possible. And yet there's no mention of it in here. Were you surprised at that? I was surprised at that specifically, considering there's no short of nine uh, parks that actually surround the Dentonia Golf Course area where you can actually host off-leash dog parks. It can be integrated with the current course structure, like Dentonia Park, Mar Maryland Park, Warden Woods, Prairie Drive Park, which actually contains a community gardens in, in Ward 35 Scarborough Southwest. Uh, Taylor Creek Park, Denora Park, Cataraque. I can I can just keep keep on going on and on. But these are excellent opportunities to integrate with the existing infrastructure. At Scarlet Woods, you have a significant park park system. At Don Valley, again, there's a significant park system that's around there. I I've seen it through uh, Earl Bales Park. Uh, at and, and I'm just speaking from 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 mindset here of like Tam O'Shanner, again, surrounded by significant splash pads and significant, you know, city investment that's already pre-existing and all the soccer fields that are adjacent there at Stephen, I think it's Stephen Leacock uh, High School. Yes. Yeah, uh, on Birchmount. So I think there's a lot of great opportunities to integrate into the current parks infrastructure of 1800 parks that you, that you currently have that are all being underutilized and you don't necessarily need to touch one of the significant golf courses that plays a, a major role in, in the city right now. Thank you. Thanks for your deputation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for Michael? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next presenter is Jennifer Allen. Um, my name is Jennifer Allen, and I'm here to speak about the difference having an access to an affordable golf facility has made to me in a very difficult time in my life. Dentonia Park City Golf Course is conveniently located at Victoria Park in Danforth. As outlined in the report, this course is unique. It is the most affordable option for golfers in the GTA. It is an 18-hole par-3 course where only a few clubs are needed to play, making it more affordable. It is very easily accessed by TTC at the Victoria Park subway station. In addition, there is a welcoming ladies' league, which I belong to, which allows a safe space for women from diverse backgrounds to play with their, within their schedules as their schedule permits. This walkable course encourages fitness, community, and social relationships. As a single working mother, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to learn to golf at this course. The relatively low golf fees were affordable and I only needed a few secondhand golf clubs. It was accessible by TTC and I could play after work. I met many women, built my confidence and self-esteem in a new sport. Susan Denton Massey donated this property to support recreation in the East End of Toronto. It is a treasure and has allowed many people to play 18 holes of golf who could never afford expensive private courses. I don't agree with the proposal to reduce the course to nine holes. I know the city must improve access for all to our beautiful ravine parkland spaces and will have difficult decisions to make. But as others have said, this should be available and be able to be achieved without reducing the Dentonia golf 18 hole course. This course is unique and should be protected to allow opportunities for youth single moms, low income seniors and marginalized people to develop and practice their skills and be physically active in a safe outdoor space in our city. I have continued to appreciate the accessibility of this 18 hole course during the pandemic. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputy? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Jennifer. That brings us to our next presenter, Marcus De Domenico from the Toronto Catholic School Board. Uh, Madam Chair, we believe that Marcus Domenico has not connected to the meeting and is not present. Okay, uh, that takes us then to the next presenter, Ellen Stortzel with Toronto Field Naturalists. golf courses. 
Unfortunately, though the public showed a strong desire for change in last summer's golf consultation, the plan before you now is very much a status quo approach, more of the same tired old thinking. Toronto field naturalists have been calling for transforming the city's golf courses for a number of years as part of a broader coalition. Last summer, the top takeaway from the city's online survey about golf courses with over 6,000 respondents was that people want to see three things, improved trail access and connectivity, tree planting and natural area restoration. Your own survey people found that these three opportunities unanimously resonated for both golfer and non-golfer groups, as well as other user segments. So why is the Parks Department now ignoring those greening opportunities? Why does Parks not set any firm trackable targets to restore publicly accessible nature to its golf courses? Even before the pandemic, Torontonians were pressed for green space. With our rapidly growing population, many of us, roughly 40%, live in tall buildings or apartments and rely on parks for fresh air and nature. And here's a warning that council got from the city's own parks department in the 2019 budget. And they said, maintaining parkland provision across the city is becoming increasingly difficult in the face of high growth, decreasing availability and increasing cost of land acquisition. So as a public health measure, we need to ensure that city people have easy access to nature on a daily basis. And, um, so, you know, really, um, you know, it clearly nature is not a frill for a for 21st century city. We, we should see nature as a terrific preventative measure to prevent disease and, and in contrast, golfing as a participation sport has seen a long decline in the GTA and across North America. You've, there, you've seen a blip upwards during the pandemic, but that's a blip. You look at the long-term numbers and you'll see the trend is down. Most of Toronto's golf courses were created in the late 1950s or 60s when golf was king. And so for the last 60 years, those publicly owned valley lands have been off limits to everyone except golfers. Worse still, right now, three golf courses block public ravine access, and that's Don Valley, Dentonia, and Tam O'Shanter. That might have seemed okay in the 1950s, but it's not okay now. The proposal before you disregards both the pressures for public access to green space and the long-term decline in golfers. And the proposal also brushes aside the city's own biodiversity and st uh, strategy and the ravine strategy. So Toronto Field Naturalists urge your committee to send this very flawed proposal back to staff for a rework and ask for firm measurable targets and deadlines for naturalizing and restoring floodplain areas to support wetlands and, and habitat on all the golf courses. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, seeing no questions, that brings us to our next deputant, uh, Loretta Muramua. Do we have Loretta on the line? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you. Okay. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, first time listener, first time caller. Uh, from the report, it's apparent that stakeholder consultation was very thorough. Over 6,000 responded to the survey. Environmental stewardship, expanding complementary programming, and an improved booking and payment system topped the feedback charts. I'm sure that the expansion of summer camps, first tee programming, club and bag availability, and application of the city's welcome policy to memberships and green fees will ensure that youth accessibility and subsequent growth of the sport. The points I'd like to make today relate to accessibility and affordability for seniors and women, Dentonia Park and parking lot use. Although perceived otherwise, many seniors who golf at city courses are on a fixed income. And with the historic gender wage gap of 29%, female seniors have even less to expend on their recreation despite the fact that we live longer. The private Flemington Park golf course in the Don Mills area charges $45 for a nine hole game during the week. This compares unfavorably to the senior rates for 18 holes at our city courses. Don Valley 42, Humber and Tamashanner 37, Scarlet Woods 28 and $21 at Dentonia. So while I'm happy that the report excludes demolition of the five courses, 
Affordable green fees for seniors should be a priority in any future development. As you've heard before from other respondents, Dentonia Park is the most accessible of the five city courses on public transit. The clubhouse is 100 steps from the exit of Victoria Park Station. This proximity to the TTC makes Dentonia ideal for a youth training center, but also for any golfer who may not drive or who wishes to avoid gridlock. It has been a welcoming home for the ladies league and seniors groups in the East End for decades. When I first started golf, when I was 65, I walked over from Dawes Road, but now that I live at Sherburne, I just take the subway. My last point is a suggestion in the sharing and alternative uses category. A farmer's market could be held on designated days in parking lots of the city golf courses or on a smaller scale in the snack bar area. Space-wise, the farmer's markets might only be suited to the courses with adjacent public parking availability. But with this plan, sellers would have a steady supply of captive shoppers, and it would be yet another way to involve the general public and possibly pique their interest in golf. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, um, seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next deputant is Rick Young with Golf Journalists Association of Canada. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Rick Young, President of the Golf Journalists Association of Canada. I'm an advocate for municipal golf globally, nationally, and I'm an advocate for it for it in the city of Toronto. I'd like to begin by refuting something that has lingered for far too long with the general public and possibly even with members of council who are part of these proceedings today. Golf is not a rich man's game. It never was. It's not an activity exclusive to affluent members of society, and it is not the domain of retired middle-aged white males. Stereotypes like these continue to hang over the game like a plague. Frankly, some of the blame for this elitist propaganda rightfully falls on the golf industry itself and even on a golf journalist like myself. Clear are two things. Golf has not done nearly a good enough job communicating the game's many positive attributes to non-golfers and to the general public alike. And it continues to spend far too much time talking to people who already play the game and not enough time focused on people who do not. Golf has been also too silent for too long in the face of elitist propaganda. We do not call out or hold individuals accountable who vocalize falsehoods about the game without ever having set foot on a golf course or even doing a moment's research. The truth is golf is a game of the people, all people. It's a diverse, equitable, and inclusive recreational pursuit for anyone of any ability or disability, age five to 95, who wants to partake in an activity with an array of health benefits, both mental and physical, and it's accessible. Currently, there are 2,298 golf courses in this country. Of that number, 2,068 of these facilities provide public access. That's roughly 93%. In terms of national participation, 84% of golfers in Canada are registered or count as public players. Obviously, the game is popular. Despite several weeks of provincial government ordered closure last year, City of Toronto's, City of Toronto's five municipal courses alone did 1, 195,164 rounds. Tea sheets were full, and I submit that with COVID-19 expected to be part of our lives for the foreseeable future, City of Toronto Municipal Courses will enjoy another busy season in 2022 and beyond with tea time inventory once again at a premium. For the record, I'm not here to tell anyone that the City of Toronto Golf Courses should be saved or contracted. The merits of these facilities already make that readily apparent, not only by user rates, but also by the green space they provide, the positive impact they have on the environment, and the role they have with charitable platforms and philanthropic causes. What I am here to do is to make a business case for the City of Toronto to invest in more municipal golf and invest in it significantly. That begins with fast tracking, long overdue, capital expenditure upgrades these neglected facilities desperately need. For too many years, the money these five courses have generated 
instead of being reinvested in the product and the overall experience, have been deferred to finance other non-golf-related parks and city projects. Hmm. How do I know this? History. Among politicians and parks departments across Canada, there has been an ingrained and pervasive belief that somehow golf pays for golf. This is possible, but only when golf is operated with proper allocation of monies generated that address the needs of the course assets first, with deferral allocation second. Robbing Peter to pay Paul is a poor model for any business. This is an operational miscue and why the City of Toronto now faces nearly $9 million of capital expenditure work to properly modernize its five facilities. To bring its municipal golf portfolio up to the kind of world-class standard the city has long prided itself on, Toronto needs more public golf. At least one more full-length municipal course, a practice area with a suitable range, short game area, and putting courses would go a long way towards that. This should not be considered pie-in-the-sky stuff. With all due respect, the city's municipal golf assets fall well short of many North American cities and markets. Chicago, for example, they own and operate six public courses, a driving range, a three-hole learning center with artificial greens and tees. City of Milwaukee, the Parks Department, operates 14 public golf facilities. The City of New York has 13 municipal courses and a number of ranges. And I'll ask you to wrap up. The City of Los Angeles is home to 20 municipal courses and 18 driving ranges. What the City of Toronto needs is a sound strategic long-range plan that focuses on upgrading and expanding the municipal golf model. What that requires is well-intentioned feedback and insight from both stakeholders and from City of Toronto consumers who frequent these courses. What it does not need is an urban planning firm conducting a facility review. The money spent on this report the past two, two years would have been far better served to execute previously mentioned capital upgrades. To be fair, I have nothing against baseball diamonds, soccer pitches, walking trails, arenas, or parks, but these recreational assets come with a major cost to taxpayers. Municipal courses are also quite often the first steps towards customers for life. Mike Weir and Brooke Henderson, two of Canada's greatest touring professionals, learn the game at public facilities in their hometowns. Last September, City of Toronto Municipal Course, Humber Valley hosted Canada's first All Abilities Championship. Humber also cut, kicked off RBC and Golf Canada's Community Junior Program. Also being, also with, along with being terrific stories, both of these initiatives are a showcase for the importance of municipal golf in Toronto. I thank you for your time today and for allowing me to speak. Uh, thank you for your deputation. Um, questions, Councillor Carroll? Uh, thank you. Hi, Rick. Um, Rick, we, we had a deputy just, just uh, uh, shortly before you talking about uh, the pandemic being a blip and, and golf is just going to continue to decline. To decline. Uh, in the hundreds of years history of golf now, is it more a matter of ups and downs and it's a matter of how you invest in the courses if you want to drive golf? It has been an up and down um, sport, Councillor Carroll, for, for many, many years, probably since uh, certainly in the past 120 years or so. Um, it certainly, it's moved along a little bit with the economy and, and, uh, and certain elements of it. But the one thing that the one thing that I can safely say is is it always comes back, and I think in this particular case, um, somebody mentioned a blip. Um, I don't think it was a blip. Um, these these courses were doing remarkable numbers, uh, solid numbers um, prior to COVID-19 and over the past few years. But one thing I would say is they have been neglected, and when you neglect your product people will move to a different product. And I think in that, this particular case, that's maybe what has gone on a little bit. Um, right. Which is why a reinvestment here would be uh, strongly considered. Right, so um, you, you sound like you were disappointed in the report we got, although we're, we're really just looking at the executive summary, but there, there isn't anything in there that talks about 
what investments are being made to drive more golf and 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 drive more profit at centers uh, it doesn't really talk to us about that um your writing actually led me to to do some web searching and and look at things like well even jack nicholas has designed a 12 hole uh golf park a learn to play facility that's child friendly two cup sizes on each hole that the kind of innovation that we could do in conjunction with the capital uh, uh, improvements that that need to be made, that are that are stated in this report as being part of a backlog that needs to happen over the next few years, is there a lack of imagination in thus far in terms of what could be done? I think there's possibly a lack of imagination, but there's also a, maybe a, a, a lack of um, consultation with uh, golf stakeholders from from within the. Uh, from within the industry, I, I know that's been addressed a little bit. I know that uh, the golf on uh, golf Canada and golf Ontario and the PGA of Canada have been have been involved um, and are getting involved with um, um, more with municipal golf and have been somewhat ingrained into the process of what's gone on here in the city of Toronto. Um, I would like to see that. Uh, I'm certainly not. Uh, I'm not in favor of a. Uh, of a reduction at uh, Dentonia, and again, I think as I as I said in my deputation, uh, what I am in, in uh, what I, what I am definitely uh, in favor of is uh, is an expansion of of golf because I think it would pay dividends for the city to engage in that. Thank you. Thanks for your deputation. I'm here, Madam Chair. Hey, okay. uh, additional questions. Thanks and actually, can we just ask is somebody working the timer? because it needs to reset on questions. Um, any additional questions? Yes, the thank deputy? you, Madam Chair. Councillor Fletcher here. Okay, thank you, go ahead. Well, thank you for coming today. Uh, well, you're not coming, you're probably at home. <laughs> People used to come down to talk to us. But um, in this whole discussion around what's gonna happen, I did learn that unlike arenas and uh, rinks and other places where people have leagues and pay, uh, it appears that golf, these five clubs or five golf courses um, are under an obligation to break even. Does that surprise you? Unlike any other city recreation facility. You're, I, I, I think what's being referred to again is this, um, this false notion that golf should pay for golf at the municipal level. Um, I, I think what you have is a as a sport that that offers the positive aspects from a financial uh, return aspect of being able to, uh, I guess, uh, of being able to, um, you know, to to allocate resources to other areas if the the current product um, it remains and infrastructure remains strong, and in this case, that's what uh, I referred to in my deputation. Suggesting that that you know nine million dollars um, could easily have been uh, utilized to prop up these courses and and uh, to modernize them over the years, but some of that or a good portion of that was was used for other measures. So a, a break even that you're you're speaking about um, certainly arenas uh, the arenas and and. Uh, Baseball diamonds and soccer pitches, um, they, they, they don't break even because they can't. And that's where that's a, golf, their purpose, a sport like it? golf comes in that, comes sorry, into, uh, not... to uh, play and support uh, some of these other recreational pursuits in the city of Toronto and oh, other cities around you. the country. You, so really golf should be, and these courses should be in the same bucket as the uh, baseball diamonds and class A's arenas, rinks, that, which cost quite a bit to maintain. I think really it's the maintenance of them. Uh, you, you would support that? Yes or Absolutely. no? Absolutely. Okay, I, I don't. You. And you mentioned that there is a need for other courses. I, it would be wrong if we didn't say we did have seven courses, not five. So in talking about another course, we do have Centennial and Royal Woodbine, which are not exactly municipal golf courses. Before we would start adding, would it not be prudent to actually look at operating one of those as a municipal course? I think, I think, Councillor, it would be prudent to look at 
any any asset that that is under the umbrella of the City of Toronto Parks and, and Recreation Board, um, I think it's it, it's imperative to look at the asset as it is and see if it can be enhanced to the for the greater good of um, of the of the public. Um, I would submit that the that Centennial and Royal Woodbine, being in the far west end of the city, are very um, or can be uh, difficult to um, to get to um, for downtown folks. Uh, I also believe that of 1,500 parks um, that currently in the city of Toronto, some with with uh, with very poor user rates, that there and and, and other areas too of of, um, of open green space, that there are opportunities. And um, I think it would behoove City Council to uh, to take a look at, at these opportunities and see what uh, can be can be done. One thing that the City of Toronto sorely lacks, in my opinion, is a downtown uh, range practice practice range and and practice area, um, which none of the five city-owned courses downtown have. And I think that would be a significant step forward uh, that could really help uh, and for the betterment and the enjoyment of a lot of citizens. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Additional questions of the deputy? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you so much for your deputation. That brings us to Joan, sorry, to Joan uh, Skalicki. Do we have Joan online? Uh, Joan has uh, dropped off the call, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, Monica Tynan Day. me. I'm, hi, Monica. Thanks for joining us. You have to oh, I'm so sorry. I was told I would get a call first. Monica? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. You have three minutes. Okay, sorry. I did not Thank hear you. you. Um, hello, you all know I'm Monica Tynan Day and I'm a proud Toronto City golfer. Since COVID, excuse me, since COVID started, it is now the only city managed activity I participate in. Toronto needs to keep its five golf courses intact, not reduce or eliminate and repurpose the land. Parkland of any size does and can accommodate many varied interests, but not golfing. Golf courses are extremely expensive to build without the land cost and won't return once gone. Parkland already exists on both sides of these courses and could provide the access and space for these other activities without reducing these courses in half or eliminating them completely. My greatest fear is these courses being opened to development eventually, which can be a slippery slope, especially in floodplains. Hurricane Hazel established the need to keep these lands open. This is extremely limited green, sorry, there is extremely limited green space within three kilometers of my home, regardless of use. Therefore, I am traveling to any golf course or any activity, which was brought up by one of the other delegates. City golf courses are well used, as we know, 90% and extremely busy with two to four players every 15 minutes from sunrise to sunset. To get a reservation, I usually have to set up an alarm for when booking opens at midnight or 6 a.m. With a surge in golf activity, private golf memberships, costs and accessibility have become even more prohibitive. The majority of my golf is played on city courses. I have some health limitations and don't have the stamina to regularly get out of the city to play and then get home afterwards. If it wasn't for city courses, I would not be playing golf, which has definitely physically and mentally benefited me. I've supported many initiatives and this is one of the most personal because it impacts my personal life every day. This past season, I made four new friends that I'm in regular contact with. Friends I met playing golf in our city and one I now play golf with weekly. My father has played golf in the city my entire life and the majority of courses he played are already gone. A friend's mother did not move to our city because there were not as many phys active physical activities as in other communities for seniors. These public city courses are far from elite and club-like. They have the lowest level of amenities, but do have physical proximity. They are aligned in stature to city tennis courts without the quantity. 
Growing up in Toronto, traveling on Eglinton past Scarlet Woods course, I never knew I'd be playing golf there decades later. Having lived in countries where golf was more easily accessible, I've now returned and am very proud of the courses that city makes available to so many people and so close to home. It's not uncommon to see someone standing at a bus stop near one of these courses with golf clubs or new golfers repeatedly missing hitting the ball or sending them off the playing area. My last golf day in mid-November was at Scarlet Woods with a gentleman and two of his three golfing children, 17 and eight years of age. It was a glorious day, sunshine, a lovely family of experienced golfers, glorious fall colored trees and abundant wildlife, a family of beavers, two cormorants, two massive flocks of geese and rarely seen chipmunks. It was the most wildlife I'd seen anywhere in Ontario in the past five years. These golf courses provide for family activities and a way to be with fellow Torontonians for a few hours bonding in the experience. I fear if we do not protect these courses that we already have, they will be gone forever, never to be replaced. Thank you Thank for you your deputation. Are there any questions? questions? Okay, seeing none. That brings us to our next deputant, uh, Paula McKiernan. Do we have Paula in line? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I believe uh, Paul McCarran is not present in the meeting. Okay, uh, Cheryl Case. I'm not here. Nope. Uh, Cheyenne Sundance. Madam Chair, we don't see Cheyenne either, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Bob Weeks. Madam Chairman, Councillors, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Bob Weeks and as full, uh, full reveal here, I am a journalist, I am a reporter with TSN. I'm also the golf analyst for TSN. I got my intro to golf, however, uh, many years ago working in the back shop at Scarlet Woods Golf Course and I wouldn't be where I am today which includes the Canadian Golf Hall of Fame, if it wasn't for my time working at Scarlet Woods. I am uh, in general agreement with the proposals submitted to Council, although I think they fall quite short of an overall strategy for these facilities. Much of it is short in length and lacking vision for the next 5, 10, and 20 years. It really seemed to me that while it's got some good points to it, there needs to be a deeper dive into what, this, uh, what these golf facilities could offer in the coming years. I also think that a review of the downsizing of D'Antonia Park would be a mistake. I don't think we need to shorten that. I think there are ample lands out at Centennial Park, which is owned by the City of Toronto, to put up a uh, facility that would be a good uh, starting block, nine-hole course there. There's already 27 holes there. Nine could be partitioned off just for, for youngsters, for juniors, for people learning the game. I think it's imperative that Toronto offers municipal golf in Canada and uh, more people play golf than any other sport. It's been mentioned here a couple of times in the last few years. In fact, I've received, I think, more comments on keeping these golf courses open than I have on people who ask me who's going to win the Masters. And I think uh, mixed use of the course is a good thing. Other activities where safe and can work in harmony and always have uh, with golf courses. In fact, if you go back to the old course in Scotland, uh, known as the home of golf, centuries, for centuries now, it's closed on Sundays. And locals are allowed to walk on it as a park picnic there, walk their dogs and do other activities. So this is nothing new. This past summer, I had a chance to go back to Scarlet Woods, my, my first golf home, I guess. And I saw kids, seniors playing with parents, uh, kids, accomplished players, not so accomplished players, and importantly, a wide mix of demographics and ethnicities. And really what I saw there was people having a lot of fun. And many of these people you've heard on this call today, speaking with a lot of passion about what golf brings to them, what golf allows them, who they play golf with. It really, in a lot of ways to me, was a reflection of Toronto itself. Now, golf is a healthy, positive outdoor activity that can be played by people from five to 95. And there are very few activities that the city um, welcomes or uses or offers that can be played by such a wide demographic. And 
a Swedish study found that a 40% lower mortality rate exists among people who play golf. So it's healthy as well. Um, as for the future, I think it's important that the city invest in these assets. And that's what these are. These are assets. I would urge uh, attention to be paid to the condition of the golf courses ahead of the structural facilities. And I think if you create a golf course with good tees, smooth greens, which can be done economically, as well as an acceptable pace of play in which people can get around the golf course in a reasonable time, I think you'll have people beating a path to your door. And other cities, such as Vancouver, have learned this, and they have a vibrant municipal golf uh, courses. I realize this all takes money. And one thing that I have not heard a lot of today, which I emphasized in some of the uh, um, meetings that were held earlier, was the opportunity to bring in outside sponsorship and outside corporate donations to keep these things going, whether it be to host clinics or support clinics or to offer up free equipment. But the city finances obviously can't afford to do everything in municipal golf, so why not allow people who want to do that to bring it in? Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Councillor Bradford. I'll be very brief. Uh, thanks for your deputation today, Mr. Weeks. Uh, you bring a unique perspective of obviously seeing a lot of go golf facilities and courses, uh, not just here in Toronto, but the Canadian context and abroad as well. Um, what, uh, what type of clientele do municipal golf courses typically have versus stuff that you might see at a, at a private course? Uh, is, it, is it fair to say they're more affordable and more accessible? Well, certainly everywhere you go, I think I think that there's three golf courses in Vancouver, for example, and they're a bit a little bit uh, better taken care of. They're a little bit more um, full golf courses, I guess, regulation golf courses. At one time, they were considering hoping holding a PGA tour, tour event at one of them. Um, but they the, the clientele at a, at a municipal golf course is I mean, it's it's everything. It's soup to nuts. I think it's a lot of people who are learning the game. A lot of the people who don't can't afford any kind of other golf. I think you've heard from so many of those people on these calls today. Um, we, but I have heard from a lot of folks that have really reiterated the importance of that accessibility and that affordability in places like Dentonia that provide that. Would there be a risk in terms of if we're hoping to provide more recreation opportunities, if we're looking to grow the sport, do you see these accessible and affordable municipal golf courses really as sort of entry level ground floor? And is that important for the growth of the sport going forward? This is, I can tell you that this is where so many of my friends who play golf, this is where they learn. They learn at city golf courses, whether it be Don Valley, Scarlet Woods, Humber Valley. This is where they first teed it up and played. It's where I had my first golf lesson at Scarlet Woods Golf Course. And, and I think um, whether they be working in the golf industry or wherever they're doing, I, I, you know, I play golf with a guy who's a Toronto lineman. He got his, his start at Don Valley Golf Course. So I think it's, it really is the entry to more golf. And I think it's really important for the enjoyment. But I think more than that, it's, I think the key that I've heard from some people talking today is the people they've met, the relationships, the leagues, uh, that social aspect of the game. Nobody's talking about, you know, breaking 60 or breaking 70. They're talking about the fun and the enjoyment that it brings. So if they can get their foot in the door um, to, to start playing game, whether they're 90 or nine, um, I think these courses are the perfect place to do that. The deputations and the personal accounts have certainly been very moving today. Um, I also want to acknowledge the calls from folks to better integrate these with some of the adjacent ravines. Tony in particular, of course, is enveloped to the east, to the north, to the west uh, with ravine land. And, and there's a large park actually immediately across the street. Do you think there's opportunities or any best best uh, uh, best case examples you can point to where where golf courses are actually integrated into broader park space. Anything top of mind for you or ways we could do that? Yeah, uh, out in Vancouver and in Kelowna, there's some municipal. Uh, I might not have, I might have Kelowna wrong, but Vancouver, there's a bike path that rope goes right through one of the golf courses. Um, so there are there are certainly examples. There are a number of examples in the United States as well. I know um, Councillor Fletcher was, or no, sorry, uh, Councillor Carroll was talking quite a bit about twelve hole golf courses. And there are some shorter golf courses, not necessarily 12 that I know of, but there are shorter golf courses or opportunities of that way. Um, but there are there is integration with certainly with environmental er, uh, needs and areas. I think Shadok and Hamilton's also integrated the trail with the escarpment ravine trails that they have there. But the point is, there are examples that we can look to where you can make trail connections and have golf facilities. You don't need to have one or the other. We can figure out how to do it. There's plenty out there and I'm happy to help you in any of your fashion. Look those up. Well, thanks for your deputation today. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions of the deputant? 
Can I just ask one more, Madam Chair? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Council. I have to ask a question, uh, mostly because if I don't, my dad would be terribly disappointed in me. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Weeks covers curling as well, so you're, you're kind of like a god to my family. <laughs> um, uh, overall, it's when you describe across the country, it, it sounds like investments are being made across the country to meet some of the environmental needs we've heard, but also because because golf isn't dead as one of the deputants uh, left. Is there, is there potential for growth beyond the pandemic in this sport? Yes, the, the numbers that I have seen um, show that worldwide golf had, had certainly dipped, but it was climbing back up. 2017, 18 and 19 uh, saw increases in participation, also saw increases in equipment sales. I think a lot of times when you look at, at dips, and I'm not suggesting that there wasn't a dip. I can, I've been in this game long enough where I've seen a big boom in the eight, late 80s, another one in the mid-90s when Tiger and Mike Weir came around, and right. now you're seeing it there. But it is a bit cyclical, but a lot of it, too, is weather-related. You know, if you have a bad year of weather, yes. the green fields, greens go down. But uh, it's certainly not going away. Let's put it that way. That's my view of it. Neither is curling, for that matter. Right. And the indication is not really just in – the throughput of golfers but it's as you mentioned we can tell from the equipment sales that people are actually buying clubs so it's not as if they just hit a driving range because it was a pandemic they're now investing in the game doesn't that mean we should invest in the course i think it does and i think if you invest in the course you'll reap the rewards i think it doesn't take a lot and as i said i think there's outside uh money that could be made available through certain channels and I think that if you start by, I played a golf course in San Diego. It's a, it's a municipal golf course. And all they did was repair their tees and their greens. And they are absolutely booming because that's the two things that people look wow. at. They don't mind hitting off a dirt, dirt patch fairway. But if you have a nice green and a nice tee to hit off of, you'll bring them, you'll bring them in by the hundreds. 100%. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Additional questions to the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, that brings us to our next deputant, who is Malcolm Bromley. Do we have Malcolm on the line? Hi there. Hi, it's Malcolm. Can you hear me? Hi, Malcolm. Thank you. You have three minutes. Great. Thanks so much. Well, I'd like to thank Mr. Weeks for a, a lovely segue into uh, some of the things I'm going to speak to today. I can assure you it was unintentional and unplanned, but uh, welcomed. My name is Malcolm Bromley, and I'm a regular golfer at Humber Valley, and I'm also the retired general manager of the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation. I held that position from 2010 till 2020. I retired and then moved back to Toronto. In total, I spent 41 years uh, providing parks and recreation services to the public, including golf courses. Today, I'm here uh, to lend my support to you as elected officials and your staff to try and ensure the continued growth and viability of the wonderful golf courses in the city of Toronto. Uh, as you've heard, we've wrestled with some of the same issues in Vancouver where rising land prices and pressure on existing golf uh, uh, parks and green spaces was uh, even greater than perhaps it is in Toronto. When this was first discovered, actually uh, play was re being reduced in the late 90s, uh, the city of Vancouver through the park board decided to invest millions into the three golf courses, uh, which uh, Bob Weeks talked about, Fraser View, McCleary and Langara which resulted in a, a significant increase in usage. Uh, and that quality, of course, remains today. And I think uh, it, a lot of the success can be attributed to that quality. In Vancouver, staff continued to work on what we called a deep dive into golf services in Vancouver with a goal uh, of optimizing the courses for both golfers and non-golfers alike. And I think Toronto is on the path to do the same thing. It cannot be done in a cursory manner. It does have to be done in a very deep way. The report before you does emphasize the much needed procurement certainty to allow the courses to continue. One of the things I'd suggest you consider, there's been discussion about uh, Toronto owning seven golf courses, is perhaps one of the uh, outlying courses that are operated outside of your framework, uh, Centennial perhaps, could be included into the inventory so that you'd have economies of scale and consistency and would allow for more uh, diversity and, and flexibility in play. It's something for you to consider. Um, I would also uh, like to comment on Dentonia and the suggestion of uh, 
reducing the course to nine holes. I would not support that because uh, once you begin removing golf course holes, it is a slippery slope somebody spoke of. And I can see this uh, becoming something that others would entertain at some of the bigger courses, which I think would be highly ill-advised. If we need, we actually do need more courses. And if you look at our population and the amount of golf courses available, I think the, the city would welcome more courses. And you have to remember people come from all around Toronto to play golf at the city courses. And that would, uh, that would continue. Golf courses are, are, are purpose built and they're designed um, and they're not simply land that surplus waiting to be reused for something else. Once a golf course is gone, it is gone. And there are several examples, which I call golf ghost courses in Toronto uh, that, that have a sad legacy to the removal. Municipal golf courses are an essential jewel in a collection of parks, facilities um, that you are the stewards of. And I think it's your responsibility to maintain that stewardship and, and maintain uh, the standards that are required. Again, all parks and recreation should be provided through a lens of equity and access, and golf is no different. Lowering physical, financial language and gender barriers must be front of mind as we go forward. The inclusion of golf in the, uh, for youth in the welcome policy is a great step toward equity, as well as hosting all ability golfers, providing assistive devices. It's made Toronto one of the leaders in this area and it should be continued. I'm wrapping up shortly. Um, in Vancouver, we use the golf courses for many benefits, food production, community walking, urban forest expansion, biodiversity initiatives, and rewilding the city. Toronto does some of these things as well, and, and the report encourages continued growth in that area, which I would support. I do believe one suggestion I, may, I could make is the inclusion of local advisory, sort of a structural public engagement tool through local advisory groups based out of each golf course. Each golf course is unique and uniquely situated. And I think um, there has not been a structured ongoing opportunity for people to, to share their ideas, both golf and non-golf uses of the course to ensure that they meet the needs of the public. That's what I would suggest you do. And lastly, I would echo the idea that please go and visit some of the golf courses and see the diversity and the faces of people there and the terrific work that your staff do, the contractors do and the volunteers, I think you'd be very proud of them. Thanks. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Councillor Carroll. Hello there. <laughs> hi, hi, Madam Councillor. <laughs> hi, Shelley. I'm no see Malcolm. Um, it, uh, we, we heard from Councillor Fletcher earlier that, that we, we have this long ago directive. I, I think it dates back to uh, just, just after amalgamation that unlike other recreation facilities where we, where we put an equity lens on, um, this one has to pay for itself. Um, in Vancouver, is, is, that, is that the overarching thing for the whole board or do they get specific and say golf has to pay for golf, but other sports don't necessarily have to pay for themselves? Did they put that kind of constraint on? No, we didn't have that constraint, but it was a goal. Uh, the goal uh, for me and my staff there was to yeah. use as little tax money as possible for the provision of services, but we would use it where it was strategically necessary. Um, we, we did have the advantage that you can play golf 12 months of the year in Vancouver. People ask me, why am I here again? Right. Um, but I'm here for family and, uh, of course, to be, be close to my friends and back to Toronto. Um, but uh, it, it is a quality of the courses and it is also the food and beverage provision. That's done in-house in Vancouver. There are different models. Uh, there's no one best for everybody, but there are different models that can be used to maximize uh, the revenue potential of golf courses. Um, so, no, we didn't have that. And, and it's a very good comment. If you look at the full costing, of arena and pool operation, uh, you'd be quite surprised how much it costs you per hour to operate those facilities uh, yeah. versus per hour of a golf course. They're heavily subsidized and I support the heavy subsidization, um, but golf should not be uh, held out as something that is held to a higher standard. Okay, and, and, and one other question. I don't know if you, you would know because the, this is greater Vancouver area, but as you move further out, um, in Burnaby, for instance, mm -hmm. there, there they have some city run golf courses that have really deluxe clubhouses. Does that, does that pay in the long run or were they, they meeting multiple uh, strategies by putting in, you know, a, a catering venue style yeah, clubhouse? Yeah. Um, again, when the golf courses, when, when Vancouver invested and reinvested and had Tom McBroom, a uh, well-known architect, uh, improve the courses in Vancouver, there was a conscious effort to keep the clubhouses small to make the focus of the facility for golf. Okay. I think that's short-sighted. I think when you build a facility, 
um, like Burnaby did, they had a business model that included uh, catering and banquets, and it's extremely busy. I have played there and I've attended banquets and functions there. And so if you could imagine, for example, if Don Valley had a first class clubhouse and a first class restaurant with that view and that vantage point and its proximity, yeah. you know, the, 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 uh, the sky's the limit. Right. It, as long as you're strategic about where. Yes. So Don yes. Valley, for instance, is very central. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Uh, good to hear from you again. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, thank you. Are there any additional questions for Malcolm? Okay. Uh, seeing none, that brings us to our next speaker, Lauren Rubenstein with Score Golf. Lauren, do we have you on the line? Hello. Hi, Lauren. You have three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I welcome and appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody here. It's a very, very important subject. Uh, and I think a little bit of background, uh, my own background would give some context to this. I was the golf columnist for the Globe and Mail from 1980 to 2013. Like my friend and colleague, Bob Weeks, I'm a member of the Canadian Golf Hall of Fame, still write for Score Golf, started the magazine, in fact, way back in 1980. But perhaps more importantly to this discussion, I grew up right around the corner from Don Valley, and I basically still live around the corner from Don Valley, and I have made many visits there over the years. I've given some clinics uh, when asked by the then pro Dave Richardson to kids on a Saturday morning. Um, I doubt that I would be in this position uh, to have made a career as a golf journalist without my introduction to Don Valley and to playing there, to walking there sometimes, to playing with my dad uh, when we would get up at five in the morning on weekend mornings and go over there and uh, put our ball in a little uh, device by the first tee and uh, get on the tee and go out there and play. Now, Don Valley has changed a lot over the years, definitely, when uh, Highway 401 was built. I'm old enough to remember 401 um, being built, that part of it, over the golf course. Uh, and when Wilson Avenue was extended to York Mills, the course changed as well. But really, in a sense, that hasn't mattered because people have loved and enjoyed Don Valley ever since. And not only Don Valley, of course, I also played Humber Valley and the other courses. They've all been important to me, but none more so than Don Valley. It's a fantastic resource. I've traveled the world for golf um, from Japan to Australia to 30 trips to Scotland. Everywhere that golf has been played, pretty much I've been. And honestly, I don't know of a resource so central to a city as Don Valley is, um, where you can get off the bus, play there. If you drive by on an evening in the summertime, you will see people young and old on the putting green there overlooking Young Street and just having some fun there. Uh, it, uh, it is such an important resource um, and I hope that uh, it will continue and improve, certainly. Now, one thing I want, I want to bring up a concept that uh, is really still central to golf in Scotland called common good lands. And what does that mean? In Scotland, anybody can walk on a golf course at any time, as Bob was saying, where they can walk there on Sundays. And um, the concept of a common good land means that it's public land, even though it might be used for some clubs uh, most of the time as a private resource, for example, the Muirfield Golf Club near Edinburgh, but still people have access to the land they have responsible access to the land. That's why, in a sense, I think that Don Valley and other golf courses, I do believe that there can be some alternative uses to the land, which would be very, very helpful. I think the golf courses should remain central as the usage, but there are many other things we could do with golf clubs. At Don Valley, for example, uh, during the winter, whatever, skiing, walking trails, access to Earl Bales Park. My wife rides her bike down by the reservoir across from the third hole at Don Valley, and I agree that there should be some access to the park there, and I don't, why, don't see why it couldn't be easily provided with some um, imagination and thought and belief that that could be a good use of the land. There are other things we could do there as well to promote sort of a, a more of a community involvement. That said, I don't think it's right to think of uh, these of the municipal golf courses um, as 
there are many people, how can I put it, who could afford to belong to private golf courses around the city. They choose to play at Don Valley and Humber Valley because of their locations, because of the quality of the courses, because they can get there quickly and come back to their families on the weekends. My best friend is a family physician in Toronto and he could well afford to belong to private golf courses. He doesn't want any part of the private golf courses. He plays pretty much only at Don Valley and plays with others who could also well afford to belong to private golf courses. So it's a resource for everybody. I know that's been said many, many times, but we can't forget that. One final comment I want to make. I would like to see some sort of view uh, or a perspective on the golf course that we could use, we could do different things with it in the sense, for example, at Don Valley, if we, now some people won't agree with this from what I've heard, but I think that if we reimagined Don Valley, the way golf is going right now, as a matter of fact, we are seeing more nine hole and more 12 hole courses. I wouldn't support Antonia Park being reduced, but I would support a look at least at Don Valley, put in a, you have a, a large acreage there, put in a, a, a tremendous nine hole golf course there, a par three golf course, a per, a, an ideal practice facility, improve the restaurant. There are so many things you could do there just with, I think we need to reimagine land use around Toronto and the Don Valley would be a great place to start from the golf side for me. Anyway, I could uh, go on and on about the subject. Don Valley is central to my life. It really still is. And I'm so glad it was there back in the 60s when I sort of fell into golf writing because of my involvement at Don Valley. Thank you very much for listening. And I do hope that uh, this procedure, this process will lead to a continuation of the really marvelous golf facilities we have in Toronto and for their expanded and more imaginative use. Thank you. Great, thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you for joining us. Um, there was a, um, a discrepancy in the order of the registration. So the next speaker actually is supposed to be Naomi Faulkner. So Naomi, are you online? Hello. Hi, you have three minutes, thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the ability to participate in this process. I'm a senior living near the Don Valley Golf Course and was thankful that for the past two summers, I could be active and social playing golf in the city. Prior to COVID, I participated in the women's leagues at Tam O'Shanter and played weekly at other city courses. I will be succinct to make three points. First, I want to express my support for the city continuing to own and maintain public golf courses for its citizens. Second, um, I want to make the point that the food offered currently at these public courses has not been much better than what one could order at a hot dog stand. I would ask that food vendors contracted by the city offer more variety and healthier options such as salads and wraps. Third, um, there were women's leagues operated um, throughout the city courses pre-COVID that were very popular. But for some reason, even though golf was allowed to continue, um, these leagues became dormant. I would therefore ask that the leagues be reactivated for the coming season. They were really important to a lot of women. I would also like a women's league to be established at Don Valley. Residents like me who live centrally should not be forced to drive in rush hour traffic on the 401 to play at Scarborough, play in Scarborough at Tam O'Shanter or at Humber in Etobicoke. Um, we we're forced to uh, drive at rush hour because the leagues only operated, operated during the twilight hours. And just one last point, um, my experience at Don Valley was that we often encountered people who were wandering around the course lost, dog walkers, people whipping through on bikes, um, I'm all for utilizing these lands for other uses, but in this case, it's a real land use conflict. And I always worry that um, someone would get hit by a golf ball and get seriously injured or even killed. So I think this it's incumbent on the city to ensure that um, people are warned with signage and also perhaps better fencing during the golf season to prevent people walking through Don Valley 
because again, I, I really think it's a, it's a major, major issue. Anyways, that's it for me. I encourage uh, the golf courses to continue and um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your deputation and being on time. Um, any questions for the deputant? Okay. Uh, thank you, Naomi. That brings us to our next speaker, Roxana Martinez. Again, a reminder, you have three minutes. Rox Roxana, do we have you on the line? Uh, Madam Chair, we do not believe, we do not have Roxana Martinez or the next speaker, Ernest Bela, present on the call. Okay, uh, Jessica Ireland. Uh, my name is Jessica Ireland, and I'm here because of Progress Toronto. I was disappointed to see that many of the repurposing proposals to make the land more accessible are not being taken up. And I wanted to echo those calls for repurposing. With my comments, I would like to focus on asking you to bring operations and management of the courses and the pro shops in-house as public services instead of continuing to contract them out. There's a crisis right now in Toronto with a lack of good jobs. This review is an opportunity for you to address that and create good, stable jobs for people in Toronto by making sure that public golf courses and public lands are managed and operated publicly. I worked in customer service roles in the private sector for many years, and the pandemic has only made it more stark and more obvious that workers' health and safety is not prioritized in a private for-profit environment, especially for low-wage workers and especially for customer service workers. Market whims cannot guarantee job stability, good working conditions, or fair wages, all of which are desperately needed in Toronto right now. Many objectives outlined in the report require public management in order to be fully realized. As long as the operations and management of these lands is contracted out, then you as city councillors won't be able to ensure that land is stewarded in a way that preserves the ecosystem, nor can you ensure that land is accessible to be used by everyone in the city. Golf in particular requires a lot of equipment and the shops are operated privately. That equipment and therefore the land is not truly accessible to all of us. The bottom line is there's no good reason that public land should be operated by private companies. Publicly managing and operating public land would create a lot more stability for those workers by not having contracts up for renewal every few years. And it would allow the city to fully realize its goals of environmental stewardship and universal access to public land. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions for Jessica? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to our next deputant, Susan uh, Garris. Jarris? You have Susan online? I've been a resident of Humber Bay Shores for over 30 years. Watching my neighborhood shoreline parkland evolve over time, I've observed increasing appreciation of outdoor activities by residents and visitors alike. And while grateful for Toronto's public recreation complexes that during non-COVID times offer affordable indoor fitness, cultural, educational, and social activities, the health benefits of outdoor living should not be undervalued, particularly in times when physical distancing is a must. Wherever we may be in our phenomenal city, there are green spaces nearby to visit, or if we prefer, admire from a distance, be they manicured parks, nature trails, parkettes, neighbors' gardens, or even hydro rights of way. Additional enhancements to reach a wider audience in these settings without compromising their character or raison d'etre would surely be welcome. Repurposing public golf courses to reduce golf would result in a tremendous loss for Toronto and its citizens, and in particular, those of modest means. 
My point is that Toronto residents do have tremendous opportunities for outdoor living and de-stressing in nature. But as our population ages, more and more older adults face shrinking budgets, limiting their ability to engage in previously enjoyed entertainment, social and sports activities. As with their younger counterparts embarking on adulthood and the responsibilities of new careers and families, Certain activities that were once an essential part of their lifestyles may be transitioning into unaffordable luxuries, diminishing their quality of life. Yes, young families are also at risk. A good number of years ago on a whim, I allowed the adventurous side of myself to challenge my workaholic self to a foray into unfamiliar ground, a hitherto untried sport, and I surprised myself with an affinity for golf. My blossoming career, my busy work life meant I wouldn't have time to hone great golf skills. So for the most part, I played only in the occasional work-related tournament. Golf was fun, but not an integral part to my life. About 15 years ago, I discovered Scarlet Woods and eventually their ladies league. Golf gained new meaning. It became a new way to enjoy my urban environment in the peace and tranquility of a serene pocket of nature in the city and in the company of continually evolving acquaintances and friendships, along with the pleasure of making new ones. Thankfully, my previously held notion that golf could only be an elite sport was crushed. At our, at our Toronto public courses, I've seen borderline antique equipment that once was top of the line, bought at a more prosperous stage in a golfer's life. I've seen Canadian tire specials. I've seen hand-me-downs and garage sale treasures all are welcome. I found that I could enjoy being a rank amateur, a golf hack, in an affordable way in an exquisite, charming urban oasis close to home. The very thought of exorbitant initiation costs and membership fees at a private club was horrific. In fact, it was absurd. So I've happily played at Scarlet Woods with golfers of all ages, backgrounds, and skill sets. I'm now retired and hope to continue and to experience and enjoy the courses as well. What a fantastic way to stay fit and healthy while better connecting with my diverse community. In our challenging times, Toronto needs to facilitate such affordable, nurturing recreational environments for amateur golfers of all ages and physical abilities. Let's honor our seniors who head out to our public courses, setting the example of fitness as a rewarding lifelong pursuit. And let's encourage young people to get out from behind their electronic devices into the fresh air and discover golf as a new way to explore the meaning of sportsmanship and to live a healthy, playful life. Let's view our public courses as a means of fostering both physical and mental health and fitness for all, vitality. And let's preserve the option of affordable golf for all as an instrument for achieving that goal. Our public golf courses provide our citizens a place where the sport of golf need not be synonymous with elitism, but with opportunity for better living for anyone so inclined. The health benefits of fun have been scientifically proven, and golf is fun. Let's not decide that it ought to be unaffordable as well for an ever-growing segment of our society. In 2017, while teeing up, I received a phone call informing me of a cancer diagnosis that I had a friendship that germinated on a golf course, saw me through my recovery. Social bonds arising from these courses are invaluable. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for joining us and sharing your story. Our next speaker is Shah Mahudin. Do you have Shah on the line? Hello. Hi, you have three minutes. Okay, Jennifer, thanks for allowing me to time to speak. My name is Shah Mohyuddin, living in Tisden Place, Scarborough, beside the D'Antonia Golf Course area. I would like to speak on food, environment, and climate change related to the D'Antonia Golf Course alternative and complementary use. We know how food is important to us for human life to survive and also to develop our immune system in the COVID time and also non-COVID time. But lack of secured food is also a like a food pandemic, like COVID-19 pandemic. The food which we get from the outside, from the store, is not healthy. They are junk food, frozen food, and they are contaminated and polluted when they are trans transported 
from outside with pollution from the atmosphere. So we need local food. We need um, green food and that we can grow in by ourselves for, from the, by the gardeners and also community gardeners. Uh, so I would like to tell you that this area, this Gulf Coast area, I think from a report, I found that 35% people are um, participating from the immigrant. But those multicultural immigrants from different countries, they have lots of experienced skill and knowledgeable um, farming and gardening. So these gardeners, if they need a space, they can utilize their expertise to make greener, healthier, pollution-free, sustainable, livable, and resilient city. I am a gardener also, and lots of garden interested garden are, are, gardeners are eagerly waiting for green garden plot. They are low, low income residents. They do not drive. They like to garden with their family members, their kids, parents, grandparents. They cannot travel distant places for gardening. This Dentonia golf course area is very close to them, their residence. The tree plantation and gardening also improve environment by sucking and taking carbon and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to make their food and they release oxygen, fresh air, clean air, healthy breathing and reducing greenhouse gas emission. This will mitigate and prevent the climate change impact. The gardeners use also organic compost. They do not use chemical fertilizer. So they are using this from garden waste and kitchen scraps or kitchen uh, waste. Uh, sorry, I am <laughs> running the time. That reduces landfill, uh, uh, landfill space and production of more powerful toxic gas methane. So this, this way they are helping and supporting the Toronto zero, zero waste management policy. Gardening also create ecological, biodiversity environment. The indigenous community can also use the space for growing their favorite and cultural, traditional, and educational three sisters plantation with corn, beans, and squash. The north side of the Dantonia Golf Course area, beside the Taylor Creek, Mesit uh, Creek, and the, what is it called, the Pharmacy Avenue. That area is very favorable and conducive for plantation and growing vegetables. Enough sunlight. The water line is there, fertile soil, free from flood line, flood plain also, because city report has shown that 78% is above flood plain, only 22 is uh, flood area, and also good drainage system. I'll ask for some final thoughts. Yeah, so, and I appreciate that some uh, uh, councillor Bradford and other speaker also, they have mentioned about the green space to make this green space and also food production uh, opportunity. And I would like to add that gardening is, a, gardening is an uh, appropriate option uh, for growing this green space to make more physical, mental benefits, recreational benefits, and also entertaining uh, the residents by growing vegetables and also pollinator gardens, attracting pollinators, flowers, this and this, to beautify the area. So I would like to request the planners and also the decision makers, city councillor, mayor, environmentalist, CRCA uh, uh, staff, and other people to make strategic planning and contemplating decision for the efficient and effective use of the Dentonia Golf Course for health benefits, recreational, environmental, ecological, social, cultural, economic, 
benefits the decisions of this area. Thanks for listening and thanks to all. Madam Chair, you appear to be muted. Oh, so <laughs> that would explain okay. why I was, I was trying to let the deputy know he had, he had reached his time and he didn't hear me. Um, I just wanted to, to go to questions of the deputy. Councilor Bradford, did you have a question? Or were you just telling me I was muted? No, I, I do have a question. And, okay. Uh, we can hear you now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, John, thanks very much for the deputation. I appreciate that and, and all of your feedback. Um, have you been a part of community garden initiatives in other parks uh, here in Toronto? Yes, that, thanks, uh, Bradford. Yes, I live in Tisdale Peria. I know your area also. And I appreciate that you have also initiative, taken the initiative in the Centronia uh, Park area, but that is not yet any decision taken. That is okay. I appreciate your, uh, your, your uh, initiatives. But this area, this side of this, uh, other side, there is a community garden. I was also a community gardener, but it is too much for us. You know access point, because Bradford, you know very well. Access point, they have long list, about 100 um, applicants are in the waiting list. And this community so, garden has... So what I'm hearing, um... Shaw is that there there is a community garden on the T Stale side. I'm on the other side of Victoria Park, Crescent Town, yeah. Tetonia. But the the point you're making is there is more demand for the community garden yes. than is currently yes. available. Uh, yes. are, are you aware that I have a community garden underway? Uh, we're working on getting that going right now, just on the other side of the street in Tetonia yes. Park. Yes, I mentioned that before, also Bradford. I appreciate. So apologies if I concerned. if I miss that. How many uh, how many plots or allocations are available in the one adjacent to Teesdale? Only twenty four plots, and those are rotating every two or three years. So do you, there's do a you long have list. Any recommendations around uh, the size of community gardens? Should they be bigger? Should there be they be smaller? Is there an optimal size for for food growth and production? Balancing you know some of the challenges maybe with with wildlife, is there a right size for those? Yeah, it could be say 1,500 to 2,000 square feet. Okay, and let's say 2,000 square feet, how, how many uh, plots does that net out? To yeah, say far plots could be, could be uh, 100 or like this, 100 square feet, say 10 feet by 10 feet or 12 feet by 8 feet like this. So there could be, you do that, uh, about okay. 20. Plots. Okay, and have you engaged with us on the Dintodia Park side of the community garden that we're getting going over there yet? Did I? Yeah, have have we connected on that outside of this meeting? But just with the yes, yes, got a yes. lot of folks because, that are because um, in the consultation time, I think about hundred people signed up a petition. That's and right. Sent it to 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 the consultation committee. Okay, well, I, 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 I'm going to let my, my time go here, but uh, if we have an opportunity to connect on that, I'd welcome an email and, and more correspondence in connection with you on, on the community garden we're building across the street and leverage your experience uh, from, from your side on the east of Victoria Park there. Thank Thanks you. for your deputation. Thank you, thank, thank you Bradford. You great initiative, great thinking for community garden. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. We'll go back to deputants and a reminder to deputants that they have three minutes. The next deputant is Mary McMahon. To me, it's the perfect golf course, not too long, not too expensive, and lots of good hill climbing exercise. It seems that despite 96% occupancy in 2020, the reports are recommending converting D'Antonia to a nine hole course and converting half to parkland. The report says preliminary analysis is that a nine hole par three golf course will, with improved practice amenities would deliver improved golf outcomes. But how can removing half of a very small golf course give improved golf outcomes? D'Antonia already offers many learn the game opportunities. Adult lessons are available using the driving cages and putting green, as well as the course itself. And in the summer, there are children there every weekday taking golf lessons. Local high school students use the course for their golf teams. 
And as the only par three course in the city system, it's a natural place for new golfers to come to learn the game or improve their short game. But the main point I would like to make is that the conversion of this course to a nine hole course will almost certainly result in its eventual demise. The existing course only takes about two to two and a half hours to play. A nine hole course would only take a little over an hour to play. And it's likely that many of the people who currently use the course will no longer play there. It won't be the, worth the effort. Oddly, the report seems to suggest that the development of a nine hole course would somehow be great for the Toronto golf world. But every golf course in the city already offers a nine hole game. At the longer courses, these are often taken up. But at D'Antonia, being such a short course, very few people want to play nine holes. There are many beautiful parks in the city, but very few golf courses. I expect the cost of developing a new golf course today would be astronomical. It would be a shame to destroy an existing beautiful course such as D'Antonia. It's a valuable asset that the city should be proud of. Just as a great city will have art galleries and museums that not everyone will like or take advantage of, it should also offer a variety of sporting outlets for as many interests as possible. D'Antonia is the most affordable and accessible golf course in the city. It's a true gem and should be preserved in its existing state. Thank you very much. Thank you for your deputation and keeping the time. Um, are there questions for the deputants? Okay, uh, seeing no questions, thank you again, Mary. Our next speaker is Dylan Reed with Walk Toronto. Dylan, you have three minutes. Do we have Dylan? Can you hear me now? We can hear you, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, my name is Dylan Reed, and I'm here representing Walk Toronto. Walk Toronto is a volunteer advocacy group dedicated to making Toronto a great city for walking. Walk Toronto strongly supports the proposal to turn part of D'Antonia Park Golf Course into a public park while maintaining a smaller golf course. The D'Antonia Park Golf Course currently interrupts the city's ravine trail network, separating the Taylor Massey Creek Trail from the Warden Woods Trail. Bringing part of the golf course into the public park network will enable the city to extend the Taylor Massey Creek Trail and link it up with the Warden Woods Trail, creating a continuous trail from inside Scarborough all the way to the downtown waterfront that provides a free space for recreation for the nearby communities and for all Torontonians. We certainly support the value of golf, which encourages walking, but the proposal would maintain an affordable golf course suited for learners and casual players and suited for an urban environment. The pandemic has shown the value of free accessible parkland and spaces for walking in nature for Torontonians, especially those who live in multi-unit residences and do not have access to private yards. The proposal to convert part of Antonia Golf Course into parkland would create more space that can be accessed for free for a variety of recreational purposes. It would create a safe off-road route for such recreation that links Scarborough and East York. It's particularly appropriate because the immediate community around it is identified as high on the equity deserving index and in need of additional free public facilities. The proposal would also support the city's new ravine strategy. The city is investing considerable time and money to establish ravine trail connections where they are missing, such as the new East Don Trail. It would be a tragedy to overlook this unique opportunity to continue the work of connecting up Toronto's ravine trails with a much simpler project. The proposal for turning part of D'Antonia Park into public parkland is a compromise that maintains access to a city golf course while providing new free public parkland and connecting up a gap in Toronto's ravine trail network. We urge the committee to accept it. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation and keeping to time. Are there questions of the deputants? Uh, seeing none, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradford, go ahead. Thanks, Dylan, for the deputation. Thanks for being here today. Um, did you hear, uh, have you been on the line for the, the duration of the meeting? I know it's been a long one and, and people have been on it. I've heard a few of the deputations, yes. Okay. Yeah, some some of the folks have um, uh, pointed to other examples in Canadian cities and abroad where golf courses have actually been integrated into the trail network, into the park network. Uh, they cited some Canadian examples and, and abroad as well. Um, did you hear those conversations? I didn't hear those ones, no. Okay, I would walk Toronto. So 
there, there's a lot of work that's been done on the ravine network as you know i'm specifically talking about detonia i've seen that you've you've seen our correspondence and letter on the piece um there was a taylor creek master plan that was done in the previous term of council that also articulated strengthening the connections with those ravines obviously victoria park to pharmacy there there's a gap um, that exists and right now you're you're routed through the neighborhood. I actually went out there Thursday night to look at it myself. Um, if there was a way, as we heard from some of the deputants today, today to connect uh, that part of the uh, Taylor Massey Creek and the ravine and the trail connection there through the golf course, is that something that you would be supportive of? I know that you want half the golf course gone, but would it also be beneficial to make that connection as well? Well, that would certainly be better than nothing. Um, I think uh, making that connection, but I think what the key thing is that it, sh it needs to be a, a safe and permanent connection, not just kind of a, oh, you can cross in the winter. Um, no, I, and, so, um, and I don't think that's the intention. And in fact, in our, in our letter and the recommendation number one there to enhance those trail connections, it's, a, it's not a wintertime trail connection. It would be a, a permanent connection because I think uh, folks have raised a lot of good points. And, and in fact, that was identified in that work that was done in the previous term of council as well. And it ties into the ravine strategy. Funding for that is a different piece uh, for sure, which is needed, but uh, it has been identified. You've identified it. And uh, I don't think the intention would be to do that, you know, for like four months of the year. I think it would be to get that done on a permanent basis. And so that's something that you and Walk Toronto would be supportive of. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that, you know, vague words like enhancing can mean anything. So uh, we'd really want to see something very specific and practical. Um, obviously, yeah. as you pointed out, we'd prefer uh, a wider uh, availability of parkland, but certainly uh, connecting the trail, I think, is the most important and key thing. And if that, if there's a specific and practical proposal that would actually make a, a safe uh, and convenient permanent uh, passageway, uh, that would certainly be a step forward. Well, I'm going to suggest that we look at some of that work that's actually already been done. Uh, Councillor Davis had, had really shepherded a lot of that in the previous term of council. Uh, and in fact, like what we're talking about today is undertaking a, a, a master plan at some point down the road uh which is extremely vague so uh you know i agree i like specifics i like specific actions um and and that's what we ought to be doing but appreciate your deputation thanks for the correspondence the tweets uh and thanks for coming out today thank you okay thank you are there any additional questions for the deputants okay uh seeing none uh we'll move to our next deputant Habiz uh alavi do we have Habiz on the line Oh, sorry about that. Uh, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I have uh, not much to say here uh, other than um, 2020 and 2021 has really uh, opened our eyes uh, towards how important our, our green spaces and uh, public spaces are to like uh, residents and of the city. And it's really important that it's like, especially um, there's a lot of local access and that is, you know, it's easily accessible. So I guess um, this like major gap in the, in the Don Ravine um, has been a bit issue for a while. And I'm worried that the city um, has, I guess, has priorities wrong. I do understand that the, the connection will be eventually be made, but I'm worried that uh, this this connection is not being prioritized enough. And I, I hope that, I guess, um, that city, uh, the councillors and, um, you know, they can make sure that this direct connection and access to this sort of park lot is being prioritized. Then uh, I guess the golf um, aspect um, as well. But I think the main key focus should be the connection here. Um, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? So I'm just waiting for my screen to update here. Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you. Our next speaker is Francis Tersani. Tersani? Uh, Councillor Carroll's correcting me already, so I'll let you correct me. <laughs> Tersani is fine. You, you, okay. you can say it however you like. <laughs> you have three minutes, thank you. Okay, thanks for your time. 
Hi, my name is Francis Tersini, and I'm here because of Progress Toronto. I believe that the city should reduce the number of holes in each public golf course, which would allow golfers to still have access to affordable golf options while also opening up public land for the rest of Torontonians to be used for other purposes. I live in a small apartment in the downtown core, and like many other Torontonians who live in an apartment or condo, I don't have access to any private green space. I use parts like Riverdale and Taylor Creek throughout the year, but these parts can often be extremely crowded. As the city grows and more people are expected to crowd into apartments and condos without backyards, the city needs to seriously reimagine how we manage public green spaces. Since the city already has these plots of natural land under public ownership, opening up this land for other purposes, such as tree planting or urban farming initiatives, would allow hundreds of thousands of non-golfers in the city to share in the green space that already exists. My parents and grandparents grew their own food in their, in their backyards, um, and I grew up learning how to grow food. While I'd love to carry on this tradition and grow my own food, uh, I don't have the opportunity right now with the living option that I can afford. With more emphasis placed on urban farming, the city could allow people to connect with the food growing process and address food sovereignty issues in the city. While many residents in Toronto don't have access to private green spaces like myself, the city survey on this issue actually identified that many golfers already have access to their own private yards. Also, according to the survey, those who use the courses, um, those who are golfers that identified in the survey, many of them are wealthier, white residents who don't live in the communities where the golf courses are located. This should be an equity concern since the services that you're offering are not being used by the local residents and are being used by wealthier individuals who already have access to their own private green space. Right now, these huge tracts of public green space only serve a very specific demographic and there's no other sport that I can think of that takes up this much land um, as golf does. According to the city surveys, those who golf even agreed that the city should look at reducing the number of holes at each course to open up green space for other purposes. The city has an opportunity here to plant trees, offer urban farming initiatives, or offer more inclusive recreation options for, for other sports possibly, all without having to remove the golf offering or tear down buildings to create more space. If fully revamping golf course land isn't feasible, then I think reducing the number of holes in each course to make space for other purposes should be considered. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your deputation. Any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, that brings us to our next deputant, Cameron Jacobs. Good afternoon, Councillor. Thank you, you have three minutes. Thanks so much for having us on today. You will really appreciate the Council's time. I know it's been a long one for you. Uh, my name again is Cameron Jacobs. I'm a PGA of Canada golf professional for the past 25 years of worked in the golf industry. Uh, also, uh, obviously, a player uh, in my younger years and now as a father, uh, bringing uh, my children uh, along, uh, as well as my parents, uh, again, showing the, ga the game uh, truly of a lifetime. Um, I don't have a prepared statement today because uh, a number of uh, my friends have, have already echoed similar sentiments in prepared statement, but I wanted to offer up a couple of bits of fodder for the council to either take notes on or, or, or ask questions to. Um, one of the big things I think uh, has not been mentioned today is, is the junior golf programs the city of Toronto already operates. Uh, so everyone does know that the many of the city courses do offer on weekend evenings a family golf initiative where uh, parents would pay and the children go free, uh, which is uh, again, very popular and, and, and already part of the fabric of these facilities, um, as well as the junior golf membership, which if you look at the cost of say uh, summer camp or other uh, childcare options, as your children are a little bit older, uh, you can attain a city of Toronto junior golf membership for $350 taxes in, which is uh, an, an incredible value across the country. So I know Councillor Pasternak, you've got uh, you know children of your own in hockey. I've uh, lived at that experience as well. Golf, unbelievable value. Uh, again, I, I actually work in the equipment sales business. Equipment sales are up, but again, equipment's a really interesting space because it can be all ranges from uh, the pinnacle of luxury right down to 
use the secondhand equipment found through either uh, online or, or even garage sales. So many options for, for golfers out there. One of the big questions I've seen with uh, the commentary today is the survey and, and how we've acquired this information ourselves. And I think this is where, you know, in the next evolution of this study, it would be interesting to watch. I heard a, a stat of about 6,000 participating in the survey, but really only capturing uh, information from those within about a three kilometer radius were lettered or notified uh, of the survey in general, which means that a huge, huge portion of city's uh, population, say south of Bloor Street, those that live in the downtown core and have next to zero green space uh, outside of uh, lakeshore type parks or the beaches or high park um, would have been missed on this. So it's something to keep in mind the fact that we probably didn't capture everyone on this survey. So an expansion of this would definitely go a long ways to echo some of the, the sentiments that we've got from both sides. Obviously I'm a proponent of golf, but again, I think you know this is a great first step in the evolution of where we can go with a long-term plan for the city of Toronto in the golf space. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, that will bring us to our next speaker, Donovan Hayden. Donovan, are you on the line? You have three minutes. Yep, can you hear me? We can hear you, you have three minutes, Great. thank you. Hello, my name is Donovan Hayden, and I'm speaking today to ask the city to consider reducing golf courses, pursue mixed use, and prioritize making Toronto truly equitable and accessible. As a young racialized person growing up in Toronto, golf courses were a giant no-go zone for us. I lived on Jane Street in the West End near the Lambton and Scarlet Woods golf courses. One was private and one was owned by the city. The difference did not mean anything to me as I would never step foot in either of them. My friends and I would play basketball at Jane and Woolner, explore the Humber River, and cover the neighborhood on bike or foot. But never once did we consider the golf courses a place to be. Never did we have any opportunity to be there. A stated opportunity of this review is to support public access to golf courses but that does not inspire hope when golf has historically been exclusive to many people who look like me. The city's own survey found that in one of the most diverse cities in the world, most golfers are white. Although many of the golf courses are near low-income neighborhoods, the survey showed most golfers are affluent and not from those communities. The response, we just need to get low-income and racialized people to golf, is totally disconnected from the realities of our communities. As a black boy who grew up admiring Tiger Woods and occasionally plays disc golf, I know the importance of making niche activities like golf accessible. However, those activities are unattainable when people's needs for housing, food, and safety are not met. And why must those activities be something as land consuming and exclusive as golf? If the city council really cares about benefiting Torontonians, particularly those who are racialized and low income, we would have other priorities. We would ensure that everyone in Toronto has access to large green spaces, free outdoor activities and healthy, sustainable food. We would ensure that the activities youth are already engaged in are supported. The suggestion of making golf courses more accessible seems to be a smokescreen for a minority of Torontonians to maintain the status quo of exclusive spaces that don't serve the interests of most people. Golf should exist in Toronto, but not in the ways it has been. I would like to see their space reduced and there be a real discussion about how to make Toronto more accessible and equitable so that when future children are exploring the city, there aren't any no-go zones. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next speaker is Maureen McLafferty. Do we have Maureen online? Hi, this is Maureen. You have three minutes, thank you. Okay, um, I am one of the, um, I would like to talk about Dentonia. I'm a retiree who took up golf at D Dentonia in the last couple of years, and I am on a government only pension. 
So the fact that it's $21 to pay play there is extremely important to me. So, um, and D'Antoni is very important to me every day because it's very physical, it's social, the environment is beautiful, and it's also challenging. So golf ticks a lot of boxes. Um, I also, I live in North York, I can take the subway, and because D'Antonia is a three hole par three course, we're only allowed to use the number of clubs. So I can take two clubs on the subway. So I can basically walk and if I had a big enough purse, put two golf clubs in it and just take the subway and get off and be at the first hole. So that is super important to me. It's very ethnically diverse there in, in respect to the last caller. Um, from every age group and every ethnicity because of I, I, because it's in Toronto and particularly over there in Dentonia. So it provides fitness for me. It provides a social activity for me, but it's really important. I keep hearing everybody talk about access to nature or except green, green space and accessibility. I belong to two outdoor clubs. I could pick, I could walk, have a hike in this city every single day of the week in a different area. There's over 1,500 parks, over 100 ravines and parks. Um, but I think what, what I have through these outdoor clubs is a navigator. So for people, for younger people and people who don't have access to green space, you need to know someone who knows how to get you there and walk you around. So maybe perhaps that's a suggestion that, you know, somewhere, somewhere along the line in the parks and rec program, they could offer navigation skills to, to adults or seniors or anybody so that we learn how to get into the ravines and get out of them safely. Um, but back to D'Antonia, it has to stay 18 holes. It's a fantastic little gem in this city. It's because of its hills, it's a great workout for us seniors. Yeah, it's fun. You have fun. You meet all kinds of people. Everybody's been saying that. So um, I really hope that uh, it stays as is and just keeps improving. And thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you for your deputation. Um, questions to the deputant. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, are you aware of the city's ravine strategy? Because, I mean, I think you're pointing out that you find it's hard to get into some of these systems, but we do have a strategy to try to improve that trail network. So I just wanted to know if you've seen that. I haven't, but because I'm um, with the outdoor clubs, always there, we have volunteers in the clubs that lead hikes and lead us in. And if you're not a leader, you don't always pay attention. So yeah. I'm not aware of that, of that program, but it sounds like a good one for many people. For sure. And I think we've recognized through that, that wayfinding needs to be an important part of that. So um, more to come on, on that in, in the future, but um, definitely a problem that, that rightly so you're pointing out today. Um, additional questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is Emily Daigle. Do we have Emily on the line? Hi, everybody. Hi, Emily. You have three minutes. Okay. I'll try to be quick because it's been a long day today for y'all. My biggest issue with this is one word, accessibility and inclusion. We use the term accessibility. Well, and we use the word inclusion and inclusive, but this survey and this entire report never went to the Toronto's Accessibility Advisory Committee. The only input that I see in this final report is from the Aboriginal Affairs Committee, which is great. I applaud you for that. What I'm really frustrated about but unfortunately not surprised, is that you completely neglected and discriminated against in excluding us as people with disabilities. These golf courses are great, but did you know that even Scarlet Woods Golf Course is not properly wheelchair accessible? The only walkway from Jane and Eglinton is not even paved and is closed off most of the time. The only other way in from Emmett Avenue is not only a long walk up a hill, there's no sidewalks from, from Eglinton Avenue. In the report, there is zero info about the accessibility issues of court, the accessibility features of courses, including Detonia, which I love, but I want to see the trails reconnected. It is very unsafe when you're walking the trails from Scarborough to downtown Toronto, especially if you're like me in a power wheelchair and or someone with a visual impairment. 
Your golf courses need to have accessibility features and, in and include organizations like the Blind Golfers Association, I don't remember their full name, but include organizations and community people that have disabilities that would love to golf. I would love to golf. I can't. I live 15 minutes away from Scarlet Woods by wheel from my apartment. There are, there are things such as accessible golf carts. You can do loaner manual wheelchairs, beat balls for blind golfers, among many, many, many other things, including mats for the ground that will create accessibility. They're not expensive in most cases. Trail access is a huge barrier and needs deep consideration. It was the top two items of all the survey respondents that I read. That survey excluded less than 2% of that survey were people with incomes with less than $25,000. Well, that kind of makes me wonder if you really did communicate with communities around golf courses, especially Detonia. Teasdale is a very low income neighborhood ECHC buildings and the community as a whole. My community around the Scarlet Woods course, there's a lot of people with disabilities and a lot of low income areas. TTC access from most of the courses is absolute abominable. And it's really frustrating. Talk with blind golfers, wheelchair golfers, and there are and organizations, PGA Canada, Golf Canada and Golf Ontario can definitely get you in touch with them, including Go Talk to Variety Village and Abilities Canada. Also, SCI Ontario and the CNIB, Balance for Blind Adults, AMI Canada. There's all kinds of organizations you should be going to and talking to. Why are you excluding a massive part of the community, much less elderly seniors with disabilities? If you're going to offer something like this to the city, and want and claim to be inclusive and claim to be accessible, then you need to be AODA compliant. Talk is cheap. Walk the walk. I know a lot of you are doing other things than listening to me and focusing on what I'm speaking. That's fine. It's been a long day and some of you have short attention spans. Just know that I support trails. I'm a trail fanatic in my power wheelchair. Most power wheelchairs are, are between four and 800 pounds, much, and much more with people in them. And I just want to tell you, from a trail user and a tree lover and someone who deeply appreciates, thank you, shalom. Hi, Janie. Bye for now. Okay, thank you, Emily. Are there questions for the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next presenter is Yusuf Hussein. I may di I may. Hi. Hi, Yusuf. You have three minutes. Okay. Hi, my name is Yusuf Hussein, and I'm here today because of Progress Toronto. I'm a resident of Toronto. I've been working for years with youth to bring more recreational opportunities and space for youth to have more access to. This has been a huge challenge. <clears throat> And to see that thousands of youth have been overlooked to prioritize space for golf clubs is frustrating. I like to point out that I lived in Toronto all my life and my only experience with golf has been seeing Tiger Woods play on TV. <clears throat> Firstly, golf clubs owned by the city, the cost for a junior club membership for age groups nine to 18 is $353 per person, including tax. According to the city of Toronto website, Junior memberships are designed for youth who know how to play the game of golf and are able to keep up with the pace on the course. But what about drop-ins and youth that don't play golf recreationally? There's no time for that. This is a significant barrier to entry and for the participation of youth in the area. Secondly, the city can utilize the many acres of land available at public owned city golf clubs as a multi-purpose space. The first step is that the city opens up the space to the public my understanding is that the space is not used during the winter months and is left unoccupied, as well as fenced off to the public. The city can open up the club land for community walks, leisure activities as green space is needed with the ongoing pandemic to decompress as everyone doesn't have access to a backyard or large property to walk around. Equitable access to green space is a need, not a want. The city can also use the land space as an indoor soccer field during the winter months. 
There is a great demand for indoor facilities as a dome would be installed and could go up during the winter months, utilizing the space and be taken down during the golf season. This would bring in significant income for the city and utilize available space on the land during the winter months. Thirdly, I have a question for you. How is the golf club property owned by the city going to be more welcoming to marginalized youth, marginalized youth in the Scarborough area? And the city, there is no initiatives to break down the barriers to access for, access for people from diverse communities. In conclusion, the city owned public golf courses are not inclusive and do not represent the diversity of the communities and city. I'm here to ask you directly as the decision makers, what would the city do to make the space more inclusive and open to youth who have financial barriers, while also providing equipment for youth to participate, acknowledging the diverse community where this land and space is in use? As of right now, it only caters to a small minority of individuals who are wealthy and mostly white in comparison to the majority of people who are living in those areas that are diverse. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next deputant is Ray Joshua. Do we have Ray on the line? Okay, I don't think we have Ray on the line. Can I confirm that with IT? Uh, maybe just call again. We thought that he, he was there. Hi, Ray Joshua. Or possibly Ramon. Sorry, it was the name Ramon. Possibly, I, wrote these, yeah. I wrote these ones down late. Um, all right, he may not be, he may not be present. Uh, maybe okay, I had, yeah, I had Ray Joshua on the list here. Okay. Uh, Kevin Thistle with PGA Canada. Really, I prepared some notes, but I think uh, I've been listening intently all day. I know it's a long day for all of you. And and a lot of speakers have really hit me personally and professionally sort of there. I'm, I'm the CEO of the PGA of Canada, so I've been in the golf business all my life. But without the city of Toronto courses, I would absolutely not be in the, the game of golf. Um, even our debutante Donovan, who just spoke, really hit me hard kind of thing. I was born and raised in Scarborough. My parents were both factory workers. We couldn't afford uh, for me to play golf. My parents didn't. Um, I'd hit golf balls at Manhattan Park and Buchanan schools until we got kicked out, of course, and uh, uh, blessed enough to, to play um, uh, D'Antonio Park, which I uh, could get to by subway. Loved it, you know, borrowed some clubs. Also played Tam Shanner, which I get to by bus and the, the you know, the the special treat was to play Don Valley. And, and uh, I, I really feel that, you know, it is a gateway. You have fantastic golf courses. Um, it's a gateway to all of my friends uh, growing up uh, to golf in Ontario and across the country sort of thing. You know, the last few years, I've even gone back and played Humber Valley, Don Valley, and Tama Shanner. Um, with respect to, to some of the, the speakers, you know, like Deputy Fon, uh, Ellen, who said that golf was declining the blip. And uh, Councillor Carroll, thanks for bringing up a couple of the points about the elite. I can let the council know that, that in the late 90s, and early 2000s, too many golf courses were built. So therefore you're hearing about this decline in golf. golf golfers have not declined. We have all the uh, facts I could send you. And a couple other little quick things. Um, we did a national uh, economic report with our partners of Golf Canada, NG Suez, et cetera. And the, the great thing about golf in Canada, there's 5.7 million golfers and it's the highest participation uh, rate of any sport in Canada. It also is the most diversified participation sport to some of our callers questions. And also uh, golf contributes $14.3 billion to the Canadian gross domestic product every year. That's more than every other participation sport combined across the country. We've got these reports, which I don't want to belabor. I, I could send to everyone. It's more, you know, professionally, I'd like to say from the PGA myself, we are so supportive of many alternative uses, such as disc golf, if I may say frisbee golf, um, skating, walking trails, winter golf. Things you're already doing, but we would like to 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 help. And also, you know, Deputy John Yusuf said, you know, where's the free learn to play? I was I used to work at a golf course called Angus Glen. We would go to Jane and Finch Driftwood Community Center. We would send our pros in and we'd teach golf for free. I got lots of success stories, but I don't want to be over my time allotment. And also. We would like to, with our partners, offer up free learn to play programs. 
amazing. Um, I love John Campbell's idea of free clubs for beginners of city courses between ourselves and our partners, Golf Canada, Golf Ontario, uh, PG of Ontario, we could actually supply those clubs. I know we could. Uh, a couple of people said some great things. You know, in closing, um, you know, you've got fantastic golf courses. I, I believe I read the report many times. You know, it makes some good points. It may be lacking in some things. I really feel professionally and personally, you need a long-term strategy. I think it's very important, very needed. If I can offer my personal assistance, the PG of Canada assistance, um, if that would be of interest, we'd love that. But just going back to your courses, you know, I deal with, you know, para golf. I deal with new Canadians, juniors, seniors, persons of all abilities, which is very important to me. Uh, your golf courses are doing a great job. And I just want to say that I think the most important thing going forward is to get a long-term strategy. And thanks for, for listening to me. I really appreciate it. And I wouldn't be where I am today without the City of Toronto courses. I mean, that's sincerely. Thank you for your deputation. Uh, you have a question from Councillor Carroll. Thank you. Hi, Kevin. It's uh, uh, Shelley here. Um, I had not heard your your background before. You you you're now the CEO of the PGA. You have a, a you know a C-suite executive position. But um, it, so golf is really an employment pathway for you. Would you have even gone to post secondary if you didn't see that you had a potential career here? No, I think I think it, it, it played a great part in my life. Um, you know, I was uh, probably 12, 13 when I first played. I I got a job when I was 15 at Seton Golf Club in Pickering. And uh, and then I went to, you know, I went to University of Toronto and I turned pro. I've actually been a golf pro for 38 years, although I'm more of an administrator. I'm more of a business person. Um, I've been a pro 38 years. And I actually turned pro when I was in university um, just because of my love of the game and and. I wouldn't have done that without D'Antonio Park and Tamashaner and Humber Valley, et cetera. It's, uh, and there's a lot of stories like mine. I mean, I get to, I get to chat. Well, your story is very similar to your, your predecessor who just happens to be my brother-in-law. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Steve started the same way, just climbing yes. over the fence and getting an after-school job in golf. I love Steve. Yeah, Steve's a great <laughs> man, yeah. Yeah, so, so it, it, this is not only a, a recreation opportunity it's a career path for a, a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't see a career path um that, that gets you to the heights you've gotten to i agree and and one thing i didn't say about the economic study and and one of the deputants was very good in saying about the students in the golf uh -huh. industry 37 percent of all employees are students high school university so the great thing is golf tries to give back wherever they can i think it's i think it's a great uh, thing for youth also to get into Thank you for that point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, question, additional questions for the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next deputant is Jim Pierce. We have Jim on the line. Hello. Hi, yes, Jim. I you am. have three minutes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I really didn't expect to be heard today. I just found out about this this morning. Um, I have been listening to a few of the people. I like the, um, I, I'm a golf fan. Um, I started playing in D'Antonia shortly after it opened. Before that, uh, if we wanted to golf, I live in the beach area, we had to take a bus all the way north to Steeles and then hitchhike a ride to some two-bit little course. Well, D'Antonia opened, and my Lord, you know, for really a decent price, it, it, it isn't expensive. I mean, when someone comes on and says, oh, we're the marginalized, I can't play there. And it's like, I've never seen anyone sent away because they're the wrong color or anything like that. I, I don't understand that argument. Um, it was never, you know, that's so weird in this town to even bring that up. And um, a, a lot of the people with their buzzwords and their you know, all quality index and all that. None of this makes sense. It's a beautiful golf course. That's what it is. That's what it's always been. And we need it. it to, to ruin this golf course is to ruin more than just simply a place for the rich white to hang out. Please stop those things. It's ridiculous. Um, it, it's unique, this course. There is nothing like it in this city. And in many places, I have to drive for 45 minutes to an hour 
to go to a large golf course if I want out of town, or I can drive seven minutes to Dentonia for a beautiful two, two and a half hour walk. It's wonderful. If, if I thought that the tens of thousands of people would descend upon Dentonia Park to walk it, perhaps that might be something. I sincerely doubt it. This town is filled with ravines to walk. You can go northeast, northwest, north. Every... There is a small break in it from here to there, but there are places in town where you can't get to any green spaces unless you go for 25 minutes. So, you know, it is what it is. Please enjoy it for what it is, people. Learn to play golf. Have fun. Anyway, that's it from me. Uh, question of the deficit, uh, Councillor Layton. This may be more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Um, I would just suggest that in the future, particularly when individuals from different perspectives are advancing their ideas around race and inclusion, that yes. we don't just discount them out of hand. Um, because I'm not what you feel, out of just, hand. If I, I just, may, if I may, sir. Yes, yeah, sorry. What, what, sorry. What you feel when you yeah. go to these spaces because of where you come from, might be different than those who experience it differently because of the color of their skin or their background. So I would just caution you, like that doesn't change yeah. my position on this and I'm not expecting mm -hmm. you to respond. I would just caution you that we shouldn't discount those perspectives so easily and quickly because we haven't lived them. Yeah, I hear you. Sorry, Madam okay. Chair, just on a point of order that, that, that I mean, now you allowed that, but I mean, it's been going both ways really. So I think that we should just move on with the deputations. There have been a lot of people that have been showing disregarding a lot of the comments of a lot of people that I would say on the pro golfing side. And, and it, 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 that's not appropriate either. So there has to be a little balance here. And I, on, on I'm going to say, that, point of I'm personal, gonna say that we should get on with it. On, on a point of personal privilege, I wasn't, it, 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 the, the deputants that he was referring to weren't discounting the position. They were advancing alternative ones. I was just simply cautioning mm. from one individual to another that we can't simply one, one should not simply discount the perspective because we didn't feel that way and there have been a number of occasions and 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 i'm sure we could there i'm sure there's journals and books written about it, about this of where golf courses weren't welcoming for people from different backgrounds uh across our and i know it was across our city because i know our mayor was indeed a member of one of those golf courses and his father i believe uh, ended up changing that policy at that very golf okay. course I that think, he was a member. So, I right. think but, but this is Dentonia we're, City we're owned. We're talking off, about off now. I, okay. I think the original point uh, in the yeah. deputant did acknowledge the point from Councillor Layton. So, thank you for that, yeah. and all parties. So, yeah. um, any additional questions for the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, our next deputant is Aaron Davis Rotman. Hello, I'm a 29 year old East Yorker. Hi, Aaron, with a planning you have two degree. minutes. Okay. I'm a 29 year old East Yorker with a planning degree who plays golf at Dentonia. I'm also a poor public speaker, so please bear with me. I hit a golf ball for the first time at Dentonia when I was six years old at a city run golf camp. I played tennis at Dentonia Park Tennis Camp, and I swam at Crescent Town Swim Club. I don't swim or play tennis anymore. But I picked golf up again two years ago when the pandemic began. When I heard Dentonia could be on the chopping block or could be reduced to nine holes, I raked my brain for what makes it special. And uh, here's what I've come up with. There are many things that make a golf course special. Sometimes it's the facilities, the clubhouse, the events. Sometimes it's the view. Sometimes it's the difficulty. But for Dentonia, what makes it extremely special is its unique location accessibility by transit, and its role for who it serves, its accessibility by cost and skill. Its location is directly attached to the TTC. This is quite possibly the only golf course adjacent to or attached to a subway station in Canada, to the best of my knowledge. Getting rid of this unique opportunity to allow access to golf facilities while the sport is rapidly growing is plain and simple a terrible idea. It's an attack on golf recreational facilities in this city, and it is the most accessible course by and far in Toronto. It, it, it's 
preventing future, the future of golf, and it's preventing people who typically don't have access, access by TDC to golf. Also, I mentioned accessibility by cost and skill. By getting rid of the easy and inexpensive golf courses in our city, you're sidelining the future golfers, middle and lower income golfers, as well as potentially BIPOC golfers. Out of all the courses I regular, regularly visit in the summer season, Dentonia is by far the most diverse. And by getting rid of Dentonia, you're reassuring your predetermined belief that golfers are actually white middle-class men. When in fact, you are incorrect. Um, it, 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 it's really keeping this golf course, this city facility is, is, uh, is helping out a lot of people to learn the sport. And I think it's great. So that's what I have to say. Uh, thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, we're just going to do a last call for folks that were called earlier um, and uh, may have had connection issues. So, uh, Elizabeth Smithville. Hi there. Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for joining. You have three minutes. Great, thanks. Hi there, my name is Elizabeth Smicko, and I'm an East York resident where I've lived in East York for the past seven or so years. I'm a regular golfer and I've come to rely on the Toronto golf courses since moving into the city if I wanna get out and play. I've golfed at D'Antonia, Tam O'Shanter, and Don Valley. Other than Centennial, where the green fees are actually comparable to other Toronto golf courses and is leased out by the city, these are the only golf courses I've golfed at in Toronto, given there is nowhere else to play in the city. The Toronto golf courses provide the opportunity for me to first of all, get out and play nearby, especially after a day of sitting and looking at a screen. And second, allow me to play financially as golf is a very expensive sport. The exercise, connectivity with the community as I join the ladies league at D'Antonia an ability to be outside contributes to my overall mental and physical health. During COVID, it has become extremely difficult to get any tee times at any of the Toronto golf courses. I've had to wake up as early as 5.30 in the morning on a Monday to try to get a tee time for the following Saturday. It's now nearly impossible to get a tee time on a weekend, which is usually when I can get out and play given a round of 18 holes can take anywhere from four, four hours, three to four hours, depending on which course you play. As you likely know, golf has been one of the only, one of the only safe sports you can play during COVID. At a time when I am isolated and working at home all day and, in, and am limited in the exercise I'm able to do, I have come to rely on the sport of golf even more. The Toronto golf courses increase access to the sport given they are not only courses really in Toronto, given that they are the only courses that are really in Toronto, provide affordable green fee rates and are close to public transit routes. Coming from York region, where there are many more courses, you still have to have a vehicle to get to any of them. I would not be able to play this sport if it were not for the Toronto golf courses. Please consider these courses to be as important if not more, as any other recreation facility in any neighborhood. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you uh, for your deputation. Are there any questions for the deputant? Okay, uh, the next deputant is Ryan Logan with Golf Canada. Ryan, are you online? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you, you have three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the committee members and also to Council for allowing me to speak on this item. And uh, also thanks for accommodating my earlier scheduling conflict. So once again, my name is Ryan Logan. I'm the Director of Golf Services for Golf Canada. And for those unaware, Golf Canada is the national sports organization for the sport of golf in Canada. And our mission is quite simply to grow participation and excellence in golf across Canada. At the onset of my remarks, I do want to state that we at Golf Canada are generally supportive of the recommendations made in the staff report and are hopeful to be directly involved in the long-term planning to help create more opportunities for Toronto residents to engage with the game of golf. Though why I'm here in front of you today is to reinforce the message that has been presented in earlier deputations, and that is that these facilities play an absolutely critical role in creating a vital pathway for people to be exposed to the game and ultimately fall in love with the sport. 
I wouldn't be in my current position if it wasn't for the City of Toronto facilities, and I've been now working in the golf industry for the past 25 years. These facilities in particular has played such an important role, not only in my career, but in my life. Uh, to give you a bit of background about myself, I was born at Toronto General Hospital. I was raised in Etobicoke before moving to Mississauga in my later years. I didn't grow up with a lot of money and my dad supplemented our family's income by working two jobs to keep me registered in hockey through the winter and playing golf in the summer months. And we never had the opportunity to belong to a country club. And my first exposure to the game was through these facilities along with Lakeview Golf Club in Mississauga. My first experience playing competitive golf was at the City of Toronto's Junior Golf Championships at Humber Valley and Don Valley Golf Clubs. Just a quick shout out to Dave Richardson. I made lifelong friends, a deep connection with the sport, and most importantly, I fell in love with the game playing these five city facilities. In my current role at Golf Canada, I have the benefit of engaging with a number of different facilities and seeing firsthand a wide range of operational models across the country. And I often think about my experience playing these five city golf courses and the potential that each of them have to better serve the communities they represent. Golf Canada staff have directly engaged with the city over the past few years, specifically our work with Gore Mitrevsky and his team, along with various city staff and industry stakeholders. And we're certainly proud of the steps that we've taken together to create a more welcome and inclusive atmosphere for residents in the city. A byproduct of the work that has been done and the relationship that has been built is manifested through the execution of our inaugural, excuse me, inaugural All Abilities Championship, which is a competition which featured golfers that had various physical and cognitive disabilities. And we're talking about athletes that might have experienced limb loss or suffered through PTSD after serving our country abroad. Um, and for us at Golf Canada to hold our first ever competition at a facility that I grew up playing uh, has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my professional career. Um, I was also so proud of our Golf Canada team to donate a solar, solo rider golf cart, which is a piece of adaptive golf equipment, which will benefit golfers with a disability for many years to come. In addition to the All Abilities Championship, uh, Humber Valley also served as a backdrop to announce our newest program uh, to grow the game of golf, and that is the RBC Community Junior Golf Program. This is a program with tangible funding to create golfers from traditionally underserved and underrepresented communities. And our goal with this program is to create golfers from a diverse pool of backgrounds and we're hopeful to create a formal partnership with the City of Toronto to create a pathway for equity seeking groups to expand the role that golf plays within the community, hopefully beginning in 2022. Uh, our work with the City of Toronto also extends itself into a fulsome proposal that has been created as an attempt to help collate all the different ways that we can support the city and its mission to serve a great city and its people. The team at Golf Canada has reviewed the staff report in great detail. And again, we're very supportive of the message that weaves its way through the document and that is that these five golf facilities for the City of Toronto need to be a welcoming, affordable, and accessible venue for people to engage with the sport of golf. And if the pan pandemic has taught us anything at Golf Canada, it's that golf is the sport of now. It is imperative that all these facilities consider this once in a generation opportunity to expand their reach and bring everyone together on the golf course. And also, golf is the sport of a lifetime. It's the only sport that I can think of where I can play with my now 74 year old father and my three and a half year old daughter. It's a special game in that way and it's time to treat it as just that, a really special and healthy family activity that connects the fabric of our communities. And in closing, we at Golf Canada are recommending the creation of a constituent led working group or steering committee or advisory board that uh, Malcolm Bromley alluded to, to help guide the long-term direction of these facilities. So once again, we at Golf Canada view these municipal facilities as critical pathways for learn to, to learn the game to play and to fall in love with the sport. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our last deputant that we have on the line is ML Boychuk, who we had audio issues with earlier. Hopefully we can connect them. Hello. Hi, thank you. And thank you for joining us despite those technical issues earlier. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to all of you for hanging in here this long. Um, also, thank you to Janie Romoff and her team for the recommendations that have been put forward. I support all of them in, uh, in general. Uh, I am a senior golfer, 74 years old. I play and volunteer at Tamushanter Golf Course. And I'd like to present some of the perspectives uh, from my experience there. Uh, number one, Tamil Shanter is very well used. Uh, during the middle of summer, you'll have 250 players uh, a day. Uh, I would not, not like to see uh, them deprived of the opportunity of this wonderful sport. Also, uh, I'm part of the baby boomer generation. Uh, we're 58 to 76 years old. Uh, 
uh, we're going to be around, hopefully, for many more years. I think the clientele of seniors in the years to come is going to be uh, keeping all golf courses in Toronto very busy. Uh, I, I volunteer uh, at the golf course uh, as a starter and as a marshal or uh, player's assist for seven years. Uh, that's my way of contributing to making golf affordable for everybody in the city. And sometimes we don't get as much respect as I think uh, would be nice uh, for the 20 people or so that are uh, volunteers at the Tamish Hunter Golf Course. I believe uh, it would be good to have a practice area uh, to do more to uh, make it uh, approachable for more people. And uh, so I, one of the key things that we're missing are more opportunities of, for going to a driving range. And if there was some way that we could carve out a space for more driving ranges in the city, that would be very helpful. I appreciate all the perspectives people have brought in today. And uh, I, in my observations at Tamil Shanter, uh, we have a high percentage of seniors playing, especially they're available to play during the week. Uh, uh, the Asian uh, participation has been very high too. And that's wonderful. I do believe we would need to do some special promotions to bring in more people that are perhaps uh, by a black background and other uh, groups, uh, also for the indigenous uh, people to be engaged. And uh, I like the opportunity that's being uh, proposed uh, that indigenous people would be uh, contractors uh, for some of these golf courses. Uh, that would also make it easier to make uh, the indigenous placeholder in our courses uh, more so. Uh, trail continuity is there, we just need better signage. Uh, and uh, winter sports, uh, I've done skiing and snowshoeing at Tamil Shanter. Uh, Frisbee golf would be a nice addition for the winter. And I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks for all of you. Thank you for your deputation hanging in there to the end. Questions of the deputant, Councillor Fletcher. Question. I thank you very much. You're right on top of things there, Tamashanter. And uh, did I hear you say you have frisbee golf and you already have trails and ski trails, etc., for the winter, or or you'd like that? I didn't quite catch it. Uh, I think uh, having Frisbee uh, there uh, in the winter would be nice, uh, would be great, uh, because uh, I've skied there and snowshoed. Uh, that has been available, but uh, we don't have enough snow all the time. And so as soon as the golf season is over, uh, Frisbee golf uh, in these places would be wonderful. Thank you. Great suggestion. Thank you. Great. Um... Any additional questions of the applicant? Sorry, deputant. Okay, seeing none, we will move to questions of staff. Uh, outside councillors first. So we have Councillor Holiday, Councillor Carroll, and then Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Holiday, and then sorry, we'll add Bradford to the end as well. So Holiday, Carroll, Fletcher, Bradford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wonder if the staff could talk a little bit about what the future vision may be for Dentonia. The, the report didn't go that deep into it, um, but it did talk about master planning. And I wondered if you could add a little bit of comment to that. Uh, Janie, you appear to be muted. Am I muted now? No, you, we can hear you now. Jean. Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, so thanks, Councillor Holiday, for the question and through you, Madam Chair. Uh, the recommendations regarding Dentonia actually allow for the 18 or recommend for the 18 hole golf course to remain as is for the next five years uh, while we undertake a master plan. So what would be in that master plan is still up for discussion. And would really be the basis for community input and and further consideration. And we've heard through the consultations all kinds of options, but we really have not had a chance to really look at what would be implementable 
and the costs associated with those. So uh, certainly all of those considerations would have had to come back to City Council for approval. Would it be fair to say that it could very likely be less than 18 holes um, and change to something else? Is that a fair read into what that means? Through the through the speaker, yes, that's correct. That 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 was part of the recommendation was to look at uh, potentially as an alternative use uh, within that master plan, considering uh, uh, you know as as an example a nine hole course. But it also the report also outlines that those discussions would take place with whoever the vendor is once uh, this NRFP has been issued, and it would be in consultation with whoever that contractor uh, is. Thank you. Uh, now, it's just a little different subject line of questions. Looking at the materials that were um, published, could you tell me a little bit more about how the city went through the models? And you know, I, I was I was intrigued. I didn't quite understand the analysis about, you know, could we could we move golf, you know, into a fully outsourced model? Certainly, and uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, this was a, a big part of the analysis that was done, and the report. And the uh, Ernst and Young attachment around the review uh, does outline a lot, a lot of those options. Uh, there's basically a number of options out there in the golf world, and these are not things we're making up. They're things that have been implemented, you know, variably uh, across the country and probably across the world. Uh, there is an option of a fully leased out uh, uh, property, and and as noted in in some of the deputants, uh, Royal Woodbine and the Centennial Golf Courses are examples of that in Toronto, where the uh, contractor or the leasee pays a fee to the city based on, uh, you know, a, a contractual agreement around what that fee will be, and all of the uh, operations are then provided by the leasee, including food and beverage, bookings, uh, and they set the fees. Uh, there is what we have now, which we call uh, a hybrid model uh, for the city of five city of Toronto golf courses, which is the turf operations are done by city staff. It's it's focused on where our areas of expertise are, and we believe that we have an expertise in turf maintenance. The fees and the annual fees are approved annually by city council, so the city maintains control of the fees that are charged, while the food and beverage pro shop and booking systems are then contracted out in this case to two separate contractors, one for food and beverage and one for uh, pro shop and, and tea bookings and, and that piece of it. Then the report outlines what we're calling an enhanced hybrid model, which would potentially in a negotiated RFP process, look at a single op while the city would maintain the turf operations. We would look at potentially combining both the food and beverage and the, uh, and the um, operational pieces around the tea time bookings and the pro shops into one contract to really enhance the customer service at the course and, and have a better golfing experience. Okay, and so from the city or the taxpayer's perspective, what do we contribute? You told me that we we do the, I think you call it turf maintenance, but what what does that cost the city and hence the taxpayer and how does that weigh against any revenues that we bring in for the golf courses? And what I'm getting at, you know, what's the net net? Are we or taxpayers subsidizing um, golf in, in any manner in the city or is it all a wash or do we turn a profit? I mean, I don't know. I, the report, I don't think had those financials in it. Even there, if it's an empirical comment, I, I'd appreciate it. So, I, I mean, quite broadly, obviously, the, the there are some financials in the report. I'm just looking for my briefing note on the financial pieces of it. But the, the report outlines that um, uh, you know, as as noted, there has been a revenue target that is associated with golf courses, and for many many years, uh, you know, I, I would say from 2014 uh, to 20 or 2013 to 2019, uh, the city was enabled to uh, to achieve those revenue targets, and that was a direct result of reduced play in the golf courses, and as some have described, some changing trends in the golf industry. Uh, what we have seen now uh, in the last two years, certainly 2020 and 2021 now, or we're just wrapping up that year, is an enhanced interest in golf and almost full usership at all of these golf courses to the extent that, as many have indicated, not many tee times uh, are available. And the courses have actually uh, exceeded the revenue that has been uh, uh, projected. Uh, we do aim to try and direct, you know, recover the direct operating costs as some as some have outlined, uh, and and just like any other service, uh, that all depends on the usage of the courses. So quite quite directly, if if the rounds of play 
are reduced, then our ability to recover some of that revenue is reduced as well. So, so you'll see the trend go up and down as with many of our other, uh, you know, recreational activities as well. I hope that answered your question. That's over time too, so hopefully it did answer it. Uh, Councillor Carroll. Hi. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so Jenny, you can you can tell from all the deputations today that the big controversy is around Dantonia, and and I'm I'm a little uh, I'm a little confused, and I and I think most of the uh, people who came to speak are as well. In the recommendations, it it doesn't really it talks about doing a master plan for Dantonia, but it's not prescriptive. But in the body of the report, it looks like this master plan exercise has already decided it's a nine hole course. So. Is that is that door closed or not? Through, through the speaker, there is there is no closed door at, at this point. There was through the analysis around alternative use. We were asked to look at what some alternative uses could be on some golf courses. So through that process, we looked at you know the usage of all the golf courses as well as the topography and the geography of them to see what would actually support alternative use. Uh, the, the actual topography of, of Dentonia, because it, it has some table lands and it has some ability to sort of remaneuver some of those spaces, uh, there is a potential that it could be turned into uh, logistically and geographically based a nine hole course uh, with some practice facilities, driving ranges, there's all kinds of other things while also enhancing some of the parkland. But the idea around the recommendation was to continue, as I said, for five years, uh, again, knowing that the golf trends right now are quite high uh, and, and give the trends uh, at least a few more years to stabilize to see if that's still this participation that we're seeing for many, many years. And, and I think that would be part of the consideration around looking at some of the alternative uses. So in that master plan exercise, could we get a, we don't, we don't really know because we, what we have is an executive summary of the work that ENY did, but but where it says we have industry and market analysis, it really looks like it's just an industry conversation about um, what what a tender would look like. And uh, could they see the facility before they bid? It, it doesn't say, here's what's going on in the world of golf. If we do a master planning exercise, that I, I know you heard I was a broken record today, but there are nine um, uh, recently developed 12 whole courses now in the country for good reason. There are, they're, they're, they number in the 30s now in the United States. Jack Nicholas has even created them. And uh, they seem to be a draw. Um, younger golfers, and that's, you know, the growth of any sport is what new generations are coming in, seem to be attracted to these. Is, is there any way of looking at that for Dentonia? So that we're looking at, at, at something other than just we're going from 18 to nine and we're done. So, so th through the speakers, the answer, you know, is, is yes. I think all of those things, if, if there is, if council supports uh, the recommendation to look at some alternative uses of at Bentonia, those are all possibilities. I don't think there is a predetermined outcome to that, but there is a discussion certainly around if we were looking at alternative uses at Bentonia, uh, that to, to, to achieve that, we would have to reconfigure the land and it would yeah. likely not be able to support an 18 hole course. So whether right. it's going from 18 holes to 12 holes to nine holes, I think what we heard today was a, you know, a very, a very loud uh, uh, chorus that 18 holes uh, is, is a preference. Right. And I just have one other question, Madam Matt, uh, Speaker. The other thing that in the base recommendations that seems kind of light, because um, I know there's a price tag attached, but um, there is referenced in the ENY report. There is a lot of potential for connecting of trails, uh, for improving of green spaces, and where the alternate uses are going on without changing the courses at all. There is some potential for that, and yet I don't see a, an energetic recommendation about that. Is that simply a budgetary concern, or, or that's coming in a subsequent report? So through the speaker, these are considerations um, that we fully support, uh, integrating as much as we can the trail connections, the connections to the ravine strategy and some other items as you've outlined. Uh, those items become part of our capital planning process and will uh, be submitted uh, with them. Some of them are actually part of the ravine strategy and encompassed in, 
in, in that strategy and others uh, will be new opportunities that will be identified. As they're identified, we will be incorporating them into the capital budget for consideration along with all of the other city priorities. But council will have to keep an eye on them and direct some of them. <laughs> okay. Certainly they will be before council as, uh, as part of uh, our ongoing sort of financial planning processes. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, Councillor Fletcher is next, followed by Councillor Bradford. Uh, thanks very much. I'm just going to lay out some of the questions that I'm going to want uh, answered and some commitments. I'm wondering if, uh, Ms. Romoff, we could get a commitment from you on a su supplemental information on the two leased golf courses, what the revenues are for those leased golf courses, um, what the leases are, what uh, what the costs to play are, just a kind of a little briefing note for council on those. Yeah. Through, through and speaker size directly to and council, everything we'd, else because yeah, we'd be happy, we happy may to decide to, yeah. And um, how much they pay in leases, et cetera, et cetera. Let's project their revenues, if you don't mind, please, as well, based on that. We should know everything about all seven. Yeah, not not a problem. We five. can put that together. Thank you very much. Quickly. You mentioned that revenue targets, that there was a revenue target associated with the golf courses. I don't believe there is a revenue target. In other words, they're supposed to break even. Is that not correct? That's the, I mean, in the, in the model that we have that that's, you know, as, as some of the deputants uh, also said, we strive to try and break even with our direct but operating that, costs, not our direct op indirect operating costs. That is our requirement. That's their requirement, which is why they keep showing up that they're not making money. If I was to ask you to bring in all of the arenas and uh, how much revenue they have compared to how much the operating costs are and how much the city subsidizes those arenas, would it look something like this as well? With the I haven't done that comparison uh, through the speaker, Councillor Fletcher, so I'd have to take some time and have a look at that. I, I think there would be some, you know, some anomalies in those systems. I think that, you know, when we talk about the golf courses and the, and the fees with the golf courses, because, you know, what we're really talking about is, is the fees when it comes to meeting, you know, revenue projections and, and other components of it. We, we set those fees, you know, after a, a sort of analysis yep. of, of local golf, and there's a number of different categories in them. Okay. So as we do with arenas as well, right? So there are we get, components I, of that. Yeah. I'd really that like would. to hear, I'd like to know about the revenue targets for arenas as far as their break-evens are concerned, because I understand that they do get subsidized for any expenditures over a certain amount of money the city pays directly. So we should compare apples to apples in recreation. I think it'll be very helpful for me and other counselors to understand the situation with all of our facilities. And these courses technically, I hope you would agree, are a city facility. They are. And um, so just to clarify, because we did have this conversation that there's some, I don't wanna call it a covenant, but there's either an understanding or a requirement that we project for the revenues based on the operating costs. And then council hears the report that golf courses have made it or not made it. Am I right in how I'm describing that? Well, through the speaker, I mean, golf courses are a budget item and a line item within the PFNR budget and, and they're incorporated into our annual uh, reporting out on variances and, and other things. In some areas, you know, the budget is, is is right on track in other areas there's variances either positive or negative so golf is, right. is part of is part of that general reporting out uh and you know as as noted uh, the pfnr budget in total is not a cost recovery budget by far it is you know approximately two-thirds uh subsidized through uh you know public funding right so the same thing with the golf courses if we were to see uh if we were to pull out arenas rinks um community centers and say are you meeting your revenue targets in order not to be, uh, or or you won't be subsidized, or we'll have to cut you in half, or something along those lines? We might get interesting information from that as well. I'm not proposing I, we do that, but okay. I do feel I, that. I was going to say it would be a very lengthy analysis, but it, it would be. It would, it would. There would. There would be different. Different. Uh, certain different cost recovery in some of those things right. for sure. Yeah. But golf courses are in a different category than other recreational facilities. Would you agree with me when I say that? Uh, to, to, the, to the speaker and with respect, I, I think in some cases, yes. And in some cases, no, as an example, our, our instructional programming, we, we strive to recover our direct operating costs through instructional programming as well. Uh, uh, and then, you know, offset 
uh, affordability with things like welcome policy and free centers and other things. So there's there's different approaches, um, but there are some areas where we do strive to have cost recovery as well. I guess just looking at big pieces like arenas, however many we have, they are run by boards and also rinks across the city. If we were to look at the cost of running all these rinks we have now and any cost recovery associated with it through sports and leagues, that would be that would be a very interesting number. I don't know if you could provide I, I don't, that or speaker, not. I don't know. I, I, I can't provide those numbers. I think the easiest thing to look at would be the arena board operating statements, which are, uh, you know, um, which are reported Probably. to council yeah. every year. So I can have a look at those if helpful. And would you be able to put in the subsidies that the city gives to each arena board as well, please? I I, uh, I I can work with the city manager's office on that. The, the city manager's office actually has um, has the accountability around arena boards. So, okay. If so directed, I'm happy to do that. What I really want is the uh, other golf courses, just to see if we we have a couple of cash cows sitting there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, That's, Chair. Thank you. That's time on questions. Councilor Bradford. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, questions for staff. Uh, I'm just going to blast through a couple of these here. Uh, what are the current fees uh, for junior golfers, youth golfers at D'Antonio Golf Club? Just getting that page. Give me one second. Uh, okay, so uh, there's three uh, different I'll, sort I'll of. Say that, let, let's say if you if easiest access, most affordable, uh, yep. youth can get onto the course for eighteen dollars and eighty cents or so. Twenty twenty one right. fees. So I'll, I'll give the, uh, the 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 ranges on the eighteen hole course. So. Uh, junior ranges, uh, average, uh, um, as somebody noted, the junior golf membership is $350, which is unlimited play. Uh, right. But so play gonna, once, that's, a, that's okay. I'm going to move through my questions. Um, the, 30, the point 30, is, did Tony the most $19 the for you. Toronto? Right. They are. They are. There's okay. no question. And do we do, when we're doing our pricing structure for golf courses, is this is this based on cost recovery? Is it a market sounding market analysis? Is it from a recreation lens of providing affordable and accessible recreation amenities in the city of Toronto? How do you arrive at that pricing structure? To the speaker, it's all those things, Councillor. Uh, we do do a market sounding. We try to maintain our affordability and access, uh, as well as trying to meet our direct operating costs. Despite golf often being positioned as, as sort of an elitist activity, uh, would, would it be fair to say that prices in, in the city of Toronto are, are among the, the most affordable and accessible, certainly in the, in the GTA, in the Ontario context? Through the speaker, I, I, can, I can say with confidence that prices for city of Toronto golf courses are amongst the most affordable within the GTA, for sure. Okay. I also took a trip out to Dentonia, uh, not far from where I live Thursday night, did a walk around on the course, just walked right on uh, in the evening after we put our baby down and uh, noticed it's pretty hilly. Um, a lot of the topography of our courses uh, are located within our existing ravine system. Is that correct? That's correct. So when I look at some of the commentary and the questions and the correspondence that we've had, uh, the suggestion that it, it's easy to transform these spaces into something else, other sorts of fields and facilities, uh, other types of pitches, housing. Uh, is it safe to say that that's not something that we can just snap our fingers and do when you're dealing to with the speaker? Uh, that, that would be accurate. Very, very few opportunities for those types of, of facility development within the ravine lands where many of the golf courses are situated. A lot of folks have suggested that we should be building housing on our golf courses um, and 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 through the ravines. Now, I know that not all of the lands are ravine lands. I know that they're not all in the floodplain, but has this ever been explored or looked at before? So to the speaker, no, we've never been directed to look at housing on golf courses, as noted in the report. Uh, and as you've just noted, the, the golf courses that are on ravine lands are, are and, and floodplain are protected under a number of different bylaws. And the golf courses themselves are, are zoned as parkland. Uh, and, um, you know, parkland is not uh, subject to housing development either. So to, to go forward with those things, we would have to do a whole lot more analysis around where there are, yeah. if any, opportunity for housing also, on the golf courses. You, you might not be aware of this, but there was a study done on Victoria Park Station as well, where that was actually looked at with the TTC as part of the housing now site 777 Victoria Park immediately to the south of the site as well. Uh, have you seen that study? Uh, through the speaker, no, I'm sorry, Councillor, okay. I haven't. That's okay. Um, I, I want to move through a couple other pieces. Um, 
we talk about the alternative uses on golf courses and the consultant report identifies that there's actually a multitude of activities that take place on these sites all year round. Uh, again, when I was out there Thursday night, I saw evidence of snowshoeing, cross country skiing, tobogganing, disc golf, uh, different activities. The consultant makes the point that we ought to be doing a better job in communicating the activities that are available. Uh, have we thought about what that might look like? So for the, for the speaker, it's a great, it's a great comment from the, from the consultant. As, as many know, we have enhanced the usage of golf courses in the winter, uh, especially during uh, the, the pandemic, just because of the access to green space that people have been requesting. And a lot of the things have just started in the last uh, year. This is just our second year into winter access for snowshoeing and things like that. So uh, it's a comment that we're taking seriously and we'll certainly be looking at the marketing and communications around how we make people know that those opportunities are available. Is it fair to say that the conclusions and the recommendations that were achieved in this report or concluded were based on the, the community engagement piece articulated here? Uh, to the speaker, I, I, I think it's fair to say that we really did try to achieve a balance in all of the feedback that we received through the community engagement process okay. uh, in the recommendations that went forward. And I, there is an actual, a, a, a fairly lengthy uh, appendix on the community consultation attached to this report. How many times did we go out to Dentonia Golf Course to talk to the users of the golf course? Many of the folks that we heard on the call to the, today. How many times did we go out and actually talk to the people who are using the golf course? Th through the speaker, I, I have some of the general information, but I'm going to ask uh, staff to answer on that if I can. Anne Marie, maybe. Specifically in person, how many times? There was prolific use of the golf course this year and last year, uh, 30,000 rounds played at Dentonia. How many times did we go out and talk to those people playing at Dentonia? And that's your last like question. It versus an online meeting or? Uh, the sort of majority of the consultation was done online, but we do have staff that were involved through operations at Dentonia and they did bring their, um, their, it, their input in terms of the use of the course and also the use of the course itself spoke volumes in terms of the uptick during COVID. But we didn't actually, just to clarify, we didn't actually go to the golf course and talk to any of the people playing golf. We didn't do that. We didn't go to the communities around the golf courses either. We we okay. did uh, a web based engagement as as we've been doing for all of our projects. Okay, I'm out of time. Yes, thank <laughs> but thank you. Um, additional outside counselors. I think that's it. So inside counselors, questions of staff, Councillor Layton. Yeah, just to to continue on that last point from Councillor Bradford, I. Are we doing any in person consultation currently? To the speaker, we're not. All of our consultation right now is being done virtually as a result of, of the, the regulations around COVID. I think that's true of much of the city's consultation right now. Okay. And how was the how was the survey advertised? To the speaker, I'm gonna ask Anne Marie to, to Anne Marie. Um advertised, uh, we do we generally go through social media. We do also do targeted Facebook advertising and there was a, a, a larger um, social media and other mechanisms pushed. And then also we had about 7,000 uh, surveys response and the majority of the respondents were golfers uh, around that. Um, I, I self-identified as golfers. Do, do we have any uh, understanding about where they golf? Do we know if they golfed on city courses or in the past? Were they, did, was D'Antonio one of them? Um, I'd have to check in. I don't know that offhand and I don't want to use your time searching, okay. um, but I can get back to you um, after the meeting, Councillor. Okay, thank you. And then may, like, maybe we can just save that for Council. I, 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 sure. The, so the, the, the project is back to you, uh, Janie. The project outline, uh, the project, the report outlines sort of a series of social objectives that came actually mostly from Councillor Gary Crawford's motion at Council, if I remember correctly, um, look that, that, to look at kind of co-benefits of, of, of these spaces, um, of, of the golf courses. So the, the plan was the, the, the report recommendation four directly links sort of those objectives to the, this master planning process. But as we, as we go out for the RFPs and are talking with our partners that are running the courses, what is the, um, like, what role do those social objectives play in our dialogue with how we program them, how we program them off, 
like in the mm -hmm. in the winter, for instance. So through the speaker, I mean, yeah, these are all goals that we would be building into the specifications of this negotiated RFP. And the intention is to certainly partner or have some of the, the operators provide some of those services as has been outlined in the report. But there's also many things that the city will be doing on its own, whether it's partnerships with Gulf Canada or other things. And much of the winter access remains and the off season access remains with the city. So there are roles for everybody in how this uh, strategy will be delivered once the NRFP is awarded. Is it safe to say that we're like, we've already undertaken some steps to open up these courses for more uses in the, in the last like 24 months or is that safe to say there's more trails, there's more disc golf activity, there's more dog walking, yada, yada, yada. Absolutely we have. And, and the, and the public has, has responded quite well, uh, considering it's a new activity on golf courses, especially in the off season. And we're seeing increased use, uh, all the time. And uh, it's a very positive use. Uh, especially when when the golf courses are closed. So the the, the concerns that were brought forward at the, at the sort of outset of this process and, and the opportunities, like we've realized some of those along the way. Through the speaker, I, I believe we have. I, I think as a result of, of some of the activity that we're doing uh, during the pandemic to make Parkland more accessible to people, we've certainly moved on some of those opportunities uh, on our own. And I think as the recommendations in the report say, there is room within this next RFP or and negotiated RFP to continue advancing things like affordable golf, uh, but also things like environmental stewardship and trail connections and a whole bunch of other objectives that uh, I, I think we all agree on are very, very important. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, additional questions of councillors. Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, we will move to speakers outside councillors first. Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. And, and can I say thank you for uh, working our way through such a speaker's list today. You did a great job. Um, uh, I think you had over 40 speakers because there is a lot of passion about uh, this and, and, and we shouldn't expect anything less. This is this represents a lot of real estate in the city of Toronto, so it, it ought to engender a lot of engagement for, from a lot of Torontonians. Um, I asked a lot of the questions I asked today, uh, probably because you can, you can, as you can uh, uh, probably guess, I was a little disappointed in the uh, lack of, of real depth in the report. It, it, uh, um, I don't really, uh, I don't really see it laid out. Okay, here's what we have. We're staying in the golf business, and here's how we're going to proceed. It, that's that's still going to have to come back in some other reports and some other budget items. So I see us having to really work hard at uh, uh, tracking it and keep paying attention to it to, to make it happen. The thing that I'm most disappointed about, I indicated in my questions to deputants, and that is there's a lot going on in the industry, and we we hired a private outside consultant yet they didn't seem to go looking at the industry really um they they stuck within the scope that probably was was outlined for them just look at our golf courses and and what are they doing are they healthy what should we do next and i don't think you can decide those things unless you really look at what's happening um there are a lot of places where instead of a room where you would play bridge in a condominium uh, condominiums are actually being built with golf simulators in them. Um, if you go out to the to the inner suburbs and and on to the to the exurbs, what you'll find are a lot of restaurants and and drinking establishments uh, where what's the draw? It's not a band; it's a golf simulator. Something's happening in the industry. Golf stores that were were big box golf stores that were closing down are starting to reopen, and suddenly their numbers are up. And what that represents to me is something similar to what happened when Tiger Woods hit the scene. Um, the, the people aren't uh, just interested in golf uh, for the pandemic. They've been introduced to a sport and now they're going to stick with it. Um, consequently, the, the, the only driving range that's, that's convenient for me, uh, the times that it's been open during the pandemic, twice when I've gone up there to use the driving range, I couldn't get in the parking lot. Couldn't use it. Um, on one of those occasions, I, uh, I took my grandson because I wanted to introduce them to the sport. So I, 
took them up there and the oldest one looked around and he, and he said, and he, I hope he won't mind me uh, uh, quoting him, but he said, I thought it was just going to be a bunch of old white men. It was anything but, anything but. And there, there aren't enough of those facilities. So we had, we drove all the way to, to the 407 in Woodbine. It, it, just a nutty place to have to drive to from the city to find a decent driving range where you might find a slot. Something is happening in the industry. There's a redesign of the courses. There are things that we can learn from. I, I mentioned the uh, course, I, I sent it to Councillor Bradford. Uh, uh, sure, surely we, we, we don't have the private money to, to build something of state of the art quality, but the 12 hole course is a thing that is coming because that you can have more golfer throughput, you can get more golfers through in a day if the demand is there. And um, if you're building a learn to play golf park, uh, instructors love them because they can do a quick six hole course uh, lesson uh, rather than just teaching you on a driving range. They can say, I'm gonna show you how to play holes on a golf course, but really play a six hole game in the average length of a lesson uh, being about an hour and a half. There are a whole bunch of things happening in the industry drawing younger generations. And if we're looking for equity inclusion and inclusion, then that means drawing those younger generations because with them, you end up drawing every new cultural group that you might uh, be trying to draw, every equity seeking group. All of those groups that need to come in, they will come in through their younger generations and then turn this into their family's sport. And that's our goal. That's what recreation is supposed to do, because what is it but but the city's uh, contribution to preventative uh, health measures? This is this is about fitness and keeping people healthy, bottom line, and affordably so. And so, um, although there are some who are disappointed that we're not uh, shortening the 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 length of every golf course in our uh, five courses. Uh, we do know one thing that there is potential to have more uses and communicate the uses that we already have on those courses and you will see motions coming uh today that ask us to really start to drive some of those uses without jeopardizing the game of golf in the city's courses and and as long as the the motions have that that uh, uh fundamental uh, uh guidepost that we're there we're not trying to take something away uh, I support those motions, and I, I, I dare say we'll have uh, this conversation again at council. And so, if, if you know, if we need to to safeguard the the courses within those motions, uh, I'm I'm going to be looking at them uh, to to get them perfect at, at council. But uh, I hope they're put Thank on you. the table today, so this conversation becomes much more constructive. Thanks, Madam Thank Chair. You. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Holiday, and then Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Madam Chair, and again, thank you, as the previous councillor mentioned, um, for overseeing such a, uh, a lengthy and passionate topic. Um, I, I'm hopefully we'll get finished because I'm curious of the outcome, and the reason I say that is because tonight I have to go to a virtual online meeting with the community that I represent because we're going to be the host in Toronto and in, in Etobicoke Centre uh, in 2022 of Canada's national golf championship the canadian open the rbc canadian open and it's a big deal the logistical planning into doing that is massive um, there are i think if i got the stats right one billion viewers uh, worldwide um, that will be watching toronto and i'm trying to figure out if i'm going to go to that meeting kind of hiding a little bit if uh if a motion goes forward to uh, bring some bulldozers to dentonia park or the potential for that uh, so you, you can guess where I'm going uh, with this. Uh, perhaps I could ask the clerk. I sent in a photo, and it's of Dentonia from an aerial view. I wonder if the clerk could show it. Um, you know, I don't always join the committee, but sometimes uh, I see things that I'm very passionate. Whoops, that's the wrong one, Matthew. But we'll 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 deal with that one in a minute. It's the the other one, which is Dentonia. Um, I join the committee because I'm passionate, and I I hear things that I have to speak up about. Um. There's a little bit of a yarn being spun about the need for green space and you know how critical Dentonia is. And you know, I don't need to spin a yarn. I just I just want to throw a fact out that this is an aerial view. I mean, if you if you believe Google aerial view, 
But that's Dentonia and its impact on the green system around it. Um, you know, people are sort of saying, you know, we need these spaces. We need more. We need we gotta, we got to dig up those 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 green spaces and replant them with green spaces because there's no infrastructure in a golf course, right? It's just like a little metal cup, and, and everything else is all plant and sand and dirt and trees and things. And you know, as golfers, like we we appreciate the the natural environment. That's what we immerse ourselves in for three and a half or four hours when we play. Um, some of us a little bit longer because we're aspiring golfers. But I don't hear sort of an absurd argument about, you know, digging up the ball diamond down the street and turning it into gardens or, you know, the soccer field. Uh, I guess apparently it's people that, you know, aren't fans of the game and think it's easy to point to those spaces like this one and say, dig it up. Um, but the fact is, and the report says it, that these are very well used spaces. They're fully booked or close to it anyways. It's popular. It's accessible. In fact, the, the point I want to make, the only barrier to entry to golf is one's own self. Like either you're interested in it or you're not. If I don't think it's hard to get out and get some used clubs if you really want to or rent them or borrow them. Um, the green fees, you know, they are they are what they are. They're competitive to what the green fees are all over the place. So you know, Golfers understand the pay-as-you-go model, right? You can join a hockey league and spend a thousand or two, or you could join a soccer league and pay your 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 annual dues to go play, or a baseball league, or whatever sport you're interested in. But this is one that you just play against yourself, and you, you pay that fee each time you go to help run the course. And the thing about being a play-yourself type of a sport is that it attracts so many people at different levels and different abilities. And if you go to a course, you see all kinds of different people that the only demographic you really see is golfers, um, as broad as it can be. But one thing I did notice is uh, a lot of seniors play. And this is where I really have to speak up because um, many seniors have some limitations on the sports that they can play and golf is not one of them. Um, people with all sorts of abilities and health concerns can still engage in this sport. It's a very broad spectrum and that's what makes it so exciting. So when we take away potentially opportunities for seniors to engage in sport in this city, I got a big problem with that. So I wanted to speak out about that. Uh, Matthew, if you could flip to the other slide, if you could just help me out here. I just, the experience this committee will know, this is Centennial Park. We just, um, you just helped uh, get this master plan put onto the council agenda a couple of cycles ago, and this was passed. Up in the left-hand corner is Centennial Park Golf Course, 27 holes. Uh, I, I know a little better because it's the golf course in my community. Now it's not a city run golf course, but it's as public as it comes because it's publicly, fully publicly accessible. All you gotta do is, is show up to, to play. Um, it sits on a ravine, it sits within the park. And you know, the fun thing about this course, there's not a fence around it. Like there's no separator. There, there aren't people wandering about there because they are in the park for all the different programmed activities or go, they're going through the valley. I suppose some people wander out there once in a while for whatever reason. I don't think anyone cares unless you wander through the golf play. And that's just like somebody walking across the ball diamond or the, uh, or the soccer game while the game's going on. You, know, you don't do that out of courtesy. I always wanted to sort of wrap up and say, you know, I think a lot of this stuff with D'Antoni in this conversation, and I, you know, I suspect there'll be motions coming that will preserve it. I think those are largely a distraction because I think it's sort of absurd to think that we would bulldoze and dig up places or flatten them out and you know destroy something that's been planted to sort of do some sort of different planting in there. The, the questions I have I never got answers to is just how the financials work and what our model is. And I guess the report suggests going one place with sort of a hybrid model of what we've got today. But one thing I'll leave about Centennial Park, it's, it's not a publicly run course by the city for a reason. It sits on provincial lands. But if you look at their green fees, they're cheaper. They're cheaper than all of the other courses except for Dentonia. And the difference with this course is instead of costing the taxpayers anything, the operators of this course actually write a check to the city each year. So we get all the benefits. You get all the people out there playing golf. You got a fantastic course on par with anything. It's in the city, accessible by transit, on a park, busy as can be, 27 holes. It sends money back to us. Um, that's something I'd like to dig in deeper. It's not necessarily on the report, but I think it's an important Final thoughts. 
And I just thank you for listening to me and recognizing my passion. I hope we don't make the mistake. I'd like to go to the Golf Canada meeting tonight with pride uh, to know that we continue to be a golf city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holliday, Councillor Bradford, and then Councillor Pasternak. Very good. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks to everyone on the committee today uh, for the opportunity to, to sit in on IEC. What a great table uh, and listen to the discussion. And of course, all the deputants who shared so much of their time today and their, their views and their perspectives uh, and really heartfelt on all sides of this discussion. Um, over the course of the afternoon, we've heard from folks that have shared just how much D'Antonio Park golf course has made a difference in their their lives, made an impact, whether that's growing up or getting access to green space or connecting with new people, making new friends, building a community and a network. And uh, I don't think that that is anything that was really captured uh, in the report, in the discussion. We didn't hear those stories. And um, when this first came across our desk last week, when that report uh, became published, you know, I think a lot of us were pretty concerned and uh, you're going to see motions that are coming forward, recommendations through our fantastic chair, uh, McKelvey, um, that are a group effort between three councillors here in the East End, uh, myself, Councillor Crawford, and of course, Councillor Fletcher, who's joined us today. And, and we're focused on D'Antonio Park in particular, because as you've heard, this is a unique recreation facility uh, in a city of 640 square kilometres uh, as we approach 3 million people. This is not just unique in the in the Toronto context, but this is a facility that serves people, that serves our youth, that serves seniors. We heard about the thriving women's league. We we heard about the newcomers that are that are trying and exploring and experiencing the sport for the first time. And I would suggest, as we heard from some of the deputants, this is an unrivaled facility in the entire country of Canada and perhaps a North American example. You just don't get city golf courses that are located with the accessibility of being on a transit line where kids can go out and, and play around for, for just a little more than a, uh, a buck a hole, 18 bucks, uh, get out there and experiencing a, a new sport, connecting with new people. That just doesn't exist anywhere else. And so when I saw the recommendations, and as, as my colleagues as well on the letter, that we were going to cut in half, that we were going to go after this golf course and, and master plan from 18 holes down to nine holes. Um, you know, a golf course that's that's in two neighborhood priority areas located on the subway line where affordability and accessibility has always been a priority. You know, we had to push back. We had to say no. Uh, we started asking the questions as we heard today. I think if we spent more time uh, you know, on the golf course, talking with some of the user groups, we might have had different responses that would have informed some of the recommendations that we have in front of us today. We, of course, will be moving alternative recommendations, and I hope the committee members can support based on hearing the feedback um, and, and the, uh, the direction that we provided in our language. All of that aside, uh, we are in a global pandemic. It's made consultation challenging. I, I don't dispute that. But there were still 35,000 people that were able to get out to D'Antonia Park over the past summer and, and play rounds of golf. So I think that we could have probably pushed ourselves to maybe put a little pop-up tent there. Maybe we could have advertised on the on the scorecards that we hand out to every single person that these meetings were going on, or you could submit your feedback here. Because I think first and foremost, from a recreation perspective, it's important to hear from the people who are using the facility today. It's, of course, important to hear from the adjacent community and folks who would like us to do more and perhaps do different things with the course as well. But first and foremost, we have to, to talk to the people who are using the facility today. Parks, Forestry and Recreation does a tremendous amount of heavy lifting in this city. And I think as city government, as for the success of this city in the future, it is important that we have and that we prioritize affordable and accept, accessible recreation opportunities for everybody. We've got more than 1500 parks. We've got 700 sports fields. We have 120 community centers. We've got more than 120 pools. We've got 50 plus outdoor rinks. We've got nearly 50 indoor rinks. You know, we have re recreation amenities across the entire city. I don't want to cancel any of them. I don't want to cancel any of these recreation amenities. I want us to invest in those. I want us to do more with those. And that's actually what this conversation is about. It's not about gutting the neighborhood that needs the most help and the most support. It's about doubling down and doing more, finding ways to connect with community. As we've heard, you know, we could do a better job on that. And the consultant report identifies that too. 
There's actually a lot of four season activities that are going on at our golf courses like D'Antonia right now. And yet people are just discovering that on their own. We haven't done enough to make those connections. We haven't done enough to reach out to adjacent communities and op explore opportunities to collaborate more. The, rec re uh, the recommendations that you're gonna see in front of us uh, will direct staff to do more of that. Uh, and, and you know, I think the points are well taken about strengthening the connections to the Taylor Massey Creek Ravine. You know, as Councillor Holiday identified and people have, have discussed today, the idea that there is a park shortage or a, a dearth of park space in this particular area, I mean, just pull up an aerial map and take a look. Uh, we, we saw it on the screen. I mean, you've got D'Antonio Golf Course, but immediately on the other side of the street, you've got one of the largest parks in the East End with D'Antonio Park. We're installing a food garden there right now as we speak. We're working with community to do that. And the entire facility is enveloped to the east, to the north, to the west about a ravine. So the idea of making those connections is not something new. In fact, our former colleague, Janet Davis, has been working on this for many years. And there was a report that culminated back in 2017 that provided instruction and direction on how to do this. So rather than coming up with a new master plan, starting over, spending the money, spinning the wheels again to kind of get back to the same spot, let's take the plans that are there. Let's move forward with a direction towards actually getting this done. Let's make and enhance those connections, but they don't have to come at the expense of other things. More than one thing can be true at the same time. And that's so that we need to protect and enhance our ravine and our park space. And we also need to protect affordable and accessible recreation opportunities for everybody in the city. You know, lastly, I'll just say, I understand, you know, not a golfer, believe it or not, not a golf champion, but I am a champion for affordable recreation in this city for everybody. And, and what I will say is the, the stereotype or the notion that, that golf is this, this elite sport that's exclusive, that it eludes us. Well, we heard from 40 plus deputants today that tell a different story. And I would challenge and suggest to anyone, um, you know, that, that suggests otherwise, if you spent 30 seconds uh, on, on the ground at the D'Antonia Golf Club, you would see a very diverse collection of Torontonians. This is ground floor, blue collar, rec blue collar recreation opportunity for everybody. It's affordable, it's accessible. It doesn't fit into the stereotypes or the narratives that perhaps are a bit pervasive of golf. But I will tell you if, you, if you go after that, if you cut that, if you gut those resources, we will make it harder and harder for people to access this type of recreation in the future. They will be forced to drive out of the city they will be forced to pay exorbitant green fees and they will never have an opportunity to discover a sport that so many people are loving and the numbers are growing and growing over the past number of years. I don't think that's the right way to go. I think that's a heartless move. I think it's ill-advised and uh, I really appreciate uh, my call support on the letter. And of course, Councillor McKelvey for getting this done for us today. Okay, thank you, Councillor Redford. Um, additional outside Councillor Fletcher and then Councillor Pasternak, Councillor uh, and then Deputy Mayor. I am uh, going to be very quick. Uh, there's been so many great words here and thank you, Councilor Bradford, for being so eloquent on this, particularly that these are not country club places. It's not a country club. Uh, go to a country club, you'll see the difference and you'll feel the difference. And these are courses where everyday folks that we know can go and play golf and it's affordable and i think the affordability piece is so important i really want to thank all of the deputants today who are truly they are experts they play there all the time they know what's happening and i really don't want to turn this whole process over to so-called other experts it's great to have their assistance but our experts are those who use our recreational facilities. And this is proven every time we get into one of these crunches. Who are the people that are able to talk about the pool? Folks that are swimming, kids that are learning to swim. That was a, that's a battle that we waged over and over and over again under pressures to change it, to cut them, to decrease access. And citizens overwhelmingly have said we want recreational facilities. We want affordable ones. The city is not here to build a granite club. The city is here to have little Dentonia where people can go out, as Brad says, blue collar, blue collar place where you can go out and you can have a day. You can be a bad golfer. You can be a good golfer. There's no pressure. There's no judgment at our courses. You don't have to have $500 outfits. Nobody's looking at what you're wearing. You're there. 
and you're having a great walk and you're having a very good time. So I do agree with, uh, I just want to thank Lucy Falco and everybody who came today and the golfers who said, yes, I take the, I, I take the subway and it's my lifeline, particularly the seniors who talk about the importance of affordable golf for them and not wanting to have to drive way up out of the city every time they want to have a game. So I think this kind of, uh, I, I don't know how we got this far and I don't know how we got this far kind of off course, no pun intended, but we need to bring it back. Uh, I was very interested to hear we have all of these courses and Stephen, I won't, uh, I won't move any motions to uh, take those courses back because you're going to the RBC meeting tonight with Golf Canada. But I do want to say that I really know one thing you said and all the years that I have worked to keep pools open, these are not team sports. You don't have teams that talk to one another all the time that can get out and put the pressure on, put in ads. These are sports that are sports for people that don't necessarily like to be on teams. They're not into that co competition in that way. It's not a hockey league. It's like a difference between shinny and just pleasure skating. These are the pleasure skating courses where it's you, you're playing against yourself or with friends, but it is not a full on competitive league. And those are the ones we always tend to go after because there's no people getting together to stop it, except for the fact that whenever we try, people do get together and they get together and they say, we want our recreation facilities. I know from planning that there's 30,000 new people moving into this city every year. And yet we keep always saying, well, we have to cut this, we have to cut that. That is not where our citizens want to go. They want facilities. They don't want gold plated facilities. You can pay a lot of money and join a private club, or you can go to Dentonia. You can pay a lot of money and join a private club or you can go swimming at Jimmy Simpson. You can pay a lot of money and join a private club, or you can just go skating at one of our rinks. Uh, you don't have to have a lot of money and join private clubs in the city of Toronto. That's been the basis of our approach to recreation. And every single time that that has been attempted, that, that there's been an attempt to shift that, the public gets up and says, our Toronto is the affordable. Our city government provides affordable recreation to everybody. And let's just keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it for outside councillors. Go inside. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I have two motions, uh, if the clerk can put them on the screen. Uh, one is for uh, uh, the general manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation to work with uh, other staff on the team. Uh, to look at ways to um, better design and create an access point and entry from the bottom of Earl Bales Park near the stormwater ponds to the Don Valley course, golf course for off season access and use. Right now it's a, a very high chain link fence. Uh, some of it is barbed wired. Uh, people try and squeeze under it, they squeeze around it. Uh, it's not welcoming, it's not safe. And if we're really going to offer uh, off season access, then I think it's important to have uh, uh, an appropriate gating system with signage. Second thing is, we don't really know who's using our courses. I mean, we look out there and it's all anecdotal. I think we have to do a better job at maybe surveying or capturing data, obviously, um, following all the privacy laws that we have um, and seeing who we really are servicing out there so that we can make policy uh, for the future. So, those are my two. Uh, my two motions. I mean, I, I'm probably going to reiterate what's been said, but when you look at the golf delivery uh, in the city of Toronto, it aligns with so many of our existing policies, whether it be active living under our senior strategy, uh, youth strategy, uh, resiliency, um, climate change, transform TO, all of our TRCA obligations, our urban forestry strategy, and of course, our ravine strategy. And this is this is essential that this the, the golf courses that we have play this important pivotal linkage role with many of these city of Toronto uh, policies. And as a form of entertainment and recreation, 
it is far more accessible than many of the other recreational or, or uh, professional opportunities uh, exist, such as hockey, uh, getting your kid all lined up for, uh, for hockey, or downhill skiing, um, even watching professional sports or live theater. This is the best bargain going for those who, who want it. And it's such a good quality of life deliverable. Gets people outside, off the couch, away from the computer, gets people walking, it's a social setting, it's great exercise, it's great for those who don't have a cottage. And during COVID, it was probably one of the safest places you could be was on our, was on our golf, uh, golf courses. You know, uh, as I mentioned in my questions or in my comments, you know, golf is one of the only sports where you can share the equipment as you're playing. And I used to play uh, out of someone else's bag, uh, share the golf clubs as we went ahead. Uh, we shared the golf cart when we rented one. Uh, we shared the green fees. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we just, we shared the, the, social, the social aspect of it uh, as, as well. Um, you know, look, when we talk about money, it, it actually is a good, it's a good business model. But the city is not designed to make profits in our very recreational and parks deliverables. Aquatics doesn't make a profit. Our rec centers don't make a profit. Uh, and of course, one thing that's been ignored uh, through all this discussion is the expanding of the welcome policy for golf now, which allows those who can't afford uh, some of the green fees that are being charged uh, would, uh, uh, would be able to get some kind of a subsidy uh, to, to join our courses. And it's important to remember that many charities who are doing great work uh, throughout our city rely on, on, on golf fundraising activities. It's a major draw uh, as a source of fun, as a, a source of activity, uh, and of course, of raising, raising money uh, for noble causes. At the end of the day, I, I, think, I think this has been an excellent conversation. I think uh, the golf um, plays an important role uh, in, in our parks and recreation uh, programming. Uh, it is used by hundreds of thousands of, of people. It's, it's, it's far more diverse than, than many people make it out to be. Uh, and it's a wonderful uh, thing to do uh, on those uh, spring and, and summer days. But we should be able to leverage this important asset in the off season. And we should be able to have more access, extending trails, providing more walking opportunities, providing more cycling opportunities when the clubs go away and the clubhouses close and we're able to uh, have everybody enjoy uh, those parklands. So at the end of the day, I, 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 don't, I don't play golf very often because uh, I spend most of the time in the woods looking for, looking for the ball. But I think it's very important to the livability and durability of our city. And I think this is an important thing uh, that we learn out of this report and an important lesson. But it's an ongoing conversation, and I think we should sustain it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, Deputy Mayor? Well, Where'd your friend go? Pardon me? Where'd your puppy friend go? I think she, she wants to go outside. Um. I, I just really wanted to thank the deputants. There were so many of them that came out and they waited all day. But I, I think they, they served um, a really important purpose here today if people were listening. Um, that, you know, the, the folks that use these golf courses, they don't drive to these golf courses and arrive in limousines with top hats and monocles. They don't have servants taking out their golf clubs. They're they're, they're regular people, they're average people who, who, who want to golf. Many of them can't afford it. Many of them can't drive out of the city. They can't afford memberships. Um, a lot of them do it for social interaction. A lot of them do it for exercise. Um, that's what we as a Parks and Rec Department should be, you know, encouraging. Um, you know, and then, you know, after you have all these people making, telling their, you know, heartfelt stories about what they see and what they do, and why golf is so important. There, there's still others that don't want to believe them, and it, you know, because it doesn't fill, it doesn't fit the political narrative that they prefer. And you know, I just find that you know, I, I find that very disappointing. 
But what we do know is these parks are important to a large uh, section of the community. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, we have a lot of other, uh, I think people spoke to this, a number, a number of other capital facilities that, you know, maybe we shouldn't have, and we've had debates about them before, and that might be cost a little bit of more, more money to run. I know that there in certain parts of the downtown, there are some swimming pools where when you, when you combine the capital and operating costs, it's 50 bucks to swim and we still keep them open. So I think we that as a city we need to be open minded about this and that we do need to keep uh, these golf courses open and and various ones have various uses. Uh, the Dentonia course I think is a much shorter course. Um, there are some longer courses, but I think that they're all important. And I hear a motion is coming to you know keep them all open and I'm and I'm supportive of that motion. So this is a good discussion. Um, I think it's important that. Uh, that the community comes out and they did come out today, um, uh, you know, and they said that we want to keep the golf courses open and accessible and available um, to all Torontonians. And I think we should listen to that message. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Leighton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have a motion. I think it's been combined. It was advanced circulated because it's 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 got some length. The Infrastructure and Environment Committee 1, City Council direct the General Manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation to collaborate with the TRCA to ensure maintenance practices and vendor operations incorporate best management practices. For example, consider green certifications such as Golf Environmental Organization and Autobahn Cooperative Sanctuary Program and meet annually to review progress and explore opportunities for improvement. 2, City Council direct the City Manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation to advance the implementation of the Park Plan and Ravine Strategy on the City owned golf courses regard, regarding ravine access and trail connections. 3, City Council direct General Manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation to prioritize opportunities for tree planting and naturalizing area restoration with a focus on native species as part of the capital works on the city owned golf courses and reduce pesticide use in the maintenance of the city owned golf courses to the extent possible. Four, City Council direct the general manager forestry, parks, forestry and recreation to enhance and support off season public access to and expand complementary in season programming aligned with indigenous communities and local communities priorities on the city owned golf courses. Five, City Council direct general manager parks, forestry and recreation to integrate City's climate, sustainability, equity, social par and partnership objectives as part of the request for the proposal and retain the city's ability to advance these objectives without the term of the contract in collaboration with the vendor, partners and non-profit organizations focusing on urban agriculture. Six, City Council direct the general manager of parks, forestry and recreation to advance indigenous placemaking opportunities at city on golf courses as part of the future capital wayfinding and enhancement projects in collaboration with the Indigenous Affairs Office and Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee and other Indigenous partners and organizations. Seven, City Council Direct the General Manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation to develop a staff report on how these recommendations align with the City's recent adopted Transform TO Net Zero uh, strategy by Q1 2023 ahead of awarding the request for proposal. I'm sorry, girls. I'm in the middle of making my speech. My little girls have come to join, but they're going to have to go into the other room for the moment. Thank you very much. I just spent two minutes of my time, so I'm going to Jumped right into it. Look, I don't know if I should regret putting the motion forward and, and sort of starting the wheels turning on this report the last time it came to council. I think it was two years ago now. Or if I should rejoice that we just had a great conversation and review about how we can better incorporate our other social and environmental objectives into the management of our golf courses. Like, I think that's a good discussion to have. Kind of feel sorry that I put parks through it. Uh, but I'm glad that we had this dialogue and most of what I've picked out of this uh, in, in, in put in my motion are in response to the motion that uh, Councillor Crawford put forward at Council to look at some of these um, added uh, considerations when we look at golf course management. Um, you know, they're an important green space. They're an important social space. Uh, they, they are an important part of our city and city programming. I find it find it only slightly ironic that when our deputy mayor references the good people that came out and gave gave deputations today, which I do think they are, um, on an, on other occasions when people who work in the industry have come out and made deputations that he didn't like, he wasn't as welcoming to their presence at these meetings. Um, but I do welcome it, and I do welcome that feedback. I'm glad Councillor 
Holiday is on his way down to a to a meeting with Golf Canada because that's economic development in our city. What we have to make sure is are our city resources serving us to the best ability? We're doing this for our office space. We're doing it for our parks and our parking lots. We're doing it for every piece of real estate we have in the city through CreateTO. Why on earth would we not wanna have that conversation with our community about golf courses? And there was resistance two years ago when we started this process, but I'm glad we went through it despite as how painful that meeting was two years ago, because out of all of you, I can almost say with 100% certainty, I am the only person on council who has ever gone to Dentonia on the subway with their golf clubs. Can any of you say the same? No, but I have. I understand its utility. I've also taken my clubs on the subway uh, up to Don Valley. But so that being aside, that I am the demographic, or I was the demographic that was being served by these golf courses when I was had when I was a student with no money, but my my all, my grandfather taught me to golf, and so yes, I like to go on occasion with him and with my dad. But I take the subway because I didn't have wheels. I understand the utility of them, but it is important to know that our values and our use of space as a city can change over time. So be open to the conversation. Don't be afraid of having that conversation. Let's recognize what we value. And I hope that when our debates come up about what services get supported by our tax supported budget and what don't, I hope there's some open mindedness to saying, just because it's something I don't understand doesn't mean it's something that shouldn't be supported. I hope you'll support my, my motions, none of which are poison pills, these are trying to incorporate what we found in the dialogue into the operation of our municipal golf courses, as well as some of the other city policies and goals we have. I think they're complementary. I had staff's help and thank, I'd, I'd like to thank staff for both their work on the consultation, but also, and most importantly, on the, the, the motions that uh, they drew up with me. Thanks for the extra 26 seconds. Okay, thank you, Councillor Layton. Um, any additional councillors to speak? Okay, um, so I have a motion that I'm bringing forward on behalf of Councillor Bradford, Crawford, and Fletcher. If we can put the first one up. So the first one is to delete the existing uh, rec recommendation for and replace it with City Council Direct General Manager PFNR in consultation with the Chief Procurement Officer and any relevant divisions to maintain the existing 18 hole golf course structure at Dentonia Golf Course while continuing to explore opportunities for further year-round recreation, multi-use arrangements, increased accessibility and affordability for golf use and access to the Taylor Massey Creek Trail Ravine. And the second motion. Um, and this is a, a longer one, uh, which covers uh, more than just the one golf course. Um, so the first is that uh, PF and R work with relevant div divisions to explore programming opportunities to increase access to underrepresented groups in the sport, including but not limited to low income groups, newcomers, women, the BIPOC community, the 2S LGBTQ plus community, and the accessibility community who we've heard from earlier. The second is to explore and develop creative opportunities to improve access to Taylor Massey Trail from Dentonia um, Golf Course in consultation with the local ward councillors. The third is to report back to IEC on the establishment of a golf steering committee. Uh, the fourth is to develop an online payment system for 2021 or the earliest uh, possible date for payments. Uh, the fifth is to identify feasible golf courses and install temporary natural skating rinks and trails, something that many residents are asking for. And we're looking for ways to imagine these spaces in winter. So that's a great motion. Thanks to them for that one. Um, and number six, uh, that PF and R in consultation with the general manager of transportation services report back on trail connections between Taylor Creek Ravine, Dentonia Park Golf Course, um, building on the previous work uh, in that area. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Bradford for um, working collaboratively with the other local councillors, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Crawford, um, about the Dentonio Golf Course uh, specifically, although there's also many good recommendations in there that strengthen golf in, in other locations as well. Um, Dentonia, I've never golfed. I've never golfed in my life. Um, but I have memories of Dentonia. My grandparents lived at Teesdale Place and they had six children. Five of them were boys. And the only time my father, to my knowledge, has ever golfed or I've ever seen him go golfing was at Dentonia. 
uh, when we were visiting my grandparents and riding the subway train. Um, even, you know, now as, as an adult, adult, I still always look out to see if I can spot the golfers out um, playing um, when we pass through there and see if you can uh, sneak a view of one. Um, this golf course is also being reimagined and Councillor uh, Bradford sent me a picture of one of the fris Frisbee golf uh, locations and uh, he doesn't know it, but he's taking me to, to play. So we're going to go um, and I'm going to have that experience on that golf course there. And I think this is a great a great um, example of how the city is reimagining these spaces to make them more accessible, to make them uh, more useful all year round. Um, and uh, I'd like to also thank all of the deputies that came out today to share their passion for golf, but also more importantly, to share their stories about why these specific city run golf courses were important to them and how they gave a start in the sport to, to many people that went on to be very successful in this field. Um, so thank you uh, again to Councillor Bradford for his leadership on this. Uh, thank you also to Councillor uh, Fletcher and Crawford. And I think that is it. And we can move to voting on all the motions. Okay, uh, I will let you, Matthew, walk us through it in the order. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. So we will vote on uh, the committee should vote on uh, your motion 3A first as it's a motion to amend. So that's the delete and replace uh, recommendation four. And then following that, we would vote in the order that they were presented, which would be uh, motion one by Councillor Pasternak, motion two by Councillor Layton, and then motion 3B by yourself. So if you'd want to vote in that order, um, I may just advise you as well uh, that um, Councillor Cole uh, declared an interest on this, and we may want to take recorded votes. Okay, great. We can do recorded votes. Um, item four, uh, sorry, so the recommendation four, so this is, I'll let you display that. I'm sorry, this should be uh, uh, motion 3A. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favor of motion 3A by Councillor uh, by uh, Councillor McKelvey. If you can uh, please take the uh, motion down. Thank you. So all in favor. Uh, Councillor McKelvey, uh, Deputy Mayor Manan Wong, Councillor Pasternak, uh, Councillor Layton, and Councillor Peruzza. Uh, Madam Chair, that is unanimous. Okay, thank you. The next one. And this is on motion one. And we can take that down. And all in favor, please. Uh, Chair Kelly. Uh, Deputy Mayor Menon Wong, Councillor Pasternak, um, Councillor Layton, Councillor Peruzzo, two, three, four, five. That is uh, unanimous again. Okay, great. The next one. And motion two. And all in favor of this again? Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Layton, and Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Menon Wong, Chair McKelvey, and Councillor Peruta. Again, that is five in favor. That's unanimous, Madam Chair. And finally, on 3B. And once again, all in favor, please. Councillor Layton, Chair McKelvey, Deputy Mayor Menon Wong, uh, Vice Chair Pasternak, and Councillor Peruta. Once again, that is uh, unanimous, Madam Speaker, or Madam Chair. Finally, and the item is amended, I suppose. You can take another recorded vote, and that will be uh, five in favor as well. So, Councillor Layton, Chair McKelly, Deputy Mayor Menon Wong, Vice Chair Pasternak, and Councillor Peruta. Again, all in favor, and that is uh, unanimous. Thank you very much. That's the item is amended. Madam Chair, that is your last item today. Okay, thank you. That concludes our meeting. Thank you again to all the deputies. Thank you, outside councillors. Thank you um, for our committee members for attending. Um, Happy New Year again. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, Have a good evening. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, take Thank care. Folks. Thank you, thanks, Matthew. Matthew.